Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we are back with more in our Linux command line series. Joining us in the studio, you know who it is, our good friend, Mr. Don Pizzette. Don, welcome back, sir. We're so glad to have you again. How's it going today? It is going swell, and we are ready to dive right back into the world of Linux command line. And in this episode, we are taking a look at environment variables, which are uh, odd little things that kind of float around in the back of our, our shell prompts that we don't we don't think much about, but uh, uh, but they are actually really important, and they're incredibly useful. So we're going to take a look at how they work. Uh, now, keep in mind, in this episode, we're really going to be kind of doing a high-level overview of environment variables and, and how how they function. But in a later series, we're doing the Linux sh uh, shell scripting. And in shell scripting, you use variables all the time. They are a pivotal piece of that. So here we're going to focus on the foundational side, but be sure to check out the scripting series if you want to really see these things in action and what all they can do. All right, Don, well, let's talk about environment variables. They are, you say they're looking in our, our machine. They're super duper powerful. What the heck are they? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so what a, well, let's just start with a variable, right? So a variable is basically a, a placeholder. It's a little placeholder in memory where the operating system sets a, aside a little spot in memory and says, you can put stuff here. <laughs> Think of it as like a storage unit. <laughs> so I might rent a storage unit and it's I can put storage. junk in there. And, and when I need it, I can go and get it out, right? That's how a variable is. It's, it's mini storage. <laughs> you, you've got it uh, and, and you can reach out and grab data out of it whenever you want. You can put data there and it'll sit there. It'll sit there and, until you're ready for it and you go and you retrieve it. So that's what a variable does. Now, you can use them, but your computer uses them all the time, regardless of whether you use them or not. Variables are constantly in use. And so in your system, you have user variables and system variables, applications that create their own variables. You have session variables that are tied to your shell. You have global variables that are tied to all of your shells. There's a, a number of variations of, of the way these things get used. But at the end of the day, they're all just a little piece of storage, a little, little storage unit. You can chuck data in there and retrieve it when you want. Now, if you create your own, you, you certainly can, and you can make use of them. But even if you don't, there are system variables that are already created. So, Don, we've actually been using variables throughout this series uh, so far. We just haven't been kind of calling them that, right? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the commands that we run are actually just leveraging variables. And let me let me show you an example here. So, um, in my command prompt, if I want to find out what my computer's name is, right, I can run the host name command, and host name returns it, right, and it just says, "Oh, it's called Don's laptop." Well, where did it get that from? It got that from an environment variable. There's a variable that's storing what my computer's name is. And when I run host name, it's just reaching out there and grabbing it right out of that variable. The variable in this case is actually called host name. And if I pull that up through another application, like I can do an echo dollar sign host name, and there it is, Don's laptop, right? The variable in this case was called host name. And when I typed it here in this command, you know that it's a variable because it starts with a dollar sign. The dollar sign is the command line's little flag that says what I'm about to type is a variable name. Okay, And the variables are case sensitive. This one happens to be all capital letters. They don't have to be. It could be all lowercase letters, but they are case sensitive. So when I run that host name command, that's what it's actually looking for. Or if I do who am I, right? Who am I? I'm deep as that, right? All it did was look at an environment variable. And the environment variable in this case uh, if I echo that one is called dollar sign user and there it is deep is that right so so that's the variable it queries it and it pulls it back even some of the more fancy commands like host name CTL if I run that one it returns a bunch of data right here's my computer name my chassis and, and so on all this other data it's really just reaching out to these different environment variables grabbing that data and bringing it here all right now how did I know that it was called dollar sign host name, or how did I know that it was called dollar sign user? Well, the dollar sign isn't actually part of the name. The dollar sign is just a flag that says I'm about to type a variable name. So the variables are actually called host name or user. How did I know that? Well, I memorized it or I write it on a piece <laughs> yeah, of paper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's in the documentation. I'm in the bash shell right now. And if I do man bash and I pull up the bash documentation, I can do a forward search. So I'm going to hit the forward slash. And I'll just type shell variables like that. And when I search for that, it's going to jump me down to the share shell variables <laughs> section. 
where we sell seashells by the <laughs> seashore. And I can then find all the variables that are stored. And it's going to list them all. And there's a lot. There's a bunch that are in here. But if I look far enough, I'll get to host name here. Automatically set to the name of the current host. Or I can find user. Users in here somewhere. And that will be, uh, let's see. Oh, some of them actually don't show up right here. Some of them show up in a different section. And you'll notice the alphabet kind of resets here and it starts over again. So I might have to hunt around a bit before I find the one that is actually storing user. Uh, it'd be faster to search at this point. But you can read through it. And, and there are a ton of them. I've got screen after screen of different variables. There's variables like this one here, PS1. That's what shows my prompt, my command prompt. I've got a nice little pretty one right now. Uh, and it's because the PS1 variable is storing the information about how my prompt should get rendered. So all of these things are already created by Bash. It, just by opening up a Bash shell, I've already got all of these variables that I can pull from. And most of them are pre-populated. In other words, they've already got data inside of them. And so if I just query them, I can pull that data out. If I create my own variable, it's empty. And I have to put data in it before it's useful, right? So like if I go and get a storage unit, a storage unit's going to be empty and I put my stuff in there. But these guys are ones that already have data in them and it's usually populated by the system so that it's accurate. We don't want it to be wrong because we want to rely on the values that are in here. So the system maintains all of these. Now, see how all of these variables are capitalized? They don't have to be, but this is a notation used to help uh, to help us recognize when we're dealing with a system variable versus a user variable, right? A system is one that was created by your operating system. And so they always use all capital letters. And as a rule of thumb, when you make variables, you should do all lowercase. And the reasoning there is you can quickly spot whether it's a user variable that you made or a system variable that came with the system. Now, you can make variables that are all capital letters. It'll let you do it, right? But then it becomes really hard to tell who made that one. Was it you or was it the district? I'll tell you, Don, I'm not, it's no more confusing to look at somebody's uh, script as you get further along and you get into scripting and you see user-created variables. And if someone does use that naming convention of, I'll make everything uppercase, it gets super confusing. So definitely follow it. Like we said, you can do whatever you want, but it's helpful not only for you, but for everybody else that's trying to look at what you're doing to make it all lowercase when you create your own variables. Now, Don, let's, can we talk a little bit about that, creating our own variables versus these yeah. environmental variables? Well, you know, the, the first thing we need to think about is, is whether or not we need to create our own, right? That's true. Sometimes I might say, hey, I want to create my own variable, but it turns out there was a perfectly good variable sitting right there that already had the data that I wanted. Mm. So it is a good idea to make sure you know the variables that are on your system. And if, and if you're one of those people that says, I am not reading that man file, <laughs> I don't care how many times Don brings it up on the screen, um, let me show you a quick handy command, which is print env, right? This will print the environment variables, and we can see what's already there. So in a perfect world, you don't have to make your own, but there's already a variable. We can just look at it and use it. So if I want to find one that represents my name, I can look in here, and I can find, uh, well, there's log name. I'm actually not entirely sure what log name is for. Probably the, you know, the entries <laughs> yeah. go in the logs, uh, not necessarily a login name. Uh, but if I keep looking, I'll find user in here somewhere. There we go. And so I can use user. Uh, or I've got username up here. So now there's a difference. So we've got a couple, but this is showing me all of the different variables that are already there and what they're populated with, what the information is that's stored inside of them. Uh, and some of them, like my LS colors here. <laughs> they really get in depth. <laughs> pretty, pretty detailed. And, and this is how it's colorizing the different file extensions and things so that it knows what pretty colors to make them. But you may find you've already got a variable in place. At a minimum, you can use print EMV to see if a variable already exists with a certain name so that you don't overwrite it by accident. And so when you create your own variable, you don't want to overlap with the system one, which goes back to the capital versus lowercase. If you just use lowercase letters, you don't have to worry about overlapping with the system because all of theirs are capital, right? This whole screen, as I scroll back, they're all capitalized. Now, Don, we tend to actually, there is one variable that I know for myself and a lot of people that I know that use Linux we actually do change quite often, and that's the path environment variable, because we're wanting to add paths for things that we can, I, I can stop putting full path names in, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, when, when it comes to like just running an application, mm -hmm. so when I type ls and I press enter, it's gotta find the ls binary, and it's gotta look a few different places to, to find it, and it uses the path variable to do that. So if I were to take a look at that path variable, well, it's actually still on my screen, isn't it? Uh, right here, Probably. path yeah, equals, is. And here's all the folders that it's looking to whenever I run an executable, right? And that's just stored in a variable called path. If I wanted to look 
if I wanted to find it specifically, I could have just typed like print env path and it would go and it would show me that value, right? Using print env just to see a single variable. Or I can always use that echo command, which echo is a lot more useful because print env is really focusing on just environmental variables that are created by the system and scripts typically. But echo will actually show you any variable, even ones that have been created by applications. So uh, it's a little bit more handy to pull it this way. And I can do an echo dollar sign path and there I get the same data out of it, right? But there's some things that I might see in here that, that aren't included. You know, like mine, I have slash home slash depossess slash bin. So if I have a program that I want to be available just for me, I can put it in a bin folder right in my own home directory. Not every distro has that. So I might want to add that to the path. And you can quickly set a variable or, or modify a variable to add on to the end of it or to change it all together. One that I like to do is I like to add dot to the path. All right, now, what does dot mean? Dot means the current directory. So now when I run an application, it'll look in the current directory as well. And that's really handy when you're calling scripts, right? So let, let's say I had a file right in, in my folder called myscript.sh, right? So there, there's my script. And if I want to run it, well, I guess I have to make it executable. So we'll do that. Uh, so if I wanted to run this script, if I just type myscript.sh and I run that, Command not found, right? It doesn't look in this folder to find that script. I would have to run it like this. I would have to say dot slash my script that I say. So it knew to look right here in this folder to find it and run it. And this time instead of command not found, it found it <laughs> and it ran it, right? So, so really handy when you're running scripts and you don't want to specify a path like that. Well, if I look at my path, it doesn't look in the folder that I'm in, right? My current folder is slash home slash deep possess. I've got slash home slash deep possess slash bin. So if I put my scripts in there, it would find them. But scripts aren't binary, so I kind of don't want to stick in a bin folder so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for it to be there. Well, I could add either this specific folder to the path or you know really anything. If you want to set a variable, what you do is you type the variable name and then an equal sign and then the value you want it to be, right? So if I want to set my path, I could say path equals, and then I could add slash home slash d possess like that. Right? But I've got to be really careful here because I'm not adding anything. If I press enter right now, I'm going to overwrite my path. So when I do that, there it goes to set it, and uh, oop, and it's actually really upset with me now. Okay, why is it upset with me now? I'm getting these bash wc command not found core utils. I just overwrote my path. It's looking for every binary right here inside of the directory I'm in, and that's a, that's a problem. My path is kind of messed up at this point, and I've got you know power line, which is what makes my pretty little prompt, and I've got set, and, and a few other things that are all really getting kind of upset with me, and so now I, I'm kind of mad. <laughs> I, I've kind of worked myself into a problem, right? Well, the nice part about this is the path variable can get reset. When I modify variables like this, they're temporary. We'll see how to make them permanent later on. Uh, but they're temporary, so I can always, if I've really screwed up, I can just close it. I can open another terminal, and when I come in here, I'm in this nice new shiny terminal, and if I do an echo dollar sign path, now it's back to the way that it was, right? We've kind of fixed ourselves. And the reality is I, I could have avoided that whole situation from, from happening in, in the first place, right? What I should have done, instead of saying, uh, where did I set it? It's actually gone. Uh, instead of saying path equals slash home slash d possess, what I should have done is said path equals dollar sign path colon slash home slash d possess. Now, what does that do? Well, it says I want to change the path variable, and I'm going to change it to include whatever the current path is. So dollar sign path, I'm calling whatever that current path is, and then I'm adding slash home slash d possess onto the end of it. Okay. And when I do that, now I can echo dollar sign path, and I see where slash home slash deep says has been stuck right on the end of it, and it's now going to look here in my home directory. So when I run a program, like if I run myscript.sh, it will know to look right here. I don't get a command not found. It found the script right here, and it actually executed it. Or I, I started this whole diatribe by saying I like to add dot. Yeah. Right. So, um, so if I wanted to, to change that path again, and uh, you know what I'll do is that I don't want uh, slash home slash deep is that on there. So I'm just going to copy this and I'll say path equals 
and I'm going to paste in that full path. And I'm just going to add dot right, right to the end. And that says, look in whatever folder I just happen to be in. And so now when I look at that value, I see the dot on there. And if I just run my script dot sh, it finds it right here. But it's still looking in the other folders, right? My, my command prompt didn't blow up on me because it's still able to look in slash user slash bin and the other places, right? This is modifying a variable. And in this case, it happens to be a, a variable that was already in existence. But we could be working with our own variables at this point. You know, I, I could come in and say any name that I wanted, right? I might create a variable called var1, right? And I'll say var1 equals value1, right? And so now I've created that variable. Or I might say, like, Daniel's shirt color, right? And you can't have spaces in a variable name, so I'm using underscores, but you know, you could use hyphens or whatever. So I'm saying Daniel's shirt color equals black, right? And so now I've got that variable, and whenever I want it, I can go and I can query that, and I can say, you know, echo dollar sign Daniel's shirt color, and it returns that it's black. And if I want to change it, you know, maybe he does a wardrobe change, he's like Britney Spears or something, <laughs> uh, and he changes to a blue shirt, right? Now I can go and I can query that. I'll do echo dollar sign Daniel shirt color, and this time I get blue. So super easy to set these variables. If they already exist, though, be careful because they might have contained something useful like the path, and if you mess with it enough, you can kind of break your shell. But it's all good because at the end of the day, you can just close the shell. And when you open it again, it's a fresh new slate. Everything's back to the way that it was. So if I take like this echo Daniel shirt color here, I'm going to copy that. And I'll open up an all-new terminal. And so here's my shiny new terminal. And this time when I, I guess my copy and paste didn't work so well. If I echo dollar sign Daniel's shirt color, I get nothing because the variable is now gone. The variable doesn't exist because it was created just in that session that I was in. Now, Don, if I start creating a bunch of uh, these these local variables, these user-defined variables, am I then able to go through uh, using the printm command to see them as well as those global variables? You know, it, it, it's kind of weird. It, variables get kind of, they, they get separated up into a couple of areas, right? So you have global variables and you have the, the user variables. Uh, global, or what, what are called local variables, yeah. I need to use the right terms here. So a global variable is one that's available throughout all of your, your shells, all of your different sessions and things. A local variable is one that's tied just to your current session. And when you run print env, right, so if I do, um, here I'll do var1 equals value1. All right, so I've got this variable, and I know it works. So if I do an echo dollar sign var1, I get value1 back, so I, I know that it is working, right? Let me make this just a little bit bigger, just so we can read it. If I run print env, and I'm going to grep that for var1, it doesn't come back, okay? And that's because printEMV is showing me environment variables, right? These are ones that are set by the system that are a part of my environment, regardless of which shell that I'm in, versus the variable that I just made that's really a local variable. It's just for me in the shell that I'm in right now. And if I want to see those, I have to use a different command, right? The command I'm going to use is set. If you just run the set command, it will show you all sorts of stuff, right? Lots of things here. Not just variables, but it's showing you also functions and things like that that are tied to your account. And so you see a lot. And somewhere in here... Uh, <laughs> Probably should have gripped that one. Huh? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I, I thought it might be easy. But <laughs> somewhere in here, we will find the variables. I Yeah, I'm going to give up on this. I, I've got so many functions that came back that it's just kind of flooding me. But if I do set, and I'll, I'll grep it, I'll, I'll pipe that into the grep command, and I'll just look for var1. There it is. Var1 equals value1. So we get it, and I think they're actually right at the beginning. So if I do set, and maybe if I pipe that into the head command, uh, well, there's some of them. Uh, so you kind of see where, where some of those are, are coming in. Uh, maybe if I do top 20, ah, whatever. Anyhow, it's, it's in there. They're in there, right? You know, grep returns it. It's just such a giant amount of data. Uh, but I can find them, and they are there. So they don't show up with print env, but they do show up with the set command. Now, be careful. The set command the name makes you think that this would set something, mm. but you don't. This is, that's not how you set a variable. You don't use the set command to set a variable. You use the set command to see the variables. I, it's kind of one of those that's named a little inappropriately. Uh, I mean, maybe it's an acronym, and I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't realize it. But yeah. uh, session environment. Eh, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but, but that's how we go and see them. So I know I've got that variable that is set. It is in place. 
and there it is, it, it's tied to me. Um, now, while the set command can't set a variable, there's a similar command called unset that will let you remove a variable, which again, not necessarily intuitive. If I don't want var1 anymore, I can do unset var1 to get rid of it. And now when I go and look for it, I can see that it's gone. Well, see how what it's returning here is like a underscore equals. That's it removing the variable. If I run it again, there, now it's gone. So it, it takes a second before it's actually gone. I, I ran my command too fast. I, I should have stalled. But, uh, but, well, I mean, if you see it yeah. in real life, that's what happened. Yeah. It, it's removing the variable, and then it's gone. So at this point, it is out of there, and now I've, I've freed up that massive, you know, one and a half byte of memory <laughs> or whatever it was that it was stored in. Now, now, here's an interesting thing I'm thinking of, Don. We've got the environmental variables, right? They're there because they're very handy. We use them. Other programs use them. Scripts use them. The, the Linux environment uses them because they're very common. We use them all the time. What if I create my own variable, a user variable, a local variable, and I'm like, man, this is super handy. I would like this to be everywhere all the time instead of me having to set it every time I open a new shell. All right, so what we bump into with this, when we have a, a variable that we need to, to be available all the time, there's two problems that we bump into. One problem is persistence, and one problem is uh, locality. So on the persistence side, wh what happens when I close my shell and open a new one? All my variables are gone. So if I want these variables to be here all the time, I need to store them in a script so that they'll be available every time I fire it up. Mm -hmm. right? Now, if it's just for me, it's actually really easy to do. If it's a variable just for one user, then in their home directory, they'll have a file called .bashrc. Right? And what it is is a bash configuration file that's run every time you start a bash shell. And if you put the variable in there, It'll be there every time you run your shell. So, for example, right now, if I if I use my set command and I'll just look for, um, uh, well, I'll just grab for var1, right? So it's not there, right? I know that I don't have it. If I edit in my home directory, so I'll do tilde slash dot bash rc, I can pull up my bash rc file, and I can go to the end of that file, and I can add my variables. You can actually add them at the beginning or the middle. You just don't want to break some of the stuff you've already got. Like I've got some power line stuff in here. I don't want to mess with that. Uh, but down at the very bottom, I can come in here and I can just add variables. So I'll say var1 equals value1 or var2 equals value2. Uh, maybe I'll add Daniel's shirt color equals black. Right. So I'm adding those variables right there. And because I'm putting them in that bash rc file, Right? Now, every time I launch a new shell, that file gets read and those variables will be present. Now, they're not present for me right now. I guess I could source that file. If you use the source command, that'll tell it to, to read it and, and load all that stuff. But the, the best way to do this would be to exit a shell. And if I go and create an all new shell, when I fire this one up, I haven't created those variables, right? But that script runs. And when the script runs, it should have found it. So let me, uh, I'll grep for var, whoops, car, <laughs> var <Sorry>. one and <laughs> two. That's what I'm looking for. All right, so I'm going to look for those variables, and there they are. Var one equals value one. Var two equals value two. They're set because that's a part of my shell. Or if I echo dollar sign Daniel's shirt color, I get black, right? They're now persistent. But it's just for me, right? So if someone else logs in on my computer, they, they don't have that, right? So they don't, they don't have them. If you want to make it where the variable exists for everybody, everybody who logs in on this computer, services and demons as well as, as interactive users, then we can actually do an extra step here. What we can do is we can put it into, well, the old way was that you put it in a file that was called uh, slash etc slash profile, okay? That file right there, and you still have that file. You know, you could go in there and you can edit it and pop it at the end, but it's recommended you don't do that anymore. And the reason is a lot of distros, when they upgrade, they'll overwrite this file with the default one, so you lose those variables. So instead, there's a folder. Notice right here uh, where it says for i in slash etc slash profile d slash star dot sh. Right? It's basically running any script found in this folder. So if you have a variable you want to be available for everybody, you should turn it into a script and stick it inside of slash etc slash profile.d. And you'll see I've actually got quite a few. 
uh, some of my terminal colors and, and other things. I mean, most of these are defaults. I didn't create them. But there's like a vim.sh over here that's creating the variables that vim uses when it runs. Uh, all of these are just little shell files. And, and these don't get overwritten when you do an upgrade. So if I want a variable to persist for everybody, you know, when, when they log into the system, um, you can actually use a little one-liner here to do this. Um, you can say echo, and then we can echo a line that sets a variable, right? So you could say like um, var1 equals value1, right? Uh, that's what I want to echo. And I can append that. I'll use the, the double greater than signs. And I'm going to stick that into a file inside of slash etc slash profile dot d slash uh, and then we'll stick that inside of a file which I'll call it something you know like uh, Don's variables or, or something like that uh, you know whatever you wanted it to be maybe it's just called variables dot sh right uh, and it's going to store that variable variable right there and I can continue to run this line over and over and over again and build up the script. Now, I do need to sudo this. You need to be an administrator to write this folder because you're modifying every user in the system. So I'm going to do that. And, oh, I got permission denied. Look at that. All right, so what, what happened there? Well, what's going on here is we've got a, a couple of problems that are going on. What I've got is a parent shell dealing with a child shell. And this happens, you, you have, a, they're called subshells. When you run commands, you might be in one shell and then you're performing a command, and it's actually running in a secondary shell. And this can actually wreak havoc with variables, too. It can cause a lot of problems. So I, I want to show that to you. Hey, I know we're, we're running low on time, too. <laughs> I, I really don't want to show this. But I guess just to make this kind of quick, um, let, let's do this, Daniel. Let, let's do a part two, because I really want to show that. But let me, we'll just make this work. OK. <laughs> we'll, we'll make this work. And then in part two, I'll explain why this happened and, and, and kind of fix it. But, uh, uh, but basically, what's happening is my commands are breaking into more than one shell. And not everyone has permissions to write to slash etc slash profile dot d or, or whatever. So uh, so I can just go in and, and I can use vi to do this. Uh, so I can sudo vi and I can edit slash etc slash profile dot d and we'll make one called variable dot sh. Okay. And when I come in here, I can set my variables and I can say variable one equals value one and variable two equals value two and and so on. And by putting them here in this profile folder, when users log in, when they get that interactive shell, this will be read, and now they'll get those variables, and they'll be able to use them. Okay. But there's still one little problem with this, which, again, I want to show you guys. I want to explain in more depth. So uh, let's break into part two, though, because I definitely am going to need a little more time for it. Uh, but I want to explain how these variables still aren't quite going to be visible for everybody. And there's an extra little step that we need to go through to take care of that. Most variables default to just being visible to you. And so here we got to do a little extra work to get this one ready. But this is the, the starting work for that uh, to get those variables pushed out. Oh, I'm definitely looking to see, uh, looking forward to seeing how parent shells deal with their teenage sons. Because <laughs> <laughs> they can be annoying. They won't say all the garbage or anything. That's right. Clean their room. <laughs> all right, Don. Well, Bart 2 looks like is on our horizon. We do thank you for joining us so far. But... We're going to go ahead and call it a day for this episode. Come back and watch part two. See the culmination of Don's <laughs> epic work that he's got going on here with uh, environmental and local variables. But uh, looking at the clock, we're going to go ahead and call it a day. Thanks for watching. Signing off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we are back with more in our Linux command line series. Joining us in the studio, you know who it is, our good friend, Mr. Don Pizzette. Don, welcome back, sir. We're so glad to have you again. How's it going today? It is going swell, and we are ready to dive right back into the world of Linux command line. And in this episode, we are taking a look at environment variables, which are uh, odd little things that kind of float around in the back of our, our shell prompts that we don't, we don't think much about, but, uh, uh, but they are actually really important, and they're incredibly useful. So we're going to take a look at how they work. Uh, now, keep in mind, in this episode, we're really going to be kind of doing a high-level overview of environment variables and, and how, how they function. 
But in a later series, we're doing the Linux uh, shell scripting. And in shell scripting, you use variables all the time. They are a pivotal piece of that. So here we're going to focus on the foundational side, but be sure to check out the scripting series if you want to really see these things in action and what all they can do. All right, Don, well, let's talk about environment variables. They are, you say they're looking in our, our machine. They're super duper powerful. What the heck are they? <laughs> <laughs> all right, so what a, well, let's just start with a variable, right? So a, a variable is basically a, a placeholder. It's a little placeholder in memory where the operating system sets a, aside a little spot in memory and says, you can put stuff here. <laughs> Think of it as like a storage unit. <laughs> so I might rent a storage unit and it's I can put storage. junk in there. And, and when I need it, I can go and get it out, right? That's how a variable is. It's, it's mini storage. <laughs> you, you've got it, uh, and, and you can reach out and grab data out of it whenever you want. You can put data there, and it'll sit there. It'll sit there and, until you're ready for it, and you go and you retrieve it. So that's what a variable does. Now, you can use them, but your computer uses them all the time, regardless of whether you use them or not. Variables are constantly in use. And so in your system, you have user variables and system variables. Applications will create their own variables. You have session variables that are tied to your shell. You have global variables that are tied to all of your shells. There's a, a number of variations of, of the way these things get used. But at the end of the day, they're all just a little piece of storage, a little, little storage unit. You can chuck data in there and retrieve it when you want. Now, if you create your own, you, you certainly can, and you can make use of them. But even if you don't, there are system variables that are already created. So, Don, we've actually been using variables throughout this series uh, so far. We just haven't been kind of calling them that, right? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of the commands that we run are actually just leveraging variables. And let me, let me show you an example here. So, um, in my command prompt, if I want to find out what my computer's name is, right, I can run the hostname command. And hostname returns it, right? And it just says, oh, it's called Don's Laptop. Well, where did it get that from? It got that from an environment variable. There's a variable that's storing what my computer's name is. And when I run host name, it's just reaching out there and grabbing it right out of that variable. The variable in this case is actually called host name. And if I pull that up through another application, like I can do an echo dollar sign host name, and there it is, Don's laptop, right? The variable in this case was called host name. And when I typed it here in this command, you know that it's a variable because it starts with a dollar sign. The dollar sign is the command line's little flag that says what I'm about to type is a variable name. Okay? And the variables are case sensitive. This one happens to be all capital letters. They don't have to be. It could be all lowercase letters, but they are case sensitive. So when I run that host name command, that's what it's actually looking for. Or if I do who am I, right? Who am I? I'm deep as that, right? All it did was look at an environment variable. And the environment variable in this case, uh, if I echo that one, is called dollar sign user, and there it is, deep as that, right? So, so that's the variable, it queries it, and it pulls it back. Even some of the more fancy commands, like hostname CTL, if I run that one, it returns a bunch of data, right? Here's my computer name, my chassis, and, and so on, all this other data. It's really just reaching out to these different environment variables, grabbing that data, and bringing it here, all right? Now, how did I know that it was called dollar sign host name, or how did I know that it was called dollar sign user? Well, the dollar sign isn't actually part of the name. The dollar sign is just a flag that says, I'm about to type a variable name. So the variables are actually called host name or user. How did I know that? Well, I memorized it, or I write it on a piece <laughs> yeah, of paper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's in the documentation. I'm in the bash shell right now. And if I do man bash, and I pull up the bash documentation, I can do a forward search. So I'm gonna hit the forward slash, and I'll just type shell variables like that. And when I search for that, it's going to jump me down to the share shell variables <laughs> section where we sell seashells by the seashore. <laughs> and I can then find all the variables that are stored. And it's going to list them all. And there's a lot. There's a bunch that are in here. But if I look far enough, I'll get to host name here. Automatically set to the name of the current host. Or I can find user. Users in here somewhere. And that will be, uh, let's see, oh, some of them actually don't show up right here. Some of them show up in a different section. And you'll notice the alphabet kind of resets here and it starts over again. So I might have to hunt around a bit before I find the one that is actually storing user. Uh, it'd be faster to search at this point. But you can read through it, and, and there are a ton of them. I've got screen after screen of different variables. There's variables like this one here, PS1. That's what shows my prompt, my command prompt. I've got a nice little pretty one right now. Uh, and it's because the PS1 variable is storing the information about how my prompt should get rendered. So all of these things 
are already created by Bash. Just by opening up a Bash shell, I've already got all of these variables that I can pull from. And most of them are pre-populated. In other words, they've already got data inside of them. And so if I just query them, I can pull that data out. If I create my own variable, it's empty. And I have to put data in it before it's useful, right? So like if I go and get a storage unit, a storage unit's going to be empty and I put my stuff in there. But these guys are ones that already have data in them and it's usually populated by the system so that it's accurate. We don't want it to be wrong because we want to rely on the values that are in here. So the system maintains all of these. Now, see how all of these variables are capitalized? They don't have to be, but this is a notation used to help uh, to help us recognize when we're dealing with a system variable versus a user variable, right? A system is one that was created by your operating system. And so they always use all capital letters. And as a rule of thumb, when you make variables, you should do all lowercase. And the reasoning there is you can quickly spot whether it's a user variable that you made or a system variable that came with the system. Now, you can make variables that are all capital letters. It'll let you do it, right? But then it becomes really hard to tell who made that one. Was it you or was it the district? I'll tell you, Don, I'm not, it's no more confusing to look at somebody's uh, script as you get further along and you get into scripting and you see user created variables. And if someone does use that naming convention of, I'll make everything uppercase, it gets super confusing. So definitely follow it. Like we said, you can do whatever you want, but it's helpful not only for you, but for everybody else that's trying to look at what you're doing to make it all lowercase when you create your own variables. Now, Don, let's, can we talk a little bit about that, creating our own variables versus these environmental yeah. variables? Well, you know, the, the first thing we need to think about is, is whether or not we need to create our own, right? That's true. Sometimes I might say, hey, I want to create my own variable, but it turns out there was a perfectly good variable sitting right there that already had the data that I wanted. Mm. So it is a good idea to make sure you know the variables that are on your system. And if, and if you're one of those people that says, I am not reading that man file, <laughs> I don't care how many times Don brings it up on the screen, um, let me show you a quick handy command, which is print env, right? This will print the environment variables, and we can see what's already there. So in a perfect world, you don't have to make your own, but there's already a variable. We can just look at it and use it. So if I want to find one that represents my name, I can look in here, and I can find, uh, well, there's log name. I'm actually not entirely sure what log name is for. Probably the, you know, the entries <laughs> yeah. go in the logs, uh, not necessarily a login name. Uh, but if I keep looking, I'll find user in here somewhere. There we go. And so I can use user. Uh, or I've got username up here. So now there's a difference. So we've got a couple, but this is showing me all of the different variables that are already there and what they're populated with, what the information is that's stored inside of them. Uh, and some of them, like my LS colors here. <laughs> they really get in depth. <laughs> pretty, pretty detailed. And, and this is how it's colorizing the different file extensions and things so that it knows what pretty colors to make them. But you may find you've already got a variable in place. At a minimum, you can use print EMV to see if a variable already exists with a certain name so that you don't overwrite it by accident. And so when you create your own variable, you don't want to overlap with the system one, which goes back to the capital versus lowercase. If you just use lowercase letters, you don't have to worry about overlapping with the system because all of theirs are capital, right? This whole screen, as I scroll back, they're all capitalized. Now, Don, we tend to actually, there is one variable that I know for myself and a lot of people that I know that use Linux we actually do change quite often, and that's the path environment variable because we're wanting to add paths for things that we can, I, I can stop putting full path names in, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, when, when it comes to like just running an application, mm -hmm. so when I type ls and I press enter, it's got to find the ls binary, and it's got to look a few different places to, to find it, and it uses the path variable to do that. So if I were to take a look at that path variable, well, it's actually still on my screen, isn't it? Uh, right here, Probably. path yeah, equals... Yeah. And here's all the folders that it's looking to whenever I run an executable, right? And that's just stored in a variable called path. If I wanted to look, if I wanted to find it specifically, I could have just typed like print env path, and it would go and it would show me that value, right? Using print env just to see a single variable. Or I can always use that echo command, which echo is a lot more useful because print env is really focusing on just environmental variables that are created by the system and scripts typically but echo will actually show you any variable, even ones that have been created by application. So uh, it's a little bit more handy to pull it this way. And I can do an echo dollar sign path, and there I get the same data out of it, right? But there's some things that I might see in here that, that aren't included. You know, like mine, I have slash home slash dpossess slash bin. So if I have a program that I want to be available just for me, I can put it in a bin folder right in my own home directory. Not every distro has that. So I might want to add that to the path. And you can quickly set a variable or, or modify a variable to add on to the end of it or to change it all together. One that I like to do 
is I like to add dot to the path. All right, now, what does dot mean? Dot means the current directory. So now when I run an application, it'll look in the current directory as well. And that's really handy when you're calling scripts, right? So let, let's say I had a file right in, in my folder called myscript.sh, all right? So there, there's my script. And if I want to run it, well, I guess I have to make it executable, so we'll do that. Uh, so if I wanted to run this script, if I just type myscript.sh and I run that, command not found, right? It doesn't look in this folder to find that script. I would have to run it like this. I would have to say dot slash myscript.sh. So it knew to look right here in this folder to find it and run it. And this time instead of command not found, it found it <laughs> and it ran it, right? So, so really handy when you're running scripts and you don't want it to specify a path like that. Well, if I look at my path, it doesn't look in the folder that I'm in, right? My current folder is slash home slash dpzet. I've got slash home slash dpzet slash bin. So if I put my scripts in there, it would find them. But scripts aren't binaries, so I kind of don't want to stick in a bin folder so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for it to be there. Well, I could add either this specific folder to the path or, you know, really anything. If you want to set a variable, what you do is you type the variable name and then an equal sign and then the value you want it to be, right? So if I want to set my path, I could say path equals, and then I could add slash home slash dpzet like that, right? But I've got to be really careful here because I'm not adding anything. If I press enter right now, I'm going to overwrite my path. So when I do that, there it goes to set it, and, uh, oops, and it's actually really upset with me now, okay? Why is it upset with me now? I'm getting these bash, wc, command not found, core utils. I just overwrote my path. It's looking for every binary right here inside of the directory I'm in, and that's a, that's a problem. My path is kind of messed up at this point, and I've got you know power line, which is what makes my pretty little prompt, and I've got set, and, and a few other things that are all really getting kind of upset with me, and so now I, I'm kind of mad. <laughs> I, I've kind of worked myself into a problem, right? Well, the nice part about this is the path variable can get reset. When I modify variables like this, they're temporary. We'll see how to make them permanent later on. Uh, but they're temporary, so I can always, if I've really screwed up, I can just close it. I can open another terminal, and when I come in here, I'm in this nice new shiny terminal, and if I do an echo dollar sign path, now it's back to the way that it was, right? We've kind of fixed ourselves. And the reality is I, I could have avoided that whole situation from, from happening in, in the first place, right? What I should have done, instead of saying, uh, where did I set it? It's actually gone. Uh, instead of saying path equals slash home slash dpzet, what I should have done is said path equals dollar sign path colon slash home slash dpzet. Now, what does that do? Well, it says I want to change the path variable, and I'm going to change it to include whatever the current path is. So dollar sign path, I'm calling whatever that current path is, and then I'm adding slash home slash dpzet onto the end of it. Okay. And when I do that, now I can echo dollar sign path, and I see where slash home slash deep says has been stuck right on the end of it, and it's now going to look here in my home directory. So when I run a program, like if I run myscript.sh, it will know to look right here. I don't get a command not found. It found the script right here, and it actually executed it. Or I, I started this whole diatribe by saying I like to add dot. Yeah. Right? So, um, so if I wanted to, to change that path again, and uh, you know what I'll do is I don't want uh, slash home slash deep is that on there. So I'm just going to copy this, and I'll say path equals, and I'm going to paste in that full path, and I'm just going to add dot right, right to the end. And that says look in whatever folder I just happen to be in. And so now when I look at that value, I see the dot on there, and if I just run my script dot sh, it finds it right here. But it's still looking in the other folders, right? My, my command prompt didn't blow up on me because it's still able to look in slash user slash bin and the other places, right? This is modifying a variable. And in this case, it happens to be a, a variable that was already in existence, but we could be working with our own variables at this point. You know, I, I could come in and say any name that I wanted, right? I might create a variable called var1, right? And I'll say var1 equals value one, right? And so now I've created that variable, or I might say like Daniel's shirt, color, 
right? And you can't have spaces in a variable name, so I'm using underscores, but you know, you could use the hyphens or whatever. So I'm saying Daniel's shirt color equals black, right? And so now I've got that variable, and whenever I want it, I can go and I can query that, and I can say, you know, echo dollar sign Daniel's shirt color, and it returns that it's black. And if I want to change it, you know, maybe he does a wardrobe change, he's like Britney Spears or something, <laughs> uh, and he changes to a blue shirt, right? Now I can go and I can query that. I'll do echo dollar sign Daniel shirt color, and this time I get blue. So super easy to set these variables. If they already exist, though, be careful because it might have contained something useful like the path, and if you mess with it enough, you can kind of break your shell. But it's all good because at the end of the day, you can just close the shell. And when you open it again, it's a fresh new slate. Everything's back to the way that it was. So if I take like this Echo Daniel's shirt color here, I'm going to copy that. And I'll open up an all new terminal. And so here's my shiny new terminal. And this time when I, well, I guess my copy and paste didn't work so well. If I Echo dollar sign Daniel's shirt color, I get nothing because the variable is now gone. The variable doesn't exist because it was created just in that session that I was in. Now, Don, if I start creating a bunch of uh, these, these local variables, these user-defined variables, am I then able to go through uh, using the printm command to see them as well as those global variables? You know, it, it, it's kind of weird. It, variables get kind of, they, they get separated up into a couple of areas, right? So you have global variables and you have the, the user variables. Uh, global, or what, what are called local variables, I, I need to use the right terms here. So a global variable is one that's available throughout all of your, your shells, all of your different sessions and things. A local variable is one that's tied just to your current session. And when you run print env, right, so if I do, um, here I'll do var1 equals value1. All right, so I've got this variable, and I know it works. So if I do an echo dollar sign var1, I get value1 back, so I, I know that it is working, right? I'm going to make this just a little bit bigger, just so we can read it. If I run print env, and I'm going to grep that for var1, it doesn't come back, okay? And that's because print env is showing me environment variables, right? These are ones that are set by the system that are a part of my environment, regardless of which shell that I'm in, versus the variable that I just made that's really a local variable. It's just for me in the shell that I'm in right now. And if I want to see those, I have to use a different command, right? The command I'm going to use is set. If you just run the set command, it will show you all sorts of stuff, right? Lots of things here. Not just variables, but it's showing you also functions and things like that that are tied to your account. And so you see a lot. And somewhere in here... Uh, <laughs> Probably should have gripped that one. Huh? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I, I thought it might be easy. But <laughs> somewhere in here, we will find the variables. I Yeah, I'm going to give up on this. I, I've got so many functions that came back that it's just kind of flooding me. But if I do set, and I'll, I'll grep it, I'll, I'll pipe that into the grep command, and I'll just look for var1. There it is, var1 equals value1. So we get it, and I, I think they're actually right at the beginning. So if I do set, and maybe if I pipe that into the head command, uh, well, there's some of them. Uh, so you kind of see where, where some of those are, are coming in. Uh, maybe if I do the top 20, ah, whatever. Anyhow, it's, it's in there. They're in there, right? You know, grep returns it. It's just such a giant amount of data. Uh, but I can find them, and they are there. So they don't show up with print env but they do show up with the set command. Now be careful, the set command, the name makes you think that this would set something, mm. but you don't, this is, that's not how you set a variable. You don't use the set command to set a variable. You use the set command to see the variable. So it's kind of one of those that's named a little inappropriately. Uh, I mean, maybe it's an acronym, and I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't realize it, but yeah. uh, session environment, eh, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's how we go and see them. So I know I've got that variable that it is set, it is in place, and there it is, it, it's tied to me. Um, now. While the set command can't set a variable, there's a similar command called unset that will let you remove a variable, which again, not necessarily intuitive. If I don't want var1 anymore, I could do unset var1 to get rid of it. And now when I go and look for it, I can see that it's gone. Well, see how what it's returning here is like a underscore equals. That's it removing the variable. If I run it again, there, now it's gone. So it, it takes a second before it's actually gone. I, I ran my command too fast. I, I should have stalled. But, uh, but, well, I mean, if you see it yeah. in real life, that's what happened. Yeah. It, it's removing the variable, and then it's gone. So at this point, it is out of there, and now I've, I've freed up that massive, you know, one 
and a half byte of memory or <laughs> whatever it was that it was stored in. Now, now, here's an interesting thing I'm thinking of, Don. We've got the environmental variables, right? They're there because they're very handy. We use them. Other programs use them. Scripts use them. The, the Linux environment uses them because they're very common. We use them all the time. What if I create my own variable, a user variable, a local variable, and I'm like, man, this is super handy. I would like this to be everywhere all the time instead of me having to set it every time I open a new shell. All right, so what we bump into with this, when we have a, a variable that we need to, to be available all the time, there's two problems that we bump into. One problem is persistence, and one problem is uh, locality. So on the persistence side, what, what happens when I close my shell and open a new one? All my variables are gone. So if I want these variables to be here all the time, I need to store them in a script so that they'll be available every time I fire it up. Mm -hmm. right? Now, if it's just for me, it's actually really easy to do. If it's a variable just for one user, then in their home directory, they'll have a file called .bashrc. Right? And what it is is a bash configuration file that's run every time you start a bash shell. And if you put the variable in there, it'll be there every time you run your shell. So for example, right now, if I, if I use my set command and I'll just look for, um, uh, well, I'll just grab for var1, right? So it's not there, right? I, I know that I don't have it. If I edit in my home directory, so I'll do tilde slash dot bash rc, I can pull up my bash rc file, and I can go to the end of that file and I can add my variables. You can actually add them at the beginning or the middle. You just don't want to break some of the stuff you've already got. Like I've got some power line stuff in here. I don't want to mess with that. Uh, but down at the very bottom, I can come in here and I can just add variables. So I'll say var1 equals value1 or var2 equals value2. Uh, maybe I'll add Daniel's shirt color equals black. Right. So I'm adding those variables right there. And because I'm putting them in that bash rc file, Right? Now, every time I launch a new shell, that file gets read and those variables will be present. Now, they're not present for me right now. I guess I could source that file. If you use the source command, that'll tell it to, to read it and, and load all that stuff. But the, the best way to do this would be to exit a shell. And if I go and create an all new shell, when I fire this one up, I haven't created those variables, right? But that script runs. And when the script runs, it should have found it. So let me, uh, I'll grep for var, whoops, car, <laughs> var <Sorry>. one and <laughs> two. That's what I'm looking for. All right, so I'm going to look for those variables, and there they are. Var one equals value one. Var two equals value two. They're set because that's a part of my shell. Or if I echo dollar sign Daniel's shirt color, I get black, right? They're now persistent. But it's just for me, right? So if someone else logs in on my computer, they, they don't have that, right? So they don't, they don't have them. If you want to make it where the variable exists for everybody, everybody who logs in on this computer, services and demons, as well as, as interactive users, then we can actually do an extra step here. What we can do is we can put it into, well, the old way was that you put it in a file that was called uh, slash etc slash profile, okay? That file right there, and you still have that file. You know, you could go in there and you can edit it and pop it at the end, but it's recommended you don't do that anymore. And the reason is a lot of distros, when they upgrade, they'll overwrite this file with the default one, so you lose those variables. So instead, there's a folder. Notice right here uh, where it says for i in slash etc slash profile d slash star dot sh. Right? It's basically running any script found in this folder. So if you have a variable you want to be available for everybody, you should turn it into a script and stick it inside of slash etc slash profile.d. And you'll see I've actually got quite a few. Uh, some of my terminal colors and, and other things, I mean, most of these are defaults, I didn't create them. But there's like a vim.sh over here that's creating the variables that vim uses when it runs. Uh, all of these are just little shell files and, and these don't get overwritten when you do an upgrade. So if I want a variable to persist for everybody, you know, when, when they log into the system, um, you can actually use a little one-liner here to do this. Um, you can say echo, and then we can echo a line that sets a variable, right? So you could say like um, var1 equals value1, right? Uh, that's what I want to echo. And I can append that. I'll use the, the double greater than signs. 
and I'm gonna stick that into a file inside of slash etc slash profile dot D slash, uh, and then we'll stick that inside of a file, which I'll call it something, you know, like uh, Don's variables or, or something like that. Uh, you know, whatever you wanted it to be, maybe it's just called variables dot sh, right? Uh, and it's gonna store that vari variable right there, and I can continue to run this line over and over and over again and build up the script. Now, I do need to sudo this. You need to be an administrator to write this folder because you're modifying every user in the system. So I'm gonna do that, and, oh, I got permission denied. Look at that. All right, so what, what happened there? Well, what's going on here is we've got a, a couple of problems that are going on. What I've got is a parent shell dealing with a child shell. And this happens, you, you have, a, they're called subshells. When you run commands, you might be in one shell, and then you're performing a command, and it's actually running in a secondary shell. And this can actually wreak havoc with variables, too. It can cause a lot of problems. So I, I want to show that to you. Hey, I know we're, we're running a long time, too. <laughs> I really don't want to show this, but I guess just to make this kind of quick, um, let, let's do this, Daniel. Let, let's do a part two, because I really want to show that. But let me, we'll just make this work. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll make this work. And then in part two, I'll explain why this happened and, and, and kind of fix it. But, uh, uh, but basically what's happening is my commands are breaking into more than one shell, and not everyone has permissions to write to slash etc slash profile dot d or, or whatever. So, uh, so I can just go in and, and I can use vi to do this. Uh, so I can sudo vi, and I can edit slash etc slash profile dot d, and we'll make one called variable dot sh, okay? And when I come in here, I can set my variables, and I can say, variable one equals value one, and variable two equals value two, and, and so on. And by putting them here in this profile folder, when users log in, when they get that interactive shell, this will be red, and now they'll get those variables, and they'll be able to use them, okay? But there's still one little problem with this, which again, I wanna show you guys, I wanna explain in more depth. So um, let's break into part two, though, because I definitely am gonna need a little more time for it. Uh, but I wanna explain how these variables still aren't quite going to be visible for everybody. And there's an extra little step that we need to go through to take care of that. Most variables default to just being visible to you. And so here we got to do a little extra work to get this one ready. But this is the, the starting work for that uh, to get those variables pushed out. Oh, I'm definitely looking, to see, uh, looking forward to seeing how parent shells deal with their teenage sons. Because <laughs> they can be annoying. They won't take out the garbage or anything. That's right. Clean their room. <laughs> All right, Don, well, Bart 2 looks like he's on our horizons. We do thank you for joining us so far, but we're going to go ahead and call it a day for this episode. Come back and watch Part 2. See the culmination of Don's <laughs> epic work that he's got going on here with uh, environmental and local variables. But uh, looking at the clock, we're going to go ahead and call it a day. Thanks for watching. Signing off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pazette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pazette. We're coming at you live from San Francisco. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back with more in our Linux command line series, and joining us back in the studio for a part two, on variables, our good friend, Mr. Don Bazette. Don, welcome back, sir. How's it going? It is going great, Daniel. Ready to dive right back in and, and wrap up with all of the, the stuff that I just <laughs> didn't quite get to in part one. Remember, we're talking about variables, and in the last episode, we got a chance to see how to set up some local variables, and we were setting up global variables when I kind of ran out of time, and I had a lot more that I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so here in this episode, we're going to be diving back in and kind of wrapping up with some of the, the advanced points and, and slight adjustments we need to make to get everything working the way that we want right here. Now, Don, when we left the previous show, we were kind of setting some persistent variables globally that everyone would be able to use. And I, I guess that's a good place for us to pick back up on setting those global variables. Right. So um, the, the challenge that I ran into right there at the end of the episode is that I forgot to talk about a particular topic, which is called exporting variables. When you create a variable, it's usually just created for you. And it's, it's usually even more so just created for the session that you're in. And so I showed how to add variables to your bash RC file, right? So if I pull that up here, uh, let me just tail my dot bash RC file. And so I added these three variables, which are just for me, right? They're, they're designed for me. That's great. And there they go. Well, those variables are called local variables. They're just for the session that I'm in. 
Unfortunately, when you run some commands, some commands will do what's called spawning a subshell. You know, you've got one shell running, and then they spawn a shell underneath it. It happens quite a bit. So, for example, um, you know, if I just run ls, right? I'm in my shell. I ran ls. It ran in my shell. It all happened in the same shell. If I do ls and a semicolon, and then I do something like ps dash dash forest, right? which shows me my running processes and maps them into a tree. Well, the ls command is going to run, and then the ps command is going to run. So by the time ps runs, ls is already done. So ps has a shell that's available right there for it, and it uses it, so it's right underneath bash. Right? But if I stick parentheses around this, that tells, whoops, if I can actually do it, here we go. <laughs> That tells Bash that I don't want to run these as separate commands. Instead, I'm giving it what's called a process list. Here's a list of processes I want you to start. And when this happens, PS can't take the same shell that LS is already running in, and so it's going to spawn off into its own shell. And when that happens, look at what happened to the forest. I have the Bash shell that I was in, and now I have a subshell underneath it. And PS actually ran in that subshell. Now, why do I care about that? Normally we don't, right? To, to an end user, it, it ran, it did its job, I got my data, you know, what do I care if it ran in a subshell or not? With variables we care, right? So for example, if I say var3 equals value3, right? So I create a variable3 and there it is. And then I type bash and I move into a subshell. Now I'm, I'm manually moving into a subshell here, all right? And when I do that, if I do echo, dollar sign var3, I get nothing. And if I type exit and move out of that shell and I do an echo dollar sign var3, there it is. Okay, The variable was set from my local session. And local is very, very literal. It means the session that you're in. And so when I edited that profiles.descript at the end of the last episode and I set a variable there, that would happen for the initial session that's a part of my user account. And all the other sessions that I spawn, they're not going to have it, and it's not going to work. It, it actually does work for that first session, but as a user, we never see that first session. So it, it doesn't work for us. I, I guess it would work if you were on one of the TTY actual hmm. console terminals on a server, but whoever does that, right? So we've normally SSH'd in or, or something of that nature, and you're in some secondary shell that doesn't benefit from that. So what we need to do is a little extra. Now to help illustrate this, because it does get confusing when we start launching bash after bash. Um, you know, if I sit here and, and run bash three times, technically <laughs> I'm in, I'm four levels deep, right from my initial shell all the way down to here. And if I do a ps dash dash forest, I can see that. See how I'm getting deeper and deeper into subshells. But there actually is a variable that's stored, which I'll do a echo dollar sign shlvl, lvl, right? Yeah. Shell level. And that tells you how many levels deep you are. Okay. Now be careful because you're always one more level deep than you think you are, right? The, the variable itself. So I can tell that I've got four bash prompts open, and it says that I'm five levels deep. And that first level doesn't show up here. It's technically my TTY. So I, if I would type exit five times, this whole thing's going to close. Actually, if I type it four times, the whole thing's going to close. So I don't even get all the way to the end. But you can see how far deep you are by doing that echo dollar sign shlvl and for a normal user, for somebody who's just issuing stuff on the command line, we don't really care, right? It just matters if I'm in a subshell at all, right? That's really all that matters. But uh, uh, so even ps dash forest is enough for us. But if you're writing a script, you do care. You do want to know where you're at in that level. Now, when I ran uh, variable three equals value three, that's my normal way of setting a variable. It's local. I can make it global though. I can make it persist across all of my different shells, including subshells. And we do that with the export command. If I type export var3, that takes variable 3 and, and changes it from a local variable into a global one. Right? So now if I echo dollar sign var3, there it is. And if I type bash again, now I'm in a subshell. Right? Whoops. If I can type my command, there we go. I'm in a subshell. And if I echo dollar sign var3, there it is, right? I've now made it move across my sessions. 
And so if I'm gonna be running commands that spawn other commands, this is really important in order for these variables to be visible, for us to be able to see these, right? So that's the way that subshell works, and that's the way we can take the local variable and turn it into a global variable so that it's then present in other places. Now, why is all this important, right? Uh, it, it, Daniel's giving me the look, which you, you guys can't see. Uh, it's the, <laughs> why are you telling us what all this stuff? What are you talking about, Tom? That... <laughs> and, and the reason is, when you're setting things inside of your, your bash RC file, you can do them as simple local variables, who cares, right? But it's going to break your subshell stuff. And if you set it in profiles.d, that's applying to all the users, and it's messed up with all their subshells. Now everybody's got to start tracking the shell level and seeing where they're at or, or whatever. It's a mess. And so when you start posting variables that way, you want to export them, okay? Now, I showed you an example here in two steps, right? I said, like, var 4 equals value 4, and then export var 4, right? But I could have done it all in one line. I could say export var 5 equals value 5, right? That creates the variable, populates the variable, and makes it global all in one line. And now if I drop into a subshell, I can echo dollar sign var 5, and there it is, just, just like 4 or 3 or any of the other ones that I've done. So I can do it all in one line, right? And that's what I wanted to do at the end of the last episode before I realized <laughs> I hadn't really explained why I, I would want to do that in the first place. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's my habit that, that's kind of built in. When I modify things in uh, slash etc slash profiles uh, dot d, I always do an export there, and that's because I want those variables to be available in each of the shells that we do. So if we go back to that, so I'm going to do a sudo by slash etc slash profiles, or profile dot d slash, and then whatever I want to name this script, right? So, uh, uh, you know, I might call it custom dot sh, and then I start putting in my variables. And you could do one variable in each script and have a ton of scripts, that, that's fine. Or you can put all your variables in one script. It doesn't really matter. The system's going to go through and run each one. Uh, so I could come in here and I could say, not just var1 equals value1, I would want to make sure that I said export var1 equals value1 and export var2 equals value2. And you can do the same thing in your bash RC file. In your bash RC file, it doesn't really matter which one you do if you're not using subshells, right? Because it'll work inside of your session. Bash RC is loaded every time you run bash. But this one, this isn't run every time we run bash, right? This is part of our profile. And so that's different. And that's why we want to make sure that we do exports here so it'll be present everywhere else. And you can just come through and, and list whatever ones you want, uh, like Daniel's shirt color. Uh, it's and a very important variable. It, it really is. <laughs> uh, and so we can start to populate this stuff, and now it'll be available. And because I'm putting it inside a script inside of profiles.d, it's going to be there for every user. Every user will now be able to query this. Now, I'm actually forgetting one extra thing, which is this script file doesn't work. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> and the reason it doesn't work is that I haven't made it executable yet. So I do need to make it executable. So I'm going to do a chmod plus x on that file. I'm still sudoing because I need to be an administrator, but that's going to make it executable. And now it will actively run and become a part of our profile. So that's kind of a critical thing in order to get this to work and, and to be present throughout each of our different shells and be able to make use of those variables. So a lot of this involved, right? The, the system variables are already made. They're already there. They're in our environment. You do a print env, you see them. But the user variables, the ones we mess with, there's a lot to it, right? We can just create them dynamically on the fly. We can put them in our bash RC file. We can put them over here in the profile.d folder. Uh, it, just depending on, on what it is we're trying to achieve, we have a lot of flexibility. Well, Don, this definitely seems to be very, it sounds like you get yourself in trouble really quickly if you're not paying attention to how you're setting the variables. Are they being set globally? Or are they only being set locally? Do they persist into subshells? If you don't take all of those, variable, those variables into account, you could be like, why isn't this working? And you have to go through and debug. Oh, that's right. I forgot to make it to where it will spawn in subshells and things of that nature, correct? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it can get complex. It can take a little bit of, of uh, you know, head scratching to sort things out. And, uh, and it is, it's a complex environment, right? There's actually other things that can start to, to mess with this as well. Um, for example, the system shell, the default system shell. In, in your user account, you have a default user shell, right? So when you log in, the system looks at slash etc slash passwd, 
and it says, okay, wh what is your default shell? So in my case, right, if I do a, um, uh, let's just do a grep of slash etc. Or hang on. Let's do a uh, cat of slash etc slash pass wd, and I'll grep for my username. All right, uh, deep hezzer. There we go, <laughs> deep as that. Uh, and I can see my default shell is slash bin slash bash, right? That's great. So I go and I put all of my custom variables that I want right in my bash RC file, right? And I use export and all that, so it's good, right? I do it all in bash RC. That's my default shell. As Nate would say, you're set to jet. I am set to jet. <laughs> That's right. Now, every time I launch a bash instance, when I go into that bash shell, it reads bash RC, it loads my variables, and I see them, and they're great. And then... Later on, I schedule some kind of cron job, or, or I have a, a daemon that runs in the background that calls a script, and my variables aren't working. And I can't figure out why. Right? This shell, this is your interactive shell. When I log in in an interactive mode, in other words, when I get a terminal like this, a command line interface like this, that's my default shell. But when the system runs, when there's something non-interactive that runs in the background, it uses what's called the system shell. And the system shell might be different than your user shell, all right? And that means I might have bash as my user shell, but it might be dash, or more commonly, the original sh is the default system shell. And guess what? The original sh doesn't look at bash rc. And dash doesn't look at bash rc. It's got, it's got dash rc. It's got no <laughs> yes. thing. So, uh -huh. so other shells will ignore this file and not load your variable. So you need to be aware of the system shell. Now, on a lot of distros, like on, on this one, I'm on Fedora, uh, or if you're on Red Hat or, or whatever, a lot of them will just use Bash as the system shell. So now you're fine. It's Bash everywhere. works great. But there are distros like Ubuntu that use Dash by default, and that can cause some problems. Now, if you're curious about which one is the default system shell, uh, what you can do is... Uh, POSIX, right? There's the POSIX compliance rules that if you want to be Unix compatible, you have to be POSIX compliant. And according to POSIX, the system shell has to be slash bin slash sh. It has to be. Now, I know what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. Don, you just said like Fedora uses bash as the default shell. So how can it use bash, but the default shell has to be slash bin slash sh? Well, the default shell doesn't have to be the original sh, but the file has to be slash bin slash sh. So if I go into slash bin and I take a look at everything that's in here, let me do a, a dash L so we get the long output on this, and I find sh here in my list, what you'll find is that most distros do a symlink. They do a symlink that ties sh to something else. And I will find it. I should have filtered it. There we go. And so on mine, if I look, I can actually see right here that sh is linked to bash, right? So when the system goes to call slash bin slash sh, it actually ends up running bash. And that's good. That's what I want. And I could change that right here. Maybe I love dash, which I don't, but maybe I did, <laughs> right? And, and if I wanted to use that, I could come in and I could relink sh to point to dash. And now that would be my default system shell. So some systems have done that. Some people have done that. So if you run into a scenario where your, your variables just aren't working the way that they're supposed to, then you may have a situation where the system shell is different or another user is trying to run your script and they've used a different shell. And, and that's where in, we'll see in the scripting shows where we almost always have to define the execution environment in the very first line. In other words, which shell are we going to use in order to run this script to avoid this very situation? But when it comes to setting variables, it is important to understand that difference. Well done, Don. They definitely give us plenty to uh, digest when it comes to setting these variables up, making sure that we're doing them the right way because otherwise they're just not going to work very well. Now, we do have an interesting question from our chat room. Bill Stanley's piping back up. He wants to know if the env command or print env oh, yeah. yeah. will show those uh, env variables that we set in our script. Uh, yeah, yeah, they will. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, assuming we set them right. Yeah, uh, assuming. So, <laughs> in the last episode, I showed you guys a command print env, yeah. right? And set, right? Those are two commands. So let's bring these up real quick. Let me get out of this folder. Uh, so I showed you print env, which showed us our, our system environment variables, right? These are, are ones that are, are generally set by the system, uh, but that we can certainly override. Uh, and then I showed you the set command, which, yeah, it's got a lot of output that comes out of that one. Uh, I guess we could, you know, maybe grip for the equal sign or something <laughs> and try and find just the variables out of it. 
but uh, but it's got a ton of information, including a lot of the variables that we've been setting. So like if I, I say var six equals value six, uh, I could then use the set command and I could look for var six, and there it is, it's right there, okay? Well, the set command gives you a lot of extra data. The command that Stanley is mentioning is env, and it gives you a much simpler view of that data. So if I just run env, what I get here are all the session variables for my environment, not differentiating between whether they're system or user. And so when I look at this, I see a mixture, which is, is a, a decent thing, because now you can kind of get it all in one place. You just lose where it's coming from. But the nice part here is it becomes really easy to find there's var3, var4, var5, you know, whichever ones that I've set, uh, they show up there. Uh, var6 will be in here somewhere. Actually, I guess it won't because it was set after, let's see, it was set after the shell loaded. Yeah, so it's not a predefined one, so unless I'm just missing it. But uh, uh, but env, it is another command that's available to see it. Uh, on a positive side, gives you that kind of abbreviated view of the variables. On the negative side, you just don't necessarily know where they're coming from. But Again, I guess realistically, most users don't care where they come from. They just want to know they work. They're there <laughs> so they can see it. And, um, uh, and so you get a chance to spot that. And, and you know, actually, uh, on that same note, uh, I th did I mention the SHLVL yes. variable? I did. Okay, good. Yes. Sorry. Just making sure so that we know how many levels deep we are. Uh, the shovel. But, yeah. The, the shovel. How deep am I? Get the shovel out. <laughs> We're getting deeper by the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. So anyhow, those are a couple of different ways that we can see those and, and just stuff that we need to be aware of there. Um, when you define your variables, it doesn't hurt to use export. You might use export all the time uh, and just do always do globals. But there are times where you might want to have a variable that's storing data in one shell that's different from data in another shell with the same variable name. And in that scenario, you wouldn't want it to export it. You would want that to be a local variable. So that's a, a situation that you will encounter. All right. Well, Don, there's a lot going on when it comes to variables inside of our Linux systems. Global variables, local variables, exporting variables, setting them, moving them, un unsetting them. <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun. Just be careful. Don't don't drink and set, right? Because <laughs> yeah. then you get crazy variables. You know, like what's going on in my system? It's crazy. It's it's lost its mind. But take a little time. Watch these episodes over and over again. I, I understand. I remember it took me a little bit before I was like, okay, I, I see what's going on here, and now I can make use of them because they are extremely useful, especially when you start getting into scripting. All this stuff is going to make a whole lot more sense down the road. Don, thanks so much for explaining variables to us. Anything else you want to add to the show before we close her down? Yeah, you know, the main thing, I, I didn't really show you guys a practical, real-world example other than finding out what shirt color Daniel has. <laughs> uh, but in the scripting show, you'll find how we can actually leverage these variables to do a lot of really powerful things. So uh, so just be aware, they, they are incredibly useful. Even though here we were just kind of learning more of the, the fundamentals of it, uh, we will get to some real-world stuff in the Shell episodes. All right. Well, Don, thanks for joining us, and we do thank our audience for watching as well. Hopefully you've enjoyed this episode. But it is that time for us to call it a day. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pazette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Vector. Live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings everyone and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're coming back at you with more in our Linux command line series. Joining us in the studio yet again, you know him, you love him, he's our good friend, Mr. Don Pazette. Don, welcome back, man. How's it going today? It is going great. Ready to continue on with our, our uh, section on stuff that can screw up your command line experience. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we had a chance to talk about environment variables, and, and we've talked about a few other things that are all, all stuff we need to be aware of while we're working on the command line. And in this episode, we're going to talk about what is probably the biggest bane to my command line existence, which are file permissions. File permissions influence everything we do whenever we touch files. And when you're working from the command line, you're touching files a lot. So we need to have a basic understanding of how file permissions work and kind of understand how they can, I, I keep saying interfere, right, which is what they do to me, uh, <laughs> but how they can influence the way <laughs> that we execute commands and, and, and work with files on our file system. So that's what we're going to take a look at right here in this episode. Well, Don, this is going to be a great episode because if you've ever been banging away at a keyboard and you're like, yes, I'm going to, well, I'm going to just mess around with this Etsy shadow file. That'll be a lot of fun. And you get that permission denied. Well, okay, well, let me let me uh, try another file. I'm permission denied. Oh, I want to run one of Don's scripts. 
Permission denied. I want to open this one. And again, down and down and down we go. We tend to get that a lot. Is this what file permissions is doing? Uh, yeah, you know, sometimes it's file permissions. Sometimes it's other kind of like security policies. Hmm. Like you mentioned uh, slash etc slash passwd, which is a, a protected file. Uh, there's times where you might not be able to access a file. You not, might not be able to perform an action. And so you say, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to use sudo, and I'll run it as root. Yeah. And, and it certainly works then. It? <laughs> yeah, it but does. <laughs> that's not always the appropriate thing to do. Sometimes you just need to modify the permissions on that file to suit your needs, and now you don't have to get the root user involved every time you go to perform an action. So there are things that are best, better left not done by root. Uh, if you can avoid it. So sudo should not be your go-to every day, every command you know, kind of use. It should be more of a one-off type thing. And if you're finding something that has to repeatedly be done with sudo, you probably need to find some way to, to get around that to make it where it doesn't need that or where you can grant yourself permissions. And this is where we need to have that basic understanding of how permissions work. So for example, um, you know, here in my, my home folder, if I take a look at my files, I've got a file called my script dot sh okay and it's sitting right there it's right on the file system and if i want to run it i can try and run it so i'll, I'll call my script dot sh and i get permission denied now that's really weird because i'm in my home folder i'm the one who made this file i made this script and i i can't run it. i'm getting permission denied on my own stuff and if i do a ls dash l and look at the long output and I find my script.sh, I'm the owner of this file. I should be able to do whatever I want. The problem is the permissions are stopping me from executing it. And this is one of those scenarios where even if I was the root user, I wouldn't be able to execute it, right? If I, if I try to do a sudo dot slash my script.sh and run it, I get, well, I get command not found because uh, sudo is running in some other folder. So let's uh, <laughs> make sure we actually give it the whole thing here. And am I typing it wrong? It is my script. Oh, shoot. I'm forgetting that it's not going to find it there. Uh, but when I go and fire it up here with my script.sh, there we go. Um, it's not even finding that shell script to execute. So that's a little odd. Uh, I mean, I could just do su and become the root user. That's a fun one, right? So now I'm actually the root user, and I can get into my home directory, and I can run my script.sh, permission denied. denied. So pretty unusual for the root user not to be able to do something. So sudo, or even logging in as root, that's not always going to be our solution to get around this stuff. We need to understand how the permissions are influencing what we do. All right? Now, when I take a look at my script.sh, that permissions line, this is the, the whole line right here. Let me, uh, let me just do a uh, slightly different view. There we go. So we can kind of dial in on that one file specifically. I want to explain what each kind of piece of this line means. And when we look at it, we're actually seeing a collection of, of several different pieces of data, right? Right here at the beginning, this whole jumbly mess of, of letters and numbers, that right there those are the actual file permissions, the permissions assigned to this file that are telling me what we're allowed to do. And there's three different values that you're going to see here. There's R, which means you have permission to read the file. W, you have permission to write to the file. You can change it. And then X, you have permission to execute it. Now, you might notice there's no X, no X anywhere in this list. And that's because nobody has permission to execute this file. The permissions that you're looking at right here are the defaults for most Linux distributions. And, and distributions can choose to change the default permissions if they want. But this is pretty standard right here. It's giving me read and write permissions. It's giving the group read and write permissions. And it's giving everyone else read permissions. See, these letters here, it's actually three different sections, right? The first section, well, actually, let's start at the very beginning, right? This very first dash is telling me whether this is a file or a directory. If it's a dash, it's a file. If it's a D, it's a directory. Right? So if I pull up the, the bigger listing again and I take a look at it, see how some of the files start with a dash and some start with a D. The D is our, our directory, so I have a music directory. And there it is, got a D. But my script has a dash. Right? So that, that's what the first one does. Then the next three letters are the permissions for whoever owns this file. I own the file. It's my file. I have read, so I can look inside it. 
and I have write, so I can change it. But I don't have X. I don't have execute, so I can't run it. And that's why when I try and run my script.sh, it fails to run. The next three letters are for the group. A group is more than one person that might have access to that file and what permissions they get. And in this case, the group would have read and write and no execute. Now, who is the group? Well, if we just look over here a little bit, I've got the user that owns it and then the group that's attached to it. All right. Now, the user is dpossessed. That makes sense. That's me. Right? I made it. It's mine. But then the group, that doesn't make sense. It's dpossessed. That's me. Right? Well, whenever you create a user account in Linux, it creates a group with the same name. So there's actually a dpossessed group. And if I want to give somebody access to my files, so maybe I hire Daniel as my secretary, and I want him to have access to all of my data. I'm pretty sure you'd make a bad secretary, but let's say Most I take like a chance. That's like. And so <laughs> I, I want to give him access to all my stuff. I could just put him in the dpossessed group, and now he would have access to my files, or at least based on whatever the permissions here indicate. Because the group can have different permissions than the user. I might have read and write, and I give the group just read permissions, and that's it. Okay. Uh, and then the last little bit here, this one doesn't correspond to a name column over here, right? And that's because this is the column that applies to everybody else, right? So this is called the other. You have user, group, and other, or U-G-O. And that O, the other, is just everybody else, right? So if you're not the dpsset user, or if you're not in the dpsset group, then you get whatever's right here. And the default here is just read. You'd be able to read this file, but you wouldn't be able to write to it to change it and you definitely wouldn't be able to execute it, you don't have those permissions. Those permissions right there dictate how this file works, how this is going to, to work to allow me to connect up to a system or uh, to run the script or whatever. It's going to influence that. So when you start getting things like permission denied on a file that you own, that you created, well, that's when you might need to get in here and start manipulating these permissions. So I want to show you how that works. And what you'll find is it's actually pretty easy. In the, in the olden days, it was actually really annoying to go in and change file permissions. Um, each permission didn't have a simple letter that identified it. It had a number. So, for example, if I said your permissions were 755, right? 7 meant I had read, write, and execute. 5 meant I had read and execute. So if it was 755, the user had read, write, and execute. The group had read and execute, and everyone else had read and execute. That was a pretty standard permission. But if I just walked up to somebody off the street and said, hey, your permission is a 755, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. So Yeah, they're going to look at yeah. you like, aren't <laughs> you a crazy person? Because that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> you must be one of those Unix guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and it's true. It, it's not intuitive, and, and it stems from the whole idea of, you know, it was developers that made this stuff. Yeah. It was for developers, so sure, let's use byte values instead of, of actual letters right? it's actually kind of genius once you once you understand how the system works but it's not very intuitive and that's the problem with it right right and so years ago they introduced the letter structure instead and today the numbering structure is actually being deprecated or at least inside of most commands it is so we want to use the letter structure instead and the letter structure is so much easier because you have rwx <laughs> read write and execute and we can assign permissions and take them away just by remembering those letters so for example, here, when I look at this, I might decide that uh, I want to be able to read, write, and execute this script, and I don't want anybody else to be able to touch it, right? Just me, and that's it. So we can go in and we can modify these permissions. We can add permissions. We can take away permissions using a very important command, chmod, right? chmod, that's the change mode command, and we can change the permission mode that's running on this file. And the chmod command, if you pull up its help file, it's, it's very well documented on how it works and the permissions that get set for it. Um, you can also view more on permissions inside of like the bash documentation. It's got some in there. Um, but really, it, it, it's not so bad. So let me, let me give you the quick primer here on how these permissions work. Um, if I want to change permissions, I type chmod. And then I type whose permissions I want to change. Do I want to change the user? Then I would type a u. Do I want to change the group? I would type a g. Or do I want to change the other? It would be the O, right? U, G, O, those three letters, right? That's who I'm going to change. I want to change the user. I want to have read, write, and execute. Well, I've already got read and write, so I just need to add execute. So I'm going to say plus X. 
So take the user and add execute. That's what I want. And then I tell it the file that I want to modify. And so I'll say dot slash my script dot sh. Right? And when I run that, it modifies the user permissions. And so now when I pull up the directory listing for it, I can see that the user actually has read, write, and execute. And then the group still has read and write, and everybody else has read. Now I added permissions here. I could take away permissions as well. right? So I could say, for example, uh, chmod, and then maybe I, I don't want the group to have write permissions, and I don't want everyone else to have read. You know, if you're in the group, I'll let you read, but I don't want you to write. So I'm going to take away some. I could say group minus w. And then I could even do a comma and say o minus r. I'm taking away read permission. And you could mix and match some of these. Like I could add uh, execute for one and remove execute for another. So you can add and remove. So you're just uh, separating, like, separating them out by the comma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. it and, and so you can add in as many as you need. And then I'll do my script.sh and we'll run that. And now, if I pull that listing back up, and it's kind of making my zoom go crazy there, <laughs> but, uh, but if I pull my listing back up, what I'll see is that my read, write, execute is there for my user. The group now just has read, and the other has nothing. Right? Mm -hmm. The permissions are set the way that I want it. Now, you do need to be careful with this, because if you, if you forget to specify the U, the G, or the O, then it affects everybody. So for example, if I just did chmod plus x and specified my script.sh like that, that's going to add execute permissions for everyone. And so when I run that and then pull up those permissions again, see how everybody got execute? Now, interesting note here, the group has read and execute, so they can run the file. Everybody else still wouldn't be able to run the file, because how am I supposed to run the file if I can't even read it? I need to be able to read it in order to execute. So the permissions aren't correct in that scenario. They're actually kind of broken a little bit, but it'll, it'll let you do that. It, it assumes you know what you're doing. Sometimes that's not the case. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or it's just an accident, you know, mm -hmm. so I might need to come back in and correct that. Um, but basically by doing this, we're setting those permissions and getting them put in place. I'm, I'm assigning them and getting them set the way that I need them to be so that now the script will actually work. And since I have read, write, and execute on it, I should now be able to call that script. And when I run it, instead of getting permission denied, it actually runs. And my little scripture says, hello world. So there it is. <laughs> and I see that it ran, and it actually worked. And if I logged into somebody that it was in my group, like if I put Daniel in my group, then he would be able to run this script as well, and it would execute for him. But anybody else tries to run it, they can't even read it. So it's not going to run. Uh, they would actually have to call it through some interpreter that in turn had permissions to access it, uh, and usually that's going to break. So in this case, it's now uh, kind of set up in a certain way. I really just need to go ahead and remove those uh, execute permissions for the other. So I'll say chmod o minus x for my script.sh, and I'll just remove their permissions. And now when I pull up that listing, I can see I have read, write, and execute, and then the group has read and execute. And you want to be careful with write permissions on a script, because anybody who has write permissions could change the script to make it do different things. And then when I run it the next time, now it's doing stuff I didn't intend it to. So you only want to give write permissions to somebody you really trust when it comes to scripts like this. But this applies really to any file, even just text files or, or whatever. Uh, if you want to have access to them, you need at least read to get to them, and you can modify permissions just like this. Now, Don, riddle me this. Uh, we've got the owner, we've got the group, and we have other. That's everybody else that's, that's on the system. We've laid that out for everyone out there. But, you know, that tends to, people come and go, especially inside of corporate environments, right? So you hired me as your secretary, and I've made some scripts, <laughs> and they run great, and all of a sudden I'm gone. I'm no longer a user on the system, and you hire Bill. Bill comes in. How is Bill supposed to run those without you having to keep resetting Things like that. All right. In, in a perfect world, you'll use groups for everything. Yeah. Right. So if I have a group that has access to this file, when I hire Bill, I just put him in the group. And when I fire Daniel, in, inevitably, <laughs> inevitably. Uh, and then I just take him out of the group. And now he doesn't have the permission. So the groups are kind of what manages everything. So that's how you really want to do it. But you could do it by the owner as well. You might be the owner of the file today. I, I, and then, maybe I created the file. 
Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, and and so now we just take that file and we assign Bill as the new one. Mm. You can certainly do that. Uh, we've got two commands that come into play here. There's chown, which is change owner, and then there's chgrp, which is change group. And like their names imply, one changes the group, one changes the owner. Now, I'll be honest with you, I never use ch group <laughs> because chown can actually change both the owner and the group, and so I just use chown for everything. But but there are two commands, right? So let's say that, uh, for example, my script that I made. There's a number of administrators on my system, and I want them all to be able to run it. Well, there's an administrator's group called ADM. And so I want the ADM group to be attached to this, not dpossess. So I could do chgrp, and then the name of the group, so in my case, ADM, and then the file I want to change. So I'll do myscript.sh. And chgroup, uh, oops, I'm getting a permission problem here. Um, <laughs> but chgroup, uh, it can actually be run recursively as well. You can do a dash R on it, and it'll get all the subfiles and subfolders as well, so you might need to do that. Um, I'm getting a permission problem here because I'm doing an administrative group. If I'd done a regular group, it would have worked just fine. Uh, so I'm going to need to sudo this one. There we go. <laughs> and so now it lets me change that group, uh, again, just because I picked an administrative. If you had a group like called accounting, yeah. and you had permission to manage that group, then you'd be able to assign that, and you wouldn't have to sudo it. Now, if I take a look at my listing now for myscript.sh, I can see that the user is still dpossess, but now the group is ADM, right? I've changed the group to admin. And I could easily change that group back uh, just by specifying the group that I want it to be and putting it back like that, all right? If I want to change the owner, maybe I don't want dpossess to be the owner anymore. I want to make Daniel or the root user or somebody like that. I want them to be the owner. Then I could do chown and the name of the owner. So you know, maybe I want it to be root, and which I'll have to sudo in order to do that. Uh, and then I can specify that file. And now it's changing the owner. And when I look at that listing again, I can see it's now owned by root. But remember what I said. I can use chown to change both the owner and the group at the same time. So just to, to show you here, um, I'm going to change that owner back to dpossess there. And so now it's back to dpossess, dpossess. If I want to change this to the owner is root and the group is ADM, I could say chown, and or I'm going to sue to it here because I'm messing with admin stuff. Ah, no, you're not. Shoot. No, I'm going to accidentally <laughs> do a, a recursive search. So, um, so I'm going to do a chown, and I'll say root colon ADM. So I'm changing the owner and the group. You just use a colon to separate them. And, uh, and then we specify the file and it'll change them both at the same time. So I don't need the ch group command, I can just use ch own. Uh, and now when I take a look at it, we can see that the owner and the group have both changed. Now, I know what you're thinking. Oh, actually I don't, but well, let's <laughs> pretend that you're thinking, what if I just want to change the group, Don, and can I just use ch group? Come on, there's a command here. And you certainly could, but you can actually still use ch own even if you just wanted to change the group. All you do is leave the owner part off so if I wanted to put it back to being owned by the dpossess group, I could say colon dpossess like that. And the colon lets it know that I'm leaving the owner alone, the U, but I am changing the group, that part. And by doing that, now we can take a look at that file and I see that it's changed it. So really, you can use ch own for everything, but ch group is there. Ch group just not as flexible and I've kind of gotten out of the habit of using it. And if I want to put my file completely back to the way that it was, I can just do it right here. But the whole point of this little diatribe is that I can pick a particular group and attach it, and any user that's in that group would get those permissions. And if it's a script, as long as I give them read and execute, they'll be able to run that. But it's not just scripts that matter. So for example, I, I work with Amazon Web Services with AWS. And when you spin up a, a server in AWS and you want to SSH into it, you've got to provide a security key. And so I've got one of those security keys sitting right here, this awsdemo.pem. That's my, my security certificate that I use to log into my demo environment, right? Well, they require that only you have access to that file or they won't accept it. And not only should you be the only one that has access, it should be read-only even for you. And so when you first create this certificate, you likely have read, write, and execute, or at least read and write on it. And so you've got to change the permissions. And so what I had to do for this one was to set the permissions so that only I had read. And if you look at the permissions that are set on it, that's exactly what I've got. Okay. And 
where this gets tricky is if there's a bunch of permissions that are on it already, right? So let, let's say I did a chmod plus rwx aws demo.pem, okay? So I'm adding read, write, and execute for everyone, which is not That's super a great dangerous. idea. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm doing it, darn it. I'm a log yeah. in right now. <laughs> well, and, and this actually gives me a chance to highlight, I, I'm doing something bad, yeah. right? Uh, I shouldn't give read, write, and execute to everyone. And it's actually protecting me. There's this thing called a permissions mask. It's part of a security policy. I'm running Fedora, so it's protecting me. Not every distro protects you. But when I ran that plus RWX, I was saying, give everybody read, write, and execute. Well, if you'll notice, it didn't do what I told it. I mean, it did for the user in the group. But notice that for everyone, it did not give them write access. And that's because it says, Wow, Don, you're doing something really stupid. So we're going to stop that. <laughs> Put the that. training wheels on you, huh? Yeah, so it's protecting me a little bit. Not every distro does that, though. So be aware of that, that behavior. Now, at this point, Amazon is no longer going to accept my certificate because it knows the odds of it being compromised are high because the permissions are way whacked out on it. So I need to change this that only I have read. Now, I could go crazy on this and, and type out something really long. I could say chmod user minus write and execute, and then group would be minus read, write, and execute, and then other would be minus read and execute. You know, I've got to kind of look at the permissions and, and figure all this stuff out to, to write it out like that. And that's a pain, okay? So instead, what you can do is you can use like u equals, and you can set it this way. Equals overwrites the permissions that are in there right now. So I can say user equals read. And when I do that, it doesn't care that there was a uh, RWX before. When I do that and I look at the permissions again, see how the user, whoop, it didn't do it. You're done. I think there's a good reason that your permission thing isn't working there because you're working with the wrong file. Uh, you don't hear AWS.pem. <laughs> All right. So this is a uh, this is a classic PEBCAC error, yes, right? The yes, problem yeah. exists between keyboard and chair. ID 10T. Uh, <laughs> right. All right. I, I pulled the permission on the wrong file. So um, what I did is I did chmod u equals r, and then I did it on my script instead of AWS. So so let's go back and fix that. Uh, I needed to do that on my my PEM key. So. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm setting that u equals r, and when I do that, now, there we go. Uh, notice how my user has been overwritten, and it shows just r dash dash, right? The w and the x, I didn't mention them. So that they're considered unmentioned bits, they go away, and now it's reset, okay? What about everybody else? Well, they actually get left alone. So if you look at the others, they got left. What I should have done was run this a little bit different and said something like this u equals r, and then go, which would be group and other, equals, and then no. that's that, right? <laughs> uh, and when you do that, now those get overwritten as well, and their permissions get removed. And so if we take a look at that, now it's set the way that I want. So when Amazon or whoever says, you need to have read access and nobody else should have anything, u equals r, comma, go equals Nothing, right? Uh, you don't type a dash or anything. You just leave it empty, and that gets set. So pretty easy to modify those permissions. But what you'll find is as you're working with the file system, as you're working with scripts, and especially downloaded files, you'll run into this a lot. You'll download a file, and it'll be owned by the wrong user, or you sudoed something. I, I get this a lot, mm -hmm. where I might be temporarily working in a, a root shell, right? So I, I uh, do a sudo dash s while I'm, I'm running something. Maybe I'm installing a service real quick. So I install the service, and I get it configured. And then as part of the configuration, I do something crazy. I'm trying to give you a real world example yeah. here of, uh, I might copy uh, something from slash var slash log. So uh, uh, here, I'll get boot.log, right? So I'm, I'm getting this, or, or actually, I'll give you a great example. I'm looking at D message. And so I take something like the D message output, and I pipe that to a, a file, right? So I'll send it to slash home slash dpossett slash uh, boot.log. Right? And so I run that. Now, I was sudo or in a, a super user shell while I did it. And so then I exit out and I'm in my home directory. And I see that boot.log file sitting right there. All right, I'm ready to go at it. But if you look at it in a little more detail, you'll see that it is owned by root 
and the group is root because I was in a super user shell when I did it. So just the fact that I put it in my home directory is not enough. I, I would have read access because at least everyone has read on this file, but I wouldn't be able to write to it and I shouldn't be able to remove it. So if I try and delete boot.log, see how it says it's write protected? And if I say, yeah, yeah, do it anyway. Well, what it's doing here is it's trying to override it. And because I own the folder, it's allowing me to override it just like I would be allowed to change the ownership of it too. But I got that write protected message because I didn't have permissions to write to the file. So that's another example of how sometimes we can mess these permissions up and we have to clean it up a little bit. So chmod and chown, those are your friends. They, they help you to correct these permissions and get it set right. Uh, and, and so that, that's, I think, a, a pretty good rundown of the scenarios where I, I bumped into it with issues. Well, Don, it can definitely seem like Sanskrit when you see these CH <laughs> commands for the first time and you're all these U's and G's and O's and IR and X and W and plus and minus and equals and this and that. It gets a little, little strange, but if you just know what each one of those individual pieces mean, then you're going to have a much better time with working with them. Don, anything else that you want to add to the show before we call it a day? You know, there was a question in the chat room that I want to mention. Uh, you know, when I look at all these permissions, I explained what each of them were, and I kind of ignored this little dot at the end. Hmm. Uh, that dot, uh, technically, we really want to be official, it means nothing. Uh, but, but if it changes, then it does mean something. That little dot is indicating whether there are additional attributes attached to the file. And a lot of times we don't deal with additional attributes, but where we can are with what are called custom ACLs or file ACLs, FACLs, which some people call FACLs, and I, yeah. I hate that name <laughs> for some reason. But, but uh, anyhow, FACLs, file ACLs, where you can do something really detailed. I can only have one user and one group attached to this file. What if I just want to give Daniel access to the file? I don't want to give anybody else. I don't want to go and create a group just for that and bump other group memberships. I want to add a second user. You can't. In the traditional Unix permissions, in the POSIX permissions, you have one user, one group, and then everybody else. With file ACLs, with fackles, <laughs> you can have multiple users and multiple groups, and they can have different permissions. You can do really fine-grained security controls, right? And they're very powerful. Uh, if you watch our Becoming a Linux, I believe it's Becoming a Linux System Administrator show, uh, I actually do the, the file ACLs, or I call it advanced file permissions. Uh, and show how to do that. So you can always jump over to that show and catch it. But if there's advanced permissions set like that, that dot will change to a plus. If you see a little plus sign there at the end, that's the indicator that lets you know, oh, there's, there's some other stuff on this file. And when you go in and look at the file, you can pull those up uh, and you'll actually see those permissions. I, I don't have any set on mine here, so I can't show them. But if you jump over to the system admin show, we, we go and configure them in there and you can get a chance to see that. Um, if you really want to, to actually see it, uh, when you do the ls command, if you add a dash at, the at symbol, uh, that'll actually show the advanced permissions, and you'll be able to see those if they exist. But otherwise, it'll just be a dot like all my files here. Wow, Don. Well, it definitely uh, pays to know your ls command a little better than <laughs> just ls, right? And, and that, that does actually kind of ring true. We do need to be able to see that, oh, look, I'm having a problem accessing this file because root is the owner. I need to change ownership. It's in my directory. Or I've given somebody else uh, permissions over it, uh, anything of that nature. And knowing what those U, G, and O, plus those R, W, X, and the plus, minus, and equal sign, all that comes together to help us be able to create the correct file permissions on each one of our files, specifically when we get into the scripting area of things. Why is this not running? Well, you didn't put the correct permissions on it. And to this day, I still forget to do the stupid who make this thing executable from time to time. It still bites me in the tail from, uh, every now and then. Don, thanks so much for dropping by today and explaining file permissions. I know it can be a bit of a bear, especially if you're new to this, but I think you did a fantastic job of laying it out for us, making it very understandable. Uh, that being said, looking at the clock, we are out of time. We do thank you for joining us today. Hope you've enjoyed this episode, but time to sign off. For IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pazette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pazetta, coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back with more in our Linux command line series. 
And you'll never guess who's joining us today. It's the President of the United States, Mr. Don Pizet. Don, welcome back. <laughs> How's it going today? <laughs> well, you know, if we uh, mess with enough voting machines, it yeah, can happen. <laughs> You know, speaking of messing with things, uh, in the last few episodes, we've been looking at our shell environment and things that can mess with our shell, or at least, you know, make our experience different. And so we, we learned about environment variables. We learned about file permissions. And in this episode, I want to talk about file systems, that when we're interacting with the Linux environment, it's typically happening through a file system of some sort. And there's several different choices. Each one can change the behavior of our experience. And so I want to highlight the different file systems that are available and really what the difference is between each one, just so that we're aware and that we know what to expect when we're working on a system formatted with one file system versus another. So that's what we've got lined up right here in this episode. Well, Donna, sounds like a whole lot of fun, so let's get cracking. I guess since you've posed the idea of looking at the differences between the file systems, a good place to start would probably be what file system am I running and how we figure that out. Yeah, you know, so if you want to know what file system you've already got on your disk, there's a number of different commands that can do it, but probably the easiest one is just to look at your mount output. Uh, when you type mount on your, your keyboard, it'll show everything that's, that's mounted. And when you look at how it's been mounted, you'll see what the file system is. So if I look in here and find my, my NVMe, for example, so here's my, my main hard drive, I can see that the file system type is XFS, right? So that's my file system. Uh, but if I look, I've got several partitions, and some of them might be formatted XFS. Other ones might be formatted with some other file system, because you've got the, the choice. You can format things any number of different file system types. So this is XFS. What does that mean to me, right? I might come in here and find EXT4, or BTRFS, or GFS, or ZFS, who, who knows, you know, any number of different file systems. And at the end of the day, once it's mounted, I just browse into it and access the disk, and, and, and what do I care? But there actually are some things we need to be aware of, that when you're working with different file systems, some support some features and some don't. For example, oftentimes you'll spot things that are mounted with Fuse. All right, Fuse, F-U-S-E. Fuse is actually a collection of drivers for third-party file systems, things like Microsoft's NTFS or Apple's HFS Plus, or Google Drive even. And so you can mount these really weird file systems inside of Linux and access the data. The majority of times, those are read-only because they're having to reverse engineer how to access the data. And they do the best they can, but it's not perfect. And that means that if they were to allow you to write to it, you could potentially corrupt your data and lose information. So Fuse will typically mount things read-only. Now, it's not always the case. If you look, here, mine, the connections here are mounted read-write. So there are times that they're mounted read-write, but you need to be careful with that. That's a great example right there of something that would impact my use of a file system. If it's mounted read-only, I can't write to it. And if it's a third-party file system like Windows NTFS, I probably don't want to write to it because the risk of corruption is too great versus XFS, which is a fully supported file system. It's natively supported by my operating system. It was developed inside of the open source community. I can read and write to that all day long. It's incredibly stable, great file system to use. All right. So that's kind of one of the things that we need to know is we need to understand which file systems we're using so that we know what we can and can't do or what we should and shouldn't do. Like Just because I could write doesn't mean that I should write to that file system if I want to maintain integrity. Now, Don, you, you kind of brought up a, a good point there about the different file systems, and this one does this, and that one is supported natively by my operating system and things of that nature. Does that mean there is unnecessarily or not necessarily a better uh, file system, but just better for my use yeah, kind of I'm, a scenario? We could start a whole file system religious <laughs> war if we wanted on this. You know, there, there's a lot of people that have a favorite, and they stick by it, and they, they don't want to deviate. Uh, but the reality is... Most file systems work the same, right? <laughs> so you got a table with a file name, and it points to data on the drive somewhere. You go and you get it, and you're happy. So most end users really couldn't care less which file system they were using. But we need to understand which file system we're using so that we know the limitations that we've got. And we might find that there is one that better suits our needs, and that's our preference. But I encourage you not to, to kind of fall into that trap where you stick with one file system, because as you start working with servers, you may find ones that are already set up for a particular file system, and it's pretty hard to change. So a lot of times you just have to make yourself exist within the boundaries of that file system and, and, and deal with it. I kind of feel like, almost like we, we were shopping for laptops, and you're thinking, oh, do I want this one or do I want that one? Neither of them are really a bad choice, but one of them fit my scenario a whole lot better, so I need to be able to see, 
oh, it does this, and if I didn't know that it did that, I wouldn't know that that's the best thing for my environment. And that's kind of what we're doing with these different file systems that we have. We have the, the EXT and the old Riser FS and this and that and the other. Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through some of the common file systems that we might run into, limitations and abilities? All right, let's start with the most popular. The most popular is EXT, right? EXT was developed in the Linux world, it was developed for Linux, so it's supported by every single Linux distribution that's out there, unless somebody has purposefully messed with it. Uh, and so <laughs> EXT, it's been around a long time, it's very robust, very stable, and as a result, it's the default for a lot of distributions. But because it's old, it's been updated a number of times. So there's more than one version of EXT. EXT, it actually stands for the uh, extended file system, that they took older file system technology and extended that functionality out. And Right now, the oldest version that most distros support is EXT2, but most people don't run EXT2. It's usually either EXT3 or EXT4. EXT3 was a big deal. When it first came out, I remember when it first came out because it was the first one to support journaling, right? In the olden days, when I started writing to a file, let's say I had a one meg file, and I made a change in some program and I hit save. Well, I'm actually working with it in RAM, and so then it's got to write it to the disk. And it would start to overwrite the file and if we got halfway through overwriting the file and then we lost power, when I powered the computer back on, that file was corrupt, right? Because it was overwriting the file that I was just working with. I had a partial write to it, and now my data is corrupt. That's bad. Well, what journaling does is it says, for now on, when you go to write to a file, you don't write to the file. You write to a separate spot on the disk, right? You write to a journal. It's really just a separate place. And so you write to a separate file. And when it's 100% written to that other file, then we can swap that data with the data of the original file. And that way, if you're writing and you're halfway through the write and you lose power, only the journal is corrupt. So when you power the computer back on, it just flushes the journal. So let me throw all that junk out. And then your original file is still intact. And sure, you lost your changes, but at least your data is not corrupt. And that's what journaling does. So very, very valuable. You want to have a journaling file system. All the, the modern file systems support journaling one way or another. So EXT3 was the first version of EXT that did that. So that's why EXT3 is usually what you'll see that's out there, and EXT4 is an improvement upon that. They've it journals expanded. twice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it still journals once, uh, but it does better incorporate it into the file system itself, whereas EXT3, it was an add-on. Uh, you could actually take EXT2, and you could add journaling to it, which made it EXT3. That's how you, you upgraded it. It really, EXT3 and EXT2 are the same thing, except EXT3 is just EXT2 with the journaling turned on. EXT4 actually has the journaling integrated into it. So it, it does a better job, and it can handle larger file systems and so on. So that's kind of what EXT, uh, uh, EXT3 and 4 are. So with those file systems, uh, I'll be inclined to pick EXT3 or EXT4 if I'm trying to get the most compatibility. If I want to know that this disk can be accessed from anywhere. If I have a USB drive, I'll usually format it EXT4 because I know I can move it to different systems and EXT will be red and it'll be happy like that. That's a good, stable file system to use. So we do see that one as a default for a lot of distros. Like if you install Ubuntu today or if you install Debian, they both default to EXT4 and, or yes, EXT4. <laughs> so it's again three for a second, but they, they both switch to four. Uh, and so that's kind of a, a file system that you'll encounter a lot. Don, is there a reason that uh, EXT3 is still might have been an option in your mind? Yeah, EXT4 is newer, and what you'll find is that people, people tend to be very cautious with a file system, right? What happens if your file system messes up? You lose data. Do you want to lose data? I'm I don't. a big fan. Yeah, <laughs> most people don't want that. So vendors are cautious. They don't want to jump on the latest and greatest right away because they want to make sure the data is safe. And you need to store large quantities of data for long periods of time before you can identify any potential data loss scenarios. And so that's why we see some people haven't quite gone to four just yet. But uh, most of the vendors, I believe, have, uh, and that's just kind of how file systems are. It takes time to build out traction and then jump into some new version of a file system. Now, Don, what if I was on an older version of EXT? Maybe I'm still running EXT2. I've got a machine sitting around from God knows when. I've decided, you know what, this EXT3 thing, or maybe even EXT4, really seems like the bee's knees. I want to go from this to that. Is there a way I can do that without reformatting? Well, you can upgrade from EXT2 to EXT3 because mm -hmm. you, you just add uh, journaling support, right? There's the Tune2FS command that lets you do that. Uh, there's not a way to upgrade to EXT4, though, because the journaling is incorporated in the file system. You actually have to reformat. 
And, and really, with all the other file systems we're going to talk about here in this episode, there's no way to, to just quickly switch between them. Mm -hmm. You back up your data, you format the disk with the new file system, and then you restore your data to it. So that's why I say don't put yourself in a, in a situation where you just have one file system you want to work with because it's hard to change. So if you go and start supporting a new server that's already got some other file system, if it meets your requirements, leave it at that other file system and then you know just work with it and understand the, the boundaries that are there. All right, Don, we also mentioned XFS. Uh, you know, apparently you'd like it a little bit, you're using it. <laughs> uh, could you explain a little bit about that one? All right, XFS, um, I, I'm a Red Hat guy. Red, Red Hat's my, my favorite distro because I, I work in business environments and I like to have support, and so Red Hat's what I choose. Uh, XFS is the default file system for Red Hat, which means it's also the default file system for CentOS and Fedora, so they, you know, they all are, are kind of tied together. So <clears throat> what XFS does is it's the extensible file system. I'm sorry, the uh, extents file system. I'm getting the right name. Uh, and it stores files a different way than EXT does. So it's a little bit more optimized. There's better indexing to locate data faster. It's designed for performance. Uh, it's not as old as EXT, so it's not as, as field-tested and as widely supported, but it's extremely stable, and that's the key thing with Red Hat because they offer commercial support for the file system. They don't want to uh, have something that could have potential data loss. They want to have a nice, stable file system that is feature-rich, but not so feature-rich that it introduces a lot of risk. XFS supports things like snapshots, so I can quickly back up a partition if I want. Uh, it does support growing a partition, so I can make it bigger. Uh, it does have uh, problems with like shrinking. A, a lot of file systems don't shrink. XFS is one of those. Uh, so if I want to shrink a partition, I've actually got to back it up, wipe it, you know, resize. So it's kind of a pain there. So it's not perfect. But if you want stability and performance, XFS is a winner. And so, yeah, you'll notice most of the disks that I use, like on my own laptop here, if I just I'll pull up the disks utility, uh, if we take a look at, at most of my disks, like my, uh, my one terabyte disk here is entirely formatted XFS, uh, and then I've got my own, like my home directory, uh, also formatted XFS. Uh, that, that's what I use because I'm, I'm concerned about stability, right? Uh, I'm not necessarily concerned about crazy features. A, a lot of the features have to deal with things like RAID, if I want to do a RAID 1 mirror, well, I'm in a laptop. I don't have the benefit of multiple drives to be able to do a RAID 1 mirror or RAID 5 or whatever. So I don't care about those features. Those don't help me. Moving to a file system that provided those features would not help me. So I stick with one that's focused more on stability than features, and that, that's why I've chosen XFS. Now, Don, the uh, latest and greatest, the, the new hotness, as the kids <laughs> say, when it comes to file systems inside of Linux is the BTRFS, if I'm not uh, mistaken on that acronym. Yeah. Uh, what do you know about that guy? All right. If you do your Googling on file systems, you will find countless threads about BTRFS is the greatest file system on the planet. And, you know, I, I, I could see where you could come up with that. BTRFS is super feature rich. Now, there's some arguments over what it stands for. The, the, the name actually stands for the B-Tree file system. And B-Tree is a, uh, a term that describes how it indexes files so that it can find information. But you'll find a lot of people call it the better file system or the <laughs> butter file system because it's so smooth. Um, it, you know, it's a fancy file system and a lot of people feel that it is the way of the future. That uh, three years from now, if I record a show like this, that BTRFS will be the file system everybody's running. Okay, But BTRFS actually has a number of data loss scenarios. Its RAID functionality is not good. Uh, so if mm -hmm. you're doing RAID 1 or RAID 5 inside of BTRFS, there are a number of scenarios. You can just go and pull the bug lists up on the BTRFS uh, project site, uh, and you'll find a number of scenarios where you can actually lose data. That's not something that I like to see in a in a file system. Es no bueno. Yeah. <laughs> so on a, on a laptop where I'm not using RAID, where I'm just running the core BTRFS stuff, that might be great. And so it works out fine. So a lot of home users will use BTRFS because they think it's awesome. But in the business world, BTRFS is actually kind of being shunned. And, and let me just show you an example, um, Red Hat. So here's the, the Red Hat supported file systems page where they list all the file systems they support. And in Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.3 and earlier, they had support for BTRFS, but it was flagged as preview, right? Because they were trying to test it to make sure it was stable enough. Well, starting in 7.4, Red Hat has officially dropped support for BTRFS. It's not even a preview anymore. It's just gone. So when you come and look at their supported file systems, it's not even in the list. So it, it's just not there. You've got EXT 2, 3, and 4. You've got XFS that I've already talked about. You got GFS, which is the cluster file system that's designed for for server clusters, not mm -hmm. for like workstations. Um, but you know those file systems, those are the ones they support. Those are the ones where they can guarantee data resiliency. Right? 
BTRFS is off. So it's a very powerful file system. BTRFS has a ton of bells and whistles. It can do really cool stuff. It can create logical volumes. You can grow and shrink them. You can clone volumes. You can create multiple RAID arrays. You can do all sorts of really cool stuff right inside of BTRFS. Very powerful. But it just needs more time to mature and become more data stable. And once that happens, I do believe that BTRFS is the future. I think we all will be running BTRFS five years from now. Maybe not two years from now, right? It's just going to take time for that to evolve, but it is another file system that's out there. Well, Don, what if I like living on the edge, man? I play the ponies and I download unstable yeah. <laughs> file systems. Can I still do that? Yeah. I mean, if you install Ubuntu today mm -hmm. or if you install Debian today, in the installer, you can choose BTRFS, mm -hmm. right? If you install CentOS, they've actually kept the driver in on theirs and, and you can choose BTRFS. But if you install Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it's not even an option in the list. And if you add it yourself, because you can't do that, uh, if you add it yourself, Red Hat won't support you. If you call them on the phone and you've got some problem on your disk, they'll look and they'll say, well, you're running BTRFS. What do you expect? <laughs> and, and so that, that's Bye. what you get. All right, but, you know, that makes me think of something else. Speaking of support, uh, when it comes to working in these file systems, they all support a standard feature set, things like file permissions, right, and the, the path directory structure and all that. They all support that. But there are some file systems that don't. So, for example, if I format a disk as uh, FAT, the old Microsoft file allocation table, every Linux dis distribution supports FAT because we use it on SD cards and stuff. But if you format a file system as FAT, it doesn't support file permissions. So you, you can't set permissions on files anymore, and you can't set disk quotas on folders. You lose that support. That may be important. It may not. On an SD card, it's not really important, so what do you care? But on your main hard drive, you do care. But where I find I'm impacted the most are by the maximum file sizes. And so this page that I'm on here, let me, let me go back to this. Um, what Red Hat is doing is they're listing the certified and maximum file size and file system size, okay? The file system means if I create a partition, what's the biggest partition I can support while using a particular file system? And if we look at this, I, let me try and zoom in a bit here, uh, but we've got ext2, 3, and 4 are the top two, and XFS is the bottom. So if I look over here at the file system, I can see that ext2, you could do a 16 terabyte partition with ext2 or 3. Well, if I wanted more than 16 terabytes, I can't do that with ext2 and 3. I'd have to go up to ext4 where I could get 50 terabytes. Now, notice the little uh, bracketed number there, that one exabyte, right? That means that theoretically, ext4 can go all the way to one exabyte for a single partition but Red Hat hasn't tested it. They haven't created a one terabyte array and run it through thorough testing. So they're saying we'll support up to 50 terabytes. And I encourage you guys, even if you don't run Red Hat, if you run Ubuntu or whatever, follow Red Hat's list here because they've tested and certified that there's no data loss up to this particular size. And if you look down at XFS, it can go, well, they've tested to 500 terabytes and all the way up to 16 exabytes, really huge amount of data there uh, to, to be tested. Now, back when, um, back when BTRFS was supported by Red Hat, they didn't have a certified number at all. They just had the theoretical, and the theoretical on it was 8 exabytes. So uh, very comparable to what we get with XFS. But on the file size, that's where we're most likely to run into an issue because when we're creating files, right, it's not often that I have a 16 terabyte drive. When I might have a database that has a file that's over 2 terabytes in size, and if I've got ext2 or 3, 2 terabytes is the maximum size for a file, that database is going to have some problems. All right. So if you're running into an issue with files, you might have exceeded that file size. On some of the older formats like FAT, this, this limit's like 2 gigs. It's really, really low, and we bump into that problem all the time. But with these file systems, they support much larger sets of data. If you look at XFS, an individual file could be 500 terabytes. Well, theoretically, 8 exabytes. Uh, same thing with BTRFS. They go up to 8 exabytes on a file. That's a huge amount of data. But if you find that you're trying to copy a file and it's telling you the, 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 there's not enough disk space and you look and there is, it might be that the file itself is actually bigger than the limit of that file system. And that happens, right? That's the kind of limitation. That's why we need to understand what the file system is. We don't necessarily need to change the file system. We just need to understand the file system and say, all right, I'm trying to do something this file system doesn't support, so maybe I need to break that file up. Or maybe I do need to format it and put this data on a, you know, on a different file system. So you can certainly go through that. But uh, I didn't want to really delve into the 
the like the actual goals. administrative side yeah. here in this episode, but more of just understanding that limitation because when we're remoted into a cloud server where the d drives are already formatted or, or whatever, we need to understand those limitations so that we can operate inside of that. And, and as you work with the command line, you will occasionally bump into these limits. All right. Well, Don, this is a really great compare and contrast when it comes to the different file systems that we might find in our systems and why I might want to choose one over the other and, heck, how to find out what one I'm actually running if I do want to make that, uh, that leap or if I'm running into problems with trying to do something, maybe moving that file that's a little too large. Don, anything else that you want to add to the show before we call it a day? Yeah, if, uh, if you're really interested in learning about this and you want to learn more about like, how to actually format a file system or, or how to you know, work with some of the advanced features, uh, check out our Linux system administrator show because we, we actually go through and do this stuff there. Here in the command line show, I just wanted to focus on what those differences were, mm -hmm. uh, but we do cover it in other shows, so be sure to check it out there. Uh, and then as far as picking a file system, I said I like XFS, but that's just me, and, and, and who the heck am I, right? So if you like BTRFS, stick with it. If you like EXT4, great, stick with it. Uh, only switch if there's actually some particular tangible benefit. And in my case, the tangible benefit is support, that I, I know that Red Hat has tested it, and that makes me happy, right? Uh, if you don't care about that, then that doesn't make you happy, and there's no reason to go with it. So, uh, you know, find the one that you like, but don't pigeonhole yourself. I, I still learn about the other file systems because I know I need to know them in case I encounter systems that have that, uh, and I don't necessarily want to do that change. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time and effort on this, Don. We Definitely appreciate it. And we appreciate you good folks out there for watching. But uh, unfortunately, it's that time for us again <laughs> to call it a day. Thanks for watching. Join us back more for more Linux command line coming up. But as for this show goes, time to sign off. For IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back with more in our Linux command line series, and it's been such a great time so far that joining us back in the studio again, he liked it so much, Mr. Don Pizzette is here with us again today. Don, how's it going today? Boy, you just can't keep me away from no, that Linux no, command no. line. So <laughs> we are back at it today. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at package management, which is a fancy way of saying installing software. And uh, so we're going to take a look at the Debian operating system or, or the Debian variants that are out there mm. and get a chance to see how we can install software on them, how we can work with it, how we can remove software, and the various ways that we get software packages up and running from the command line. All right, Don, well, let's uh, go ahead and without further ado, let's jump into Debian package management. Obviously, when we say Debian package management, that means that this is some sort of ilk for Debian type systems. Correct? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, it, it used to be back in the day when half the viewers are, we would say, that's awesome. I run Debian. I love it. Right. Mm -hmm. But today, actually, not many people run straight up Debian, but they do run some of the variants that come from it. Right. Ubuntu, one of the most popular Linux distros out there, is a fork of Debian. So that they take Debian dev, uh, dev, the dev fork of it, and then they turn that into Ubuntu. If you run Linux Mint, Linux Mint is a fork of Ubuntu, which in turn is a fork of Debian. So they all kind of have Debian deep down under their, their deep dark souls. And, <laughs> and, and that means, fortunately, the way we manage packages on them is the same. So if you're running Debian, Linux Mint, Ubuntu, uh, Kali Linux, a number of the other variants that are out there, they all use the same package manager and the stuff we're going to see right here in this episode. So while it's titled Debian package management, it really applies to a lot more distros than that. Now, if you're running Red Hat or Fedora or CentOS, they're all Red Hat based. They have a different package manager. So when you go out on the internet and you go to look for software, you might find where software is packaged for Debian based systems or it's packaged for Red Hat based systems or better, maybe it's packaged for both. But that's not always the case. Now I think you'll find that most software is packaged for Debian because of Ubuntu, because of its popularity. So you're more likely to find that than you are the Red Hat side. So if you're in this camp, the camp for this episode, you're in luck because most people are going to build for you. And that package, let's talk about why that's important, right? Because the package itself does something important. We don't technically need packages to install software. We just need source code, right? A developer can release the source code, we could download it, and we could compile it and run it. 
and, and we'll, we'll see how to do that in another episode. But uh, we could do that on Red Hat or Debian. We wouldn't care what distro we were on. We could compile the source code. The problem is, it, first off, it's a pain in the butt. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. so there's that. It's <laughs> not a lot that. of fun. Um, the second thing is software has a lot of pieces, right? There's manual pages that go in one directory. There's binaries that go in another directory. There's libraries that go in a third directory and config files that go who knows where. Maybe your home directory, maybe slash etc, things go in slash var. It, it, it's a mess, right? And if you know the software intimately, then you know where to copy those files, and that's great. But most of us don't. Most of us don't know all the little bits and pieces that go along with a piece of software. So when you download a package, the package is actually two things in one. One, it's an archive. It's a collection of all the files you need in one file. So we just download one file instead of a thousand, and that, that's convenient. And then two, it's got metadata inside of it that describes what the name of the software is, what version the software is, where all those files should go, and other security policy information that's necessary to get that software working. All of that is in there, along with this neat, magical word, dependencies. Uh -huh. right? When you download and install software, it normally depends on other libraries that it expects you to already have installed, and you may not have them installed. So it's got a dependency list in that package to help you figure out what you need. All of that stuck in one convenient file, and that's what makes a package manager so important. It used to be a nightmare to install software in Linux. It isn't anymore. Really, for the last 10 years, it's been pretty convenient. And doing it from the command line, which while that kind of sounds hard, you'll see it's actually pretty easy, too, to get that software installed and get it up and running. Now, Don, do we have to worry about things like architectures as well? Because, well, once we get into source installing, then we, we do have to take that into account, and that's been the history of Linux and when getting software installed, correct? Yeah, and, and sometimes you do have to worry about that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it kind of depends on the ve developer, right? So I mentioned that a package contains a bunch of files, right? And when you download it, that package might contain files for people with Intel CPUs, like a 32-bit, an x86 processor. Or it might contain binaries for a 64-bit CPU, like AMD 64, the Intel 64 bits. Uh, it might contain stuff for an ARM processor, right? Or it might contain all of them. They might all be rolled into one package file. It makes the package bigger, but it makes it easier on us because we don't have to worry about which one we get when we download it. Right? Let me show you an example. So uh, I'm going to use this software called Webmin. Uh, on a server, we don't normally have a GUI. Right? We just have a command line, and that's it. And working with the command line can be annoying sometimes. So uh, I'm saying that. Here we are. <laughs> yeah, command line the Linux series. Command line series. <laughs> but we can install Webmin, and it gives us a web-based user interface for being able to interact with the server and support. It's pretty convenient, right? It's not installed by default with any Linux distro, so if I want it, I've got to install it myself. And when I go to their web page, I'm just on webmin.com, I can see a couple of links over here, and they've got RPM, which is the Red Hat package manager. That's what I would use for Red Hat, Fedora, and CentOS, uh, and SUSE. And then I've got the Debian package which would be what I run for Debian, Ubuntu, and Linux Mint, and, and they're like. Uh, there's also a tar file. That's going to just be the source files. Hmm. And that's what I could use for anybody else who's not listed. I can just use that one and compile and, and go from there, right? But if I want Debian, this is the file that I want. Now, let me copy that link real quick, and I'm going to paste it up here. There, whoops, I'm going to try and paste it up there. And let's take a, a quick look at that, right? And so if you look at the URL, here's the package name right here. It's uh, webmin underscore 1.850 underscore all dot deb. All right, so what does that name mean? Packages generally follow a standard naming convention. The first part is the name of the software. So the software is called webmin. That's what its name is. Very exciting, right? So if you're downloading other software, it'll have a different name. I'm on the edge of my seat, Don. I know. <laughs> and then there's an underscore, which lets it know that there's a separation. And then 1.850. That's the version of the software. If you're running 1.71, then that's old. 1.85, that's new, right? So that tells me the version. And then another underscore, which tells me there's a separation. And then all, right? That all is telling you about the architecture. If it said x86 or i686 is, is what a lot of them are doing now, that means it's a 32-bit package. If it says x86-64, it's a 64-bit package. Or sometimes they'll say AMD 64, because technically AMD is the one who created our current 64-bit standard. You might see where it says Spark if you're running on a, a Sun or Oracle Spark station um, or Spark-based server. It might say PowerPC or PPC if it's built for well PowerPC. 
Uh, it might say all like this, which means it's got more than one architecture already baked into it. Or it could be that the software doesn't care about the architecture. If the software is just a collection of web pages, it doesn't matter what processor you have. It can be any of them. It doesn't matter. They're just web pages. And so it might say no arch, uh, N-O-A-R-C-H, which means no architecture. It doesn't care what architecture. Usually when it says all, it's got more than one build inside of it. When it says no arch, it, it just says one build, and that one build doesn't care about the architecture. And then .deb, back in the olden days, <laughs> the Debian packages actually ended in .pkg. But there's a ton of different software applications out there that use that PKG extension. So um, several years ago, they switched it to .deb. So when you see .deb, that lets you know this is a Debian package. And it's not just for Debian. We can use this for Ubuntu and, and for the other ones. So that's the package. And I can download that and get it installed using the built-in tools that are a part of Debian. And that's just one example, like Webmin. Uh, if you go and download other things, so for example, if I wanted to download um, uh, Google Chrome, right? If I go to google.com slash Chrome, and I go to download Chrome, when I go to download it, it sees that I'm running Linux, but it doesn't know beyond that what I want. And so here it's giving me a choice. Do I want to download a 64-bit Deb for Debian and Ubuntu, or do I want to download a 64-bit RPM for Fedora and OpenSUSE? even list Red Hat, that's odd, but anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's giving me the choice there based on which one I want. It's like, when I want that Red Hat stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. So when I, when I go and download software, I, I get that choice. Sometimes you get both. Sometimes you don't, right? Sometimes you really want to download a program and they only offer it in one form or another. So for example, um, uh, let's, what is it, steampowered.com. Steam is a, a video game platform, and if I want to go and install Steam, it supports Linux, right? So that, that's nice. And when I go to install it, it didn't give me a choice for whether I wanted to do an RPM or a DEB. It just did DEB. And that's because they don't distribute an RPM version of this. So if I'm on a Fedora machine, I can't really install it. But if I'm on a Debian or Ubuntu, I can. There it is. It downloaded steam underscore latest.deb, which doesn't follow the naming convention. But, but anyhow, it, it got it. And now I can go and install it. So just be aware that you'll have that choice when you go to find software. All right, Don, so now that we've found our installation or, or our software that we want to download, we hit the good old download button, like you got your webmin going on there, and it downloads to my machine. What do I do with it after that? It just double-click it? All right, well, <laughs> first off, if we're working entirely from the command line, then we, no we don't click. go to a web browser and download <laughs> well, it, right? True. We've got to be able to download and get right here on this machine. And, and I've already done that, so I've got the webmin file right there already downloaded on this machine, but let me show you how I did that. I used a utility called wget, right? wget is a web get utility, and you can point it to a URL. So you can copy a URL from a web page, right? So maybe on my desktop, I come in, I copy this link address, and then back on my, my remote server or wherever I'm on a command line, I can do wget and then just point to that file, and it'll reach right out, and it'll download that file. So there it goes, it downloads it, and now I've got that copy right here ready to work with. So you can do this entirely from the command line and not have to have that GUI web browser to, to download it. But once we've got it, there it is, and well, now I've got two. Got two. But, uh, <laughs> let me just get rid of that other one. There, so now I've got it, and I'm ready to actually get it installed. Okay. Now to get it installed, we can use a utility that's, that's built into the operating system. It's called DPKG, right? Or Debian Package Manager. This is the original package utility. And I'm going to show you, this is not the one you use every day. This is the old one. Um, but the Dell Package, or Dell, the Debian Package Utility uh, is what will let me install the software. And if you just run it, uh, you get some basic information. Or if you do dash dash help, it'll show you all the different options it has. It's got a bunch of options, right? But normally, there's really only one option we care about. We're installing. And that's right here, dash I or dash dash install. I want to install a package. So if I want to install Webmin, I can come in and just say dpkg dash i, and then I can point to that file, webmin 1.850 all.dev. And when I do that, it's going to install it. Well, not necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> I need to be an administrator to install it. I'm just logged in as a regular user right now. So I'm going to change that. I'll do a sudo of dpackage so that it runs as an administrator. And now it runs, and here it goes doing the install. All right. Now, the install is going to happen largely automatic. Right? I'm not going to have to get involved. There it goes. It did it. installed. Oh, actually, it, it didn't install, did it? Error. I got errors. All right. This is the big limitation with DPKG. 
DPKG does not do dependency tracking. And I got a bunch of dependency errors right here. Dependency problems prevent configuration of webmin. And then it's telling me, oh, I need libnet dash sslei dash Perl. I need lib authentication, lib IO, app show versions, Python. I need all this stuff and I don't have it. Okay. So in the olden days, <laughs> I would have to go to each of these websites and find each of these packages and download and install them as well. Or if I'm lucky, they might be in a repository somewhere that I can pull them all in one place. But the odds are I'd have to go to different places to find them. My favorite is when you go to get a dependency and it requires dependencies and you got to go get those dependencies. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. So that, I mean, we put up with that yeah. you know, years ago. But uh, starting, I don't know, probably around 10 years ago, it was yeah. a long time ago, we started to get better package management, better utilities. And in the Debian world, the one that took hold was a utility called apt-get. All right. apt-get uh, was basically a, a package tracker that could not just track a package, but all of its dependencies as well. So when you went to install something, it could find the application you want, find all the other stuff that it needed, and install it for you so you didn't have to worry about it. So while DPKG is still here, we can still use it, we don't normally because of the dependency mess. So instead, we're going to use utilities like apt-get. Okay. Now, I do want to mention something real quick before I get too far into apt-get. Um, apt-get is the official standard command, and it's the one most of you will use, but it's in the process of getting replaced with a, a newer, fancier version. So you'll likely have apt-get, but there's another utility called apt. All right? And apt by itself does basically the same thing. It's yeah. just an upgraded, fancier version. So a few years from now, all you'll have is apt. Right? But right now, you have apt-get and apt. Now, for this show, I'm going to use, well, I'll probably go back and forth between the <laughs> two, but um, you'll find that the command line options are the same. And so by and large, you can use them interchangeably, right? So there's not a whole lot of reason. But you'll want to start using apt, uh, if for no other reason than the fact that it has super cow powers. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we certainly got that. But uh, oh, they uh, really made their argument there. I know, <laughs> I know. So if I want to get stuff installed, though, I, I can do this. Um, before I move on to apt, though, let me just show one more thing about DPKG. I was doing dpkg-i to do the install. There's also dash r to do the remove. So that's how you'd get rid of software that you were done with and you didn't need it anymore. But like I said, by and large, we're not going to be using dpkg much because of the dependency tracking. All right, so let's take a look at what this would have been like if I used apt instead, right? Let's say that I wanted to spin up a web server. So I, I want HTTPD installed. Well, the way apt works is, and, and apt get, is they use repositories. Repositories are servers that contain tons of software. And that's one of the reasons why we can check in with that server and we can find the dependencies. It's all in one place. So I don't have to go to a vendor's website. I don't have to go to the Webmin website to find Webmin. It might be in a repository that I can search already. I can just go in and find. I can uh, you know, come in and do an apt search and look for some kind of software. I want to look for Webmin. And when I run that, it's going to look and there it is. It found it. And it actually shows it being installed already because when I did that DPKG install, it did install. It's just broken because all the dependencies are missing, right? And so if I did a DPKG-R webmin and, whoops, and removed it, let me just remove that. So there we go. So it's removed that package. Now when I run that app search webmin and it goes to look, okay, now it finds it but it's not installed. And see how it says a residual config. It sees a history of how it was there, but it's not installed. All right? We can search for just about any software. If I want to bring up a web server, I could search for HTTPD, and it's going to look in the repositories, and here it returns a number of different programs that matched what I searched for. Right? Uh, and I might find the one I wanted. There was light HTTPD right there. Uh, you know, I, I want Apache. I probably should have searched a little bit different. Um, but you know, as you poke around in here, you'll find the various things. I could also just search for Apache if that's what I want, and <laughs> we could find it that way. But you can look for this software, and you can install it all right from a repository. Right? That's pretty handy if the software you want is in the repository. If it isn't, though, then you've got to do what we did a moment ago. You go to the vendor's website. You download the package that you want. So I've downloaded Webmin 1.850, and then I could use apt to install it. If it's in a repository, I can just say uh, apt 
install and whatever the name of the program is that I, I want to add, right? So if I want to add, um, oh, I don't know, I was just going to try and pick something here right off the screen, but most of this is junk. Um, <laughs> you, you know, you do run into that. Where a lot of the stuff is not what you want. Um, I don't know, let's say that I just want the FTP client, right? So uh, if I do a sudo apt search FTP, it'll look and find, you know, tons of FTP clients. And the one I want is just called FTP. I should have repped this to cut it down a little bit more. But we can come in but, and say... Uh, Nginx. Uh, yeah, we can there install that one. Or, Probably a little less uh, return. <laughs> yeah, so we'll do a sudo apt install Nginx. And the go, it'll find it. So there it is. And notice it not only found Nginx, but it says, whoops, <laughs> if I can click in the right spot, <clears throat> these following packages will be installed. Look at all the dependencies that it found, right? libgd, libjpeg, all these other ones. Apt finds those, and apt get finds those as well. It finds them and tells me to install it. In fact, let me cancel this. I'll say no, and let me do the same thing. And this time I'm going to say apt-get, right, uh, instead of apt. And it goes, and it finds, and not only finds, but looks the same, right? They, they are, they're, they're trying to get apt at feature parity, and mm. when it's there, they'll get rid of apt-get. But uh, that hasn't happened yet. So, uh, so really getting the same results here, and I can say yes, and that's going to install, and now I've got Nginx. And look at all the work it's having to do, all the extra software that it's having to install. That's a, a good bit of work. Now, Don, with stuff that we have uh, installed, if it's in apt, if we go to apt and you type it in and it's in the repository that's uh, set up for it, that's great and everything works. But what if we did have to go to the vendor website? How do we track that software as updates and things like that come up? Right. Do we have to continue to go back? That's a challenge, right? So um, what happens here is if I, if I install a local copy, right? So I've got this local copy right here. I could say sudo apt install, and I could point it right at that file. I can try, you know, let me just dot slash webmin. There we go. I can point it right at that file, and it's going to read it. It's going to find all the dependencies, right? So even though I downloaded the file from the vendor, it's mm. using dependency tracking and finding it in the other repositories, and I can say yes, and it's going to install it, right? And instead of giving me a bunch of errors like before, this time it's actually going to go through and install it. It'll have the dependency, so it'll be able to be configured, and it'll work, right? So that's great. This, this seems perfect. We're done. This, this yeah. episode's over. Right? Well done. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs> but... What happens when Webmin 1.86 comes out or right. Webmin 2.0 comes out, right? I installed a package right from my hard drive. There's no way for app to know that new versions of that software have come out. And right? it's not actively, like, automatically looking for updates for your software, correct? Well, it, it, it does for, for the stuff that's built into the OS, gotcha. right? I, I mean, you can manually do that. I can come in and I can say sudo apt update, right? And that tells it, I want you to go and look at all your repositories and look for new versions of software, hmm. right? And so it'll reach out there and it'll look, sudo apt update or sudo apt-get update, either one. Uh, and it's going to look out, and it found for me 48 packages have updates, right? It didn't actually do the update, but it found them. Yeah. And then I can say sudo apt upgrade, upgrade, there we go. And now it's going to reach out and it's going to upgrade those 48 packages. There it goes. Nice and neat. Okay. But if an update for Webmin came out, it wouldn't update it, right? It wouldn't update it because it has no idea the update exists. So what happens here is that vendors kind of have a choice. They can make a package available just like this, where you go and you download it and you get the package and that's the end of it, right? But a lot of them, if you go into their documentation and you pull up their installation instructions and things, you can find in here where, let me see if I can, uh, whoops, let me get to the page here, where they push out installation instructions. And here it's showing basically what I did at the beginning of the show. You use yeah. wget to download it, use dpkg to install it. They did a dash dash install. I did a dash i. It's the same thing. Um, but if I keep scrolling down, oh, here they warn me about the dependencies, right? So if I wanted to install those, I should have read that before the show. It's like they knew about this beforehand. <laughs> well, the developer should. <laughs> yeah. But if I keep going down right here, using the Webmin apt repository, I can add repositories, right? All the repositories are stored in this file right here, slash etc, slash apt, slash sources dot list, okay? I'm going to copy that and go back into my terminal. And, oh, my terminal is finishing a install. Uh, let's see. Oh, Grub is updating, so let me just, yeah, I'll accept defaults on that. Um, 
So back in my terminal, if I edit that file, I'll see all the places that it's looking when it does an update. So I'm just going to do a sudo vi, and I'll edit slash etc slash apt slash sources.list. And this file is used by both apt and apt get. Uh, and so I can pull that up, and here's a list. And some of these will be enabled, some of these will be disabled, right? So as I look, there might be some sources that I'm not actually using. Uh, but the majority of these are enabled. See down here at the bottom, there's two. This archive is disabled, right? Uh, so there's a couple that are disabled. They'll have uh, hash signs or pound symbols, number signs, whatever, mm -hmm. in the beginning of the line that disables them. All these other ones are turned on, though. And I can add third-party repositories into this stuff. All I need to do is come down to the bottom of the line, and if the vendor has released a repository, I can take this line right here that they're posting for me, and I can copy that, and I can paste it right into the file. And now, whenever we check for updates, it'll look there also, and it will find those updates. Now, little problem with this. We can trust all of these repositories. They come from the original operating system vendor. So in this case, Canonical, they, they make Ubuntu. I'm on an Ubuntu server, and, uh, and so they make it. Webmin, can I trust them? Well, maybe their repository gets compromised, and they're starting to push out versions of the software that have malware attached to it, right? We need a way to verify that. And so most vendors that have a repository like this will also have security keys that you can use to verify the authenticity of the software. You always want to look for that. And so here they're giving me the instructions on how I could do that, right? And, and their instructions are a little bit weird, so we're going to just grab this line. Uh, so that I can come in here and download that key. Uh, whoops, they already put the wget in for me. So I'm going to download that key, and then you need to be a root user to add keys. So that's what this next line is. I'll sudo it. They don't they don't sudo it in their example, but uh, you need to. Uh, and I'll do app dash key add, and I'm going to add the key for that developer. And now whenever I d download software from that developer, I can use that key to verify whether it's been tampered with and make sure it's safe. But now whenever I do a sudo apt update, it's not just looking at Canonical's repositories anymore or the Debian repositories. Now it's also looking at the Webmin repositories and making sure that I've got the latest version. So right there I can see uh, that it's hitting like line 6, 7, and 8 were all Webmin repositories, right? Line 5 there was an ignore, so apparently there's one that's uh, disabled. But the other three it checked, and now when an update for Webmin comes out, I'll be able to get it and... It's just part of my routine update process. I don't have to do anything special to update Webmin. It's just there, and it's done. Now, Don, uh, one of our uh, chat room members there is asking Stanley. He's piping in yet again. Well, great stuff, as always. Do we want to go with these suggested packages that they give to you? Uh, sometimes. sometimes. You know, <laughs> uh, it, it depends. Um, when you install software, a lot of times there will be suggested packages that come along with it that you may not need. Now, on a workstation... I'll usually install them just so it doesn't annoy me, right? But <laughs> on a server, we're usually trying to maintain the minimal footprint possible. And so when you get a suggested package, sometimes that's not necessarily what you want. Um, for example, let's say that I'm, I'm on a server, and well, let's see if this one will do it. I, I don't know if it will or not. Um, this is actually an Ubuntu server that's hosted in Amazon Web Services, and so they have a special deployment of Ubuntu. It's a little bit different, so I'm not sure if it'll do it. But sometimes you'll see where you run a command, and it can't find the command, and it says, oh, you know, if you want it, here's a quick way you can install it and, and have it. I could do a sudo apt install mc, right? And midnight commander's not installed. Here's how I can install it real quick. Now, that's kind of a suggestion. Or when you install another software, it might have all the packages it needs and then have additional ones that it suggests. In those scenarios, if you choose to install them, it, it doesn't necessarily hurt you or hurt the application, but it increases your security footprint. If I'm trying to maintain a secure server and I see that Midnight Commander is not installed, that's not a message to me saying I need to install Midnight Commander. It's a message to me saying, oh, I just need to, to, to find a different way to do this. I, I wanted to copy some files, so I'll use CP because I know that's built in. Yeah. I don't need Midnight <laughs> Commander for that. Uh, I run into that with editors a lot where you run Nano and oh, it's installed, but, uh, <laughs> but it's not installed. I'm like, all right, well, fine. I'll, I'll use Vi or Vim or, or whatever, right? Um, you try not to install things or install extra things. And what you'll find is that uh, when you're installing software, like with apt-get, if I do a, a man for apt-get, it's got a ton of options, and you can tell it not to pull dependencies. You can tell it not to pull suggested packages. You can, you can really configure it and get advanced with it. 
usually, you know, you, you just want to install the minimum amount to get things working on a server. On a workstation, you can go a little bit further. Uh, and you know, it's, it's also worth mentioning, I, I'm doing apt-get here, right? Yeah. And, or, or apt. There are other utilities out there that may be available. For example, uh, aptitude. Let me see if I've got it here. Uh, nope. But, but I can install it. <laughs> With apt-get. <laughs> yeah, let me, let me install it real quick because I just kind of want to show it to you. I, I don't use aptitude myself, but I know that it is available and some people like it. I, I um, do. I, I've used it. And it's, it's pretty convenient, especially for like searching through things and, and looking for stuff. I like it. Yeah, you know, when you're working with the command line, you've got to remember the commands. But there's sometimes, I'm going to call them pseudo, G, pseudo GUI utilities or whatever. They're, they're As not, in PSE. <laughs> yeah, pseudo. you know, they're not, they're not really a, a graphical user interface, but it's kind of close. Aptitude is like that. If I pull up aptitude, here we go, we get kind of a navigable menu, right. and I can come in and say, you know, let me look at my installed packages, or let me look at not installed packages, virtual packages. I'll go into not installed, right? Uh, and then it gives me categories. I, I want to find, uh, I don't know, uh, HTTP, right? I want web servers, right? And the number of packages gets smaller and smaller. There were like right. 50,000 packages a second ago. There's only 44 in the web server category. And I can go in there, and there's only five in the main fully supported category. Meanwhile, there's 39 in universe, which is everything. <laughs> I'm going to go in main, and now I can find, oh, here's Apache if I want to install that. And, and that's it. Oh. Yeah, I figured light HTTPD would be in there, but no. So, uh, so I can find that, though, and if I want to install a pa a Apache, here it is. I can choose that package, and we can go in and choose to install it. Uh, you'll see right now it's not installed, uh, but I can install it if I want. It's showing me the dependencies, the information about the package. I can read about it, and then I can choose to install it or update it or, or whatever if that's what I want. Uh, up at the top, it's giving me the menu kind of commands, right? I can push G to preview, download, install, or remove packages. So if I hit G, uh, oh, I haven't tagged this one yet, so I, I would need to tag it. You've got to do a control T, and then you come in, you know, and it's got this whole kind of menu system that you can use to be able to work with that. So uh, I'm, I'm a little awkward in this one because I don't use it much. Hey, Minesweeper? All right. <laughs> Uh, John know, is playing Minesweeper. <laughs> my first pick I lost. I had no idea it was in here. So, That's great. But what, hey, this is a great example of increasing your security footprint. That's right. right. I wanted to install an easy package manager on a server, and I got Minesweeper, <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's not something we want. So that's why we have to be careful about what we install on a server. But otherwise, uh, I guess now the real question is how we get out of this thing. Uh, Q, Q, Q enough, yeah, and you'll get out. Right. There we go. Um, Aptitude is one example. If you've got a GUI, there's the whole software store that you use on there that's designed to be simple but designed for workstations, not for servers. So uh, so don't don't feel like you've only got one choice. Uh, the graphical one is actually called Synaptic, uh, is the, the GUI-based one. Aptitude is command line. There's Deselect is another one that's command line. I know some people like it. I just stick with what's built in because minimal footprint. That's what I normally think, right? So apt-get or just apt by itself. Uh, those are available. And there's also another utility called app-cache, which is a kind of handy one. Uh, with app-get, you could search for packages. With the newer app, you're supposed to search with app-cache because uh, you, you cache this list of packages and you can search locally so it's faster and, and more robust. So there's new tools like that that are coming out all the time. But as far as getting software installed, that's really all there is to it. If it's already in a repo, then you're just doing app, install, and the name of the software. If it's not on the repo, you can download the package and install it individually. Or if that developer has a repo, hopefully they do, mm -hmm. you can add it to the list. And now anytime you do updates, that'll update as well. Installing from a repository is always the best if you have the choice. Excellent stuff, Don, because when it comes to software, installation has been one of the more difficult things for the uh, new Linux user. So being able to easily download, install software onto their system is really going to help a lot of people that are new to the Linux game. And I think you did a great job of showing us how we can actually do that without making it so convoluted that it <laughs> makes you maybe just run for the nearest window system. <laughs> so anything else you'd like to add to this show before we close it down? That's really about it. Um, there are a few other package managers that are always on the horizon. I encourage you not to jump to the latest mm. shiny package manager that comes along because a lot of them do have dependency tracking issues. Uh, they get better and more robust over time. If your package manager makes a mistake, it can break software and it can be very difficult to fix it. So I encourage you to stick with the tried and true ones. Like the, all the ones I mentioned on the show today, those are all very stable, mature ones that are available and, and welcome to be used. But if you hear about some you know, new shiny one on the internet, and you're like, oh, maybe I'll try that one instead, just be really careful. Don't do that on production systems. 
packages aren't something you want to, to mess up. All right. Well, there you go, everyone. Now you know how to run out and install uh, uh, software on your Debian-based systems. If you're running a boots or anything like that, Linux Mint, you can, with confidence, get some software installed. That Minesweeper is calling your name. I know that's for a fact. <laughs> Don, thanks for joining us today, and we do thank our audience for watching. But it looks like it's that time again for us to call the day. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizet. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. We're coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings everyone and welcome back to another exciting episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode we're back with more in our Linux command line series and joining us in the studio. You know him as Don Pizzette, but he's our good friend, mentor in this endeavor. How, how's it going today, Don? <laughs> Glad to have you again, sir. Well, I'm ready to dive right back into the world of Linux command line, and in this episode we're going to be taking a look at installing software on Red Hat based systems or RPM based systems. So we'll see some of the utilities we can use to install it, what's involved with that process, and some of the kind of uh, best practices as far as how we get that software in there and ultimately get it out if we need to, uh, all right here in this episode. So we took a look at the Debian packages uh, in our previous episode. This is kind of like the same thing, right? It, it allows you to be able to install software as a package instead of having to run around finding everything. How is, how is it different, should I say, is, is what I'm trying to get to. All right. Well, in, in the last episode, we talked about those Debian packages, and I said how the, the advantage of a package is that when you download software, it's usually got more than one component, right? right? So you've got binaries and man pages and libraries and all this stuff. And if you had to install it manually, you'd have to know where all that stuff went. You'd have to copy the right files to the right locations, and if you get even one wrong, the whole thing breaks. It's, it's a bit of a nightmare, right? So the purpose of a package file is to contain not just the files that we need, but information about what to do with the files, where to put them, what, where does the man page go, where do the libraries go, what permissions need to be set for these things to execute right. That's called metadata. And the metadata that's part of that package has it. It's basically an instruction sheet hmm. that says, here's what to do to do the install. Well, in the Debian episode, we did the .deb packages, which were developed for Debian. Um, and, and those are effective, but they store their metadata a certain way. In the Red Hat world, we use RPM. RPM is the Red Hat Package Manager. And RPM packages have the same files in them, the same libraries, same binaries. But the metadata is stored in a different format. And so they're not compatible with each other. There's actually two things that break compatibility. One is the metadata format, which by and large is just XML, but they use different names for things for whatever reasons, right? The other thing is that um, in the Red Hat world, they use CPIO compression which is different than in the Debian world where they just use gzip. So it's two different compression types, too. Uh, and, and your software has to expect that to know to work within the, that environment. So Red Hat packages are just fundamentally different. But inside of them, it technically is the same data as far as that application, which is a different instruction set. So when we go and download one of these packages and install with it, we get all the benefits we did from the Debian world. We get all the files we need. We get the information on where they go. And we get information on their associated dependencies. So if there's other pieces of software we need to make our single piece work, then it'll have the instructions for that and, and, and what is missing. Now, whether or not we're able to act on that information depends on the tool that we use. And I want to start us off with the original tool, and then we'll move into some of the more advanced stuff as the episode goes on and show you kind of what we're, what we're really going to use out there in the real world. Now, Don, in the uh, other episode, we also talked about the packages themselves, and they had a, a very specific naming convention that they used to kind of give us information about it. Do we see that? With RPMs as well? Yeah, yeah. In fact, it's almost the same. I, in the last episode, we used Webmin as the example, right? So mm -hmm. I've got the Webmin page pulled up here, and we went to the Debian package. But if I look right above it, I've got RPM, the Red Hat Package Manager. And let me clarify real quick. It's, it's Red Hat, right? Red Hat Enterprise Linux. But there's many other distros that use it. There's Fedora, which is really a Red Hat project. There's CentOS, which is built off of Red Hat. And there's SUSE Linux, which also uses the RPM format. So it's not just Red Hat that uses this. There's actually several different distros that do it. So when I take a look at that link, though, I'll just copy that link. And let me paste it up here. Uh, if we take a look at that package that I'm about to download, the name is 
actually very similar to what we just saw in the last episode for Debian. We get the name of the package. It's called Webmin. And then after that, we get the version, 1.850. Now, unlike a Debian package, instead of using underscores for separations, here we use just a hyphen. It's slightly different, right? And then we've got dot no arch, right? No architecture. That's telling me the hardware architecture this package is built for. And right now, this one is built for any architecture, 32-bit, 64-bit, it doesn't care. So it says no arch. And then dot RPM, that's what the package files end in. And I pulled up in the background here, this is a CentOS repository. And so it's got tons and tons of, of uh, packages in here. And if you look at them, they all have that same basic name. The name of the software, followed by the version number, followed by the architecture. And if you look at the architectures here, I've got x86 underscore 64. Those would be the 64-bit versions. Or i686, which are the 32-bit. Sometimes you'll see x86 also uh, for 32-bit. You might see Spark or PPC hmm. or ARM, right, if you're in different areas. Uh, I'm actually browsing this repo, and I'm in the – actually, hang on, my, my zoom is a little too crazy on this one. Um, if you look at the folder that I'm in, I'm, I'm actually in the 64-bit folder, and, and so that's why I'm only seeing 64-bit packages. But if I were to navigate a little higher, you'd be able to see all the different hardware architectures that are supported. Now, some distros are starting to go 64-bit only, and so you might only see a 64-bit version. Others, like in Gentoo and Arch Linux, you might see a ton of different mm -hmm. hardware architectures that are supported, and the packages get divided up in that. But the name of the architecture will be included in the package file name so that you can make sure that you got the right one. That is kind of an important thing to install the right package. All right, so let's say that I wanted to... Uh, use one of these packages, right? I would just download it. And if it's coming right from the vendor, then I would go to their website, I'd click on that link, and I'd download it, and then I'd be ready to get it installed. Now, if we've got a GUI like this, great, we can just click on the link and go. But if we're trying to do this from the command line, what we need to do is get the link for that file, and then we can use a command line utility called wget to actually go and download that and have it available to do the install. So, for example, let me switch over to a Red Hat server, and uh, let's see, do a switch here. And so I'm going to jump over to a Red Hat server, and once I'm in on that Red Hat server, if I want to get that software, I can do wget followed by the URL that points to that package. And when I run it, it's going to reach out, and it's going to download it, and now I've got that local copy that I can go in and install in get set up for my system, right? So I don't need a GUI to get these packages. If I know the URL, if I have a link, I can pull them right from the command line using wget. Now, Don, once we've wgetted our file, it's downloaded, we verify that the package is there. Uh, I guess the next phase would be to actually install the thing. How do I tell Red Hat, install this package? All right. At its most basic, the original tool for this was RPM, which is the Red Hat Package Manager. And RPM would just let me give it an RPM file and, and actually get it installed. Now, like most utilities, RPM has a bunch of command line operators that it can use that change its behavior, right? That's but an understatement. Yeah, <laughs> there's a bunch. But there's a few that we really care about. Dash I is the most important. We want to install, right? And usually we're installing software with this, and that's what we want. There's a few others that can be useful, though, like um, uh, U is upgrade. Let's find that one in here, right here. Dash U is upgrade. If the package is already installed, and I'm installing an upgraded version of it, then I can do a dash U. Um, if the current version matches the version that I'm about to install, then it does nothing. It, if, it, if I do dash I, it'll reinstall even though I already had it, right? So that's kind of a little difference in behavior there between dash I and dash U. Uh, there's also V and H, which give us a, a bit more of a user-friendly screen. Most systems default to having V and H turned on already. H means give me human readable file sizes, and V means give me a little status bar as it installs. It scrolls across the screen. Um, again, most systems do those by default. So if I want to install a package, really dash I is the only one I truly need to remember. So if I look at my files here, and I, I already had a copy, so I ended up downloading a second copy. There we go. So if I want to install Webmin, I can just say RPM dash I, because I want to install, and then I can point to that RPM file, and that'll start the install. Now, in order to install software, you need to be an administrator. So when I go to do the install, this is not going to work for me. Well, actually, I didn't even get that far, right? It didn't try the install because it's telling me, oh, 
I looked inside of this file and it's got some dependencies. It needs Perl installed. It needs net SSL EAY, the SSL driver for it. It needs uh, some other kind of Perl extensions that I don't know what they are. So I don't have Perl installed, so this whole thing's not going to work. It's not going to let me install. RPM can read the metadata inside of the package to find the dependencies that we need, but it can't really do anything about it. So it kind of runs up to the same wall that uh, installing from source does, really. You have yeah. to know all those dependencies, and then if you're missing any, you got to go out, find them, and install them so that you can get your RPM to install. Yeah, and, and that's one of the big challenges that we have with RPM is that it doesn't, it, it does dependency tracking sort of, <laughs> yeah. but it can't resolve the issues for us. Hey, you got a real issue there. Uh, good luck with that, right? <laughs> yeah. And it also is not great about doing updates, right? So mm -hmm. if I install Webmin version 1.850 and a new version comes out, 1.9 comes yeah. out, RPM doesn't automatically upgrade anything. I would have to go and download the new file and then install it with the dash U option to do the upgrade and get it put in place. So RPM is not terribly flexible. And as a result, most of us don't use it. Most of us mm. don't use the RPM utility. Instead, we use one of the modern package managers. Now, in the Red Hat world, there's actually two uh, kind of coexisting package managers right now. There's YUM, Y-U-M, which is the, the current main one that's supported everywhere. And then there's DNF, which is the new one. Uh, YUM stands for the Yellow Dog Update Manager. Yellow Dog Linux is a, a version of Linux that I, I don't know if it exists anymore, but it was a, a fork of Red Hat, or really of CentOS, that was designed to run on a Mac, uh, on Mac laptops and, and so on, and it was called Yellow Dog Linux. And they created this package manager that was really cool, that would track and resolve dependencies. And it caught on and did so well that it got incorporated into the actual Red Hat upstream server, and so now it's a part of every Red Hat distro that's out there. Uh, Red Hat, CentOS, Fedora, uh, and, and several others. And we're all forever grateful. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. It, it really is. So, so Yum is, is everywhere, right? Yum has a little bit of a problem, though, in that sometimes its database can get really cluttered and it has a hard time tracking dependencies. Hmm. So DNF is a replacement for it. Now, DNF is not in Red Hat Linux, and DNF is not in CentOS, but it is in Fedora. And Fedora is like the testing ground. So in the future... DNF will make it into the other products and it'll be everywhere. But for right now, if you want to know a command, a command that works everywhere, it'll be yum. Yum works everywhere. And the commands are really the same between yum and DNF. I can swap them out. But if I wanted to install the same package, I could say yum install and then point to that webmin file to do the install. Or if I had DNF, it would be DNF install, right? So you just change it for the right tag. So I'll say yum install and point to that webmin file. Now it's going to look at it, and it's going to find that it's got missing dependencies. Okay, the difference here is, oh, actually, right here. Um, the difference here is it's okay with the missing dependencies, and then it tries to actually do the install, but it's got a number of problems here because I'm not root. I don't have permissions. Okay, so let's change this command a little bit more. I'm going to add sudo to the beginning of it so that I run it as an administrator. And now it's going to look at it, it's going to find those missing dependencies, and it's going to say, can I get those from somewhere? And Yum maintains a list of repositories, servers that are out there on the Internet that it can go to to find the dependencies. And while I'm trying to install just one little package, it found 29 other dependent packages that I had to have, right? RPM didn't find 29. RPM found like five. But those also had dependencies, and so it grows, and it gets bigger and bigger. So here's Webmin that I want to install. Whoops. And then right after that are the 29 dependencies, which look to be mostly Perl-based, that it needs to get installed in order to support Webmin. That's one of the big shining features of Yum, is that it handles all the dependency mess for me. And so I can say yes to that, and now it's going to get in there and install it and have it up and running on my system, including all the dependencies. Well, okay, Don. Well, once we do have this installed, sometimes I've done this where I've installed something, or it might come with the system, now I can fire it up and, and just see, is it installed? Yeah, because I can type in the command and it works. Sometimes I need a little more information about it. Can we do that as well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's say that I, I want a utility like, um, uh, I think in the last show I used Midnight Commander as yeah. an example, right? So I want Midnight Commander. So I come in here and I run MC. Not found. It's not installed. Uh, not there. All right. Well, I could go find the Midnight Commander website, 
and I could download the RPM from them and, and install it if they even have one, right? But it might be built in, like Daniel said, it might be part of one of the, the Red Hat or CentOS or Fedora libraries or uh, repositories, and I can just pull it from there. You can do a yum list, right? Yum list can look for a package and find it for you. So I'm going to look for MC. And so it's going to look and reach out there and, oh, shoot, I forgot to sudo that one. So let me bump up my privileges. And now it's going to go out there and it's going to look, and there it is. There it it is. found the package. It found mc.x86 underscore 64. Now, that's good if you know the name of the package. I knew the package was called MC. Right. But what if I didn't know that? What if I, I knew it's called Midnight Commander, right? If I do a yum list midnight, well, it doesn't find anything, right? You can actually do a yum search. And yum search searches not just the file name, but the description as well. And now when I search by midnight, it finds MC, right there, user-friendly text console file manager and visual shell. That's Midnight Commander, right? I mean, it found some other stuff too, like GPM. I'm not quite sure why GPM turned up, but it did. Uh, and then Perl, some kind of local time, I guess maybe midnight is a keyword inside of a yeah. time. That, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, not quite sure how GPM does, but, but anyhow. So, uh, uh, so it finds that and it returns it. That's another handy way to find these packages to see if they are built in. Because if they are, then I can just do a sudo yum install mc. I don't even have to go and download the package. It's already a part of one of the server's repositories. It finds it and installs. Oh, there it is. It looks like a, a GPM is a dependency uh, oh. for mc. So that, that's why it turned up. And so there it is. It shows how that search command searches a lot more than just a file name. It's a really powerful way to find what's already installed. All right, Don. Well, let's say we throw Midnight Commander on our system. We're like, yeah, this is all right, I guess. But I don't really see myself using it. Now it's just taking up space. What if I want to get that off of the system? Then you just do a sudo yum erase, and we can erase that and get it right out of there. Um, now, this is one of the commands that actually deviates. I know I said with DNF, everything was the same, mm -hmm. right? So yum install, DNF install, yum list, DNF list. Well, this one's a little different because it's yum erase, and it's DNF remove. So uh, I don't know why they changed that, but they did. Uh, so if I want to get rid of Midnight Commander, I can do that. And, and you can actually do more than one package at the same time. So if I wanted to get rid of Midnight Commander and Webmin, you just do a space in each package name. Same thing with install. I could install more than one package at the same time by doing that. So there it's going to remove Midnight Commander and Webmin, get them both out of there. I'll say yes. And now they're getting removed and taken off of the system. And there they go. So they're erased, they're verified they're gone, and now the software is gone. All right. Now here, here's one of the problems that you'll run into when you're installing software. From time to time, this happens, right? You run over here, you go, yum, oh, yes, I'm going to install X software. Yum, install X software, and not found, right? Okay, well, let's, let's do the list. Let's do the searching options that Don has shown us, and we're not finding anything. All right, let me go to their website. Well, there it is, but I want to I pull it. I want to be able to use yum without having to just yeah. download and go from the website. How can we fix that, if, if possible? All right, we, we can certainly download from the website, right? That's what yeah. I did at the beginning of the show. The negative there is, well, one, you got to do it, right? you got to yeah. go and download the file. Uh, but the other negative is upgrades. When an upgrade comes out, we don't know about it, right? When you run yum, so if I come in here and I say sudo yum update, it will look for every installed package and see if there's a new version. Now, it found 29 packages on my servers that, that all have updates, but webmin won't be one of them because it doesn't have a way to check mm. and see if Webmin has an update, because I just installed it from an RPM file that I downloaded. And that RPM file sitting in my hard drive is still the same as it was before, so it, it has no idea that a new version is out. So that's one of the challenges we have with going out and downloading software. While we can do it, it's not necessarily the greatest way because of the maintenance. Anytime a new version comes out, I've got to go and manually do that update. So when you download the software, don't just jump right in and download the package. Do a little reading on the site. Because a lot of times what you'll find, like with Webmin, if I go into the documentation, they've got the instructions for installing RPM, but they've also got instructions for using the Webmin YUM repository. They actually have a repo set up, and I can point to that. And now whenever I run YUM update, it'll look at all the normal repositories, and it'll look at Webmin's repository. It will find new versions of the software and install them. Now, yum tracks all of its repositories in slash etc slash yum.repos.d. DNF does the exact same thing. It actually uses slash etc slash yum, even though it's the, the DNF command. And that's because they're, they're trying to be backwards compatible, right? So if I go and take a look at that folder, this is almost done. 
If I go and take a look at that folder, I'll find existing repos that are already sitting there that are what Yum has been using this whole episode, right? And if you installed Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it'll be their repos. If you installed CentOS, it'll be theirs or Fedora. You know, they've each got their own set of repos that they, they key off of. But if we want to install third-party software, they can give us additional repos. And here's the, the text that I need to use Webmin's repo, right? So they're telling me that I can look at download.webmin.com slash download slash yum, and in there I'll find a mirror list with the, the packages that I need and the information that I want to be able to look for updates and go in and install it. So I want to add that. I'm just having to wait for this to finish. It's doing some kind of cleanup. While I'm waiting on that, though, let me explain a, a, another concept that goes along with this. I can trust the CentOS repos, or I can trust the Red Hat repos, because I know they maintain them. But what about Webmin? Do I trust their repo? Maybe, right? But it is possible. There have been a, a couple of cases of this where they get attacked, and their files get modified, and malware gets tagged onto them. And now I'm downloading malware onto my system. That's bad, because when we run Yum, we run it as a root user. Yeah, the CC it. cleaner or the C cleaner or whatever. That, that was a big one. Yep. Yeah, that just happened, and it's filled with malware. Yep. The transmission BitTorrent client, it happened yep. to them, too. So when developers post their own repo, always look to see if they post security keys. They usually post keys so that you can verify the authenticity of the file. And sure enough, I've got that right here. If I just look down... They've got the command to download their security key and then to install it. And notice when they install it, they're using the RPM utility, right? Security keys don't dynamically update. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want to use yum. You just use RPM, and it installs that key, and now we'll trust the software that comes to that vendor. That's really important, all right? So if I go back to my server, there we go. I can go into slash etc slash yum.repos.d, and I can take a look in there, and I'll see some repos, right? I've got the, the Red Hat repository or the uh, RHUI, uh, that's their uh, utilities. I, I've got a few other things that are in here that are all part of the official repositories. And what I can do is create another text file in here. I'll do sudo vi, because you have to be an administrator right to this folder, and I'm going to create a file called webmin.repo. Right. You can call it whatever you want, call it mob, but uh, it does need to end in .repo so that it knows what you're doing. And then in that file, I'm just going to paste the text right from their website. Right? It's got all the information for that repository right there, and more importantly, it's got enabled equals one. If I change that to enabled equals zero, then it knows about the repository, but it doesn't look at it. Right? So we can turn them on and off as we need. So I'm going to set that, and I'll save that file. And now we've got a repository that we can look at. Right? If I do a um, sudo yum list webmin, before webmin wasn't a part of the official repository, so it wouldn't find it. But now it has this other repository to look at. And it can look, and sure enough, it found it right there in the Webmin repository. Here's webmin.noarc, right? So I can get it installed. But that developer uses security keys. So if I try and install it, if I do a sudo yum install webmin, all right, it's going to look at the repositories. It's going to find it. There it is from the Webmin repository. I'll say yes to install it, and it's going to go to install it. It's going to download it, and it's going to fail because of the security keys. I don't have a way to verify that that file hasn't been tampered with. So I need to go back here and get the key installed. Okay, So I'll, I'll copy that text, and I'm going to paste it in. The first command, that wget, just downloads the key file. It's an ASCII text key file. The second command, the RPM command, is going to install it. And I need to sudo that. They didn't do that in their notes, but I, I need to do that because you have to be an administrator to add the keys. You don't log in as root, Don? <laughs> I not to. <laughs> but once I've got that done, now I've got the key, and now I can go and try and install it again, and now it'll be able to verify that the file hasn't been tampered with, right? So as it looks, it finds it, it downloads it, it's going to install it, and it'll verify that key. And if it's the very first time I've done this, it might ask me whether I accept the fingerprint of the key to make sure the key is valid. Mm -hmm. I know the key is valid because I just downloaded it right from the vendor. But in theory, an attacker could compromise the key on the site. Uh, in my case, it was okay with it. And uh, it says that it's up and installed. It says I, I can use it, right? I, I guess I could test and find out. Let me uh, try and browse the server. Uh, it uses a secure page. And... 10,000, and I'll browse. It's using a self-signed certificate, so I'll just clear past that. And there hey. it is. I've got the webmin login, so I know the package is up and running. 
And even better, because I installed it with yum, now anytime I want, I can do a sudo yum update, and it'll look for updates for all of my operating system files, as well as updates for webmin. And so if a webmin update comes out, it will find it, apply the update, and now we don't have to go back to the vendor website again. Everything is nice and automated. So important part of how we use Yum. That's a little slice of heaven on earth right there. I hate having to jump around from website to website, having to look, oh, well, this, they have an update ready for me. And now I've got to download it, install it, and go through that. Let just the package manager do all the heavy lifting for me. That's my kind of adminning right there. Now, Don, uh, from time to time, uh, I don't use a lot of uh, Red Hat-based systems. Every now and then I have a CentOS uh, box that I'll jump on. And I've noticed that... Every now and then I've got to do something with Apple. But, uh, I know we've got a little bit of yep. time. I don't know. Sure. I just don't, I don't understand that. What is that? Yeah, so um, CentOS and Red Hat, uh, they focus on stability, not necessarily the latest and greatest features. And so a lot of times when you go and download a package, it might depend on a, a particular version of a library that Red Hat or CentOS just don't have. Ah. So you know, maybe I have some software and it needs glibc 1.7. But in the official Red Hat repository, the official CentOS repository, it's just glibc 1.6. What do you do then? You can't meet the dependency. You right. can't install the software. And that's because it's not officially supported by Red Hat or, or CentOS yet. Fedora, on the other hand, Fedora is the testing bed for Red Hat. And they'll have 1.7, maybe 1.8. <laughs> they, they, they always have the latest and greatest is what's found in Fedora. So what they did is they created a special repository called EPEL. And it's the, the EPEL repository, and it has the Fedora packages that can be installed on Red Hat Enterprise oh. Linux or CentOS. So you can get newer versions of stuff than, than what would normally be available. Now, it's not officially supported. So anything you install with EPEL could potentially break your system. On a workstation, that's not a big deal. On a server, it's not a good idea. All right, But you'll find a lot of people reference that. And, uh, and if you just do like a... a quick Google search for ePEL repo, you'll find it. Um, so here's uh, the Fedora project wiki for it. And they tell you all about ePEL and what it is. If you're using Fedora, you've likely already got it. If you're on CentOS, you can install it pretty easy. On Red Hat, it's actually not so easy to install. <laughs> on, uh, on CentOS, all you would do is say uh, yum, it's a sudo, yum install ePEL-release. That command right there. All right, And on CentOS, they actually have an ePEL repo package in the normal repo, right? But you choose to install it. And when you run that, it gets it installed. But in Red Hat, they don't support that. And so they don't have the ePEL library available. But if you go to the ePEL website, you'll find where they've got the instructions and, and where you can you know, browse their packages and, and get it installed and set up. There's a link in here somewhere that says, like, how do I use it? Uh, not how do I contribute? But I hear, how can I use these packages? Uh, and they give a link to pull it. So I, I'm running Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, or at least I think I am. Let's, let's find out. I'll do a host, host name. Darn it. No, you won't. <laughs> host name CTL. There we go. Uh, so I am running Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7.4. So on the ePEL website, I can come in and find the newest version of ePEL release for EL7, right? That, that's what I want. Um, and you can just copy that link. And then back on your server, you can say sudo yum install and paste that in. And it's going to reach out and grab that ePEL release package. Yeah, right? missing a and character there. Did I spell it wrong? There's a oh. space between. Uh, space. There we go. Uh, so it'll install it. And what it's really doing is not installing software, just adding that file. If I go into slash etc slash yum dot repos dot d and look, you'll see where it's added ePEL dot repo an epel-testing.repo, and that, boy, that one's dangerous, let me tell you, this stuff is not quite safe. Um, and, and if I look at that file, right, if I, um, if I pull up the epel testing one, see how it's got enabled equals zero? It's not turned on. So I don't have to worry about it. I can turn it on if I want it, but it's turned off by default. Versus if I just look at epel.repo, that one is, oh, actually, that one's not turned on either by default. I'll have to turn, oh, wait, that's no, epel source. Where is actual... Up here. here we go. The full on EPEL, that one right there, enabled equals one. Yeah. And so now there might be some software that I want that's not in the normal repo, and now I can go in and find it. So, like the, the Gwake terminal that I use, um, I don't think that's in the normal repo, but now if I come in and I do a yum list Gwake, actually I have to sudo that, uh, it'll go out and it'll look. 
and it's looking not just in the regular repositories, but it's also looking in ePEL. So there's Gwake, and if I look way over here on the right, it found it in the ePEL repository. Red Hat doesn't officially support Gwake. Mm -hmm. Works fine, though, and <laughs> yeah. I can get it from ePEL. So you'll see people talk about that. That's a third-party repository, and if you trust them, great, but... Uh, you know, some some of them are pretty dodgy that are out there. I know a lot of people like RPM Forge, and I don't trust them one single bit. Uh, but you know, there, there's various repositories out there that you may trust or not. And you can set up your own repo too. You know, maybe maybe you have your own in-house developed software. You can create your own repository and point your servers to it, and you can distribute your own software that way. Or limited versions of public software that you do trust. Maybe I don't want the whole EPEL. I just want a couple of packages from it. So I could maintain my own repository to have that. There's a lot of power that you can get when you mess with repositories. Well, Don, this is super cool stuff. Being able to manage our software on our systems is a very important thing, obviously, because if we can't get tools installed to do work that we need to get done, well, then we're going to have a bad day at work, that's for sure. And someone's going to be looking for somebody that does know how to get that happening. <laughs> uh, Don, I think you've done a masterful job of showing us how we can use Yum and RPM and uh, working with the repositories inside of Red Hat-based systems. Very, very cool stuff, and uh, even learned a few things myself today. Very, very cool. Don, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate it for you showing up today. I also appreciate our audience for watching. I know we thoroughly appreciate our audience every day, <laughs> as you guys are what make the magic happen here. But it does look like we are out of time for this episode. Don't worry, though. We have plenty of other shows going on. If not this one, I don't know if we're continuing on. <laughs> but uh, signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pazet. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pazetta. I'm coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back with more in our Linux command line series. And, of course, joining us in the studio, it would be like a day without sunshine if we didn't have our good friend, Mr. Don Bissett, joining us today again. Don, how's it going, man? It is going just well, and we're diving right back into the Linux command line. In this episode, we're going to be taking a look at how to install an application from source code, right? Basically, building <laughs> yeah. an app... Uh, I like to say building it from scratch, but you're not really building it from scratch. <laughs> Somebody else has already made the thing. Yeah, we're right? going to program the entire <laughs> thing. We, no. we just need to make it work, yeah. right? So in this episode, that's what we're going to do. No, no package managers, no automated installers. We're going to get source code, turn it into a working application, get it up and running. And we're going to do it all right here in this episode. All right. Well, it sounds like a lot of fun, Don, but if anybody has worked with Linux for any length of time, when someone starts talking about installing from source, you probably get a couple of, of kickbacks. A, why don't you just use one of the package management systems? <laughs> they seem to work quite well, and that's the de facto and default way to do things. So, Don, what, what would be the advantage? Why would we want to do it this way, especially since most people find this to be kind of difficult? Yeah, you know, as a routine matter, of course, I generally don't like to install from source if I can avoid it. Uh, so if there is a package, if there is a, an RPM or a DEB or, or whatever that's available for me to download, that software is already built, and it makes it a heck of a lot easier to get it installed. And so that's the... the better way to do it in most cases. But there are times where we don't really have a choice. That, that choice is taken away from us. Or there's times where we might actually have a legitimate reason for wanting to build from source, right? So, so let me run through a couple of reasons, right? Um, one, there might not be packages available. There might be some software that I want to install, but there's no RPM, there's no dev, there's no pre-built package available. All there is is source code. So if I want to run it, I don't have a choice. I've got to build it from source. That, that's one reason. Another reason is, maybe it's really sensitive software and you don't trust the people that built it, right? Uh, and that, that's not, not a, a bad thing, right? We should, <laughs> yeah. we should trust no one, right? Was it the, the Xbox? So <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> we, we, we might be like that. If you're in a high security environment, you might require code review of an application. I've got to review the code. Well, even if I review the code, if I'm using a pre-compiled binary, who's to say it was built from the same code that I reviewed, right? So if you want to be absolutely certain you download the source code, you review it, you look for backdoors or other security weaknesses. When you're confident everything's fine, you can then compile the software yourself from that source code, and now you know that it, it's safe, that it works the way you want it. So that's another reason why you might do it. But both of those are, are not necessarily the greatest reasons. Um, well, I mean, if you're 
yeah. in the security world. That, that one's pretty good. But um, uh, one of the reasons for me where I will sometimes build software from source is because sometimes it can be optimized for your hardware architecture. When a developer makes a package, that package file has to cater to like the, the lowest common denominator, right? So when, when they pre-compile a binary, they don't know if you're going to be running it on a system with an Intel processor or an AMD processor. They don't know if you're going to be on a, uh, an Intel Xeon with 30 megs of L2 cache or 32, whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or if you're running on, a, on an old Athlon with only one meg of L2 cache, they, they don't know what hardware you're going to run. So they create a generic binary that will run on as many hardware architectures as possible or within usually a single architecture. Now, if we want to really take advantage of the bells and whistles in our processor, if we're, we're doing like video encoding, right, our processor might have accelerators in there or, or with encryption. A lot of processors have AES acceleration built into the CPU. Well, if we want to take advantage of that, we can get the source code and we can compile it ourselves and we can use compile options to enable it. They call them flags. We can do these flags to enable these features because we know we have them, right? Mm -hmm. Who cares if the other customers don't have it? We do, so let's take advantage of those features. So sometimes when you compile software from code, you actually get better performance. It takes better advantage of the hardware resources that you've got because it was built right on the machine that you intend to run it on, and it's able to see all that hardware. Well, Don, if it's so awesome to do it that way, why aren't we doing everything this way? Because it's a pain in the butt. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, uh, it used to be a nightmare. It used yeah. to be an absolute nightmare that you'd get the source code and it wasn't good enough right out of the box. You had to go through and, and, and edit lines inside of the code and change it to match your system. You had to put in a bunch of paths and, and other things that made it really just extremely difficult. And uh, I remember back in the old days, like building a custom kernel and stuff. It was an all-day process. It took a long time. Scariest environment imaginable. That's all you had to say. <laughs> That's all you had to say. <laughs> so, but what you'll see in this episode is that it's not like that anymore, that there's a lot of utilities that are available that make it super simple for us to be able to compile this and, and get things going. So that's a really big help. But the main reason we don't want to do this is it's harder, right? It's harder than just getting a package and installing it, right? But there's other negatives as well. If I install with a package, a lot of times I can use a package manager to manage my updates. So if a new version comes out, I just run a, you know, yum update or apt update or, or have to upgrade, I guess, you know, whatever it is I need to do to update the packages, and it'll reach out to repos and, and pull down the new packages and update them, all nice and automatic-like. But if I'm building from source, when an update comes out, I've got to download the new source code. I've got to compile the source code, and then I've got to replace the binary with the new updated one. I have to do it by hand, and that's a pain. It's harder to maintain software when we do it from source code, so that's another reason why we might not want to do it. Um, and then the other reason is... It requires some tools, right? If you're going to compile source code, you need a compiler. The most common one is the GNU-C compiler or GCC, uh, but there's several others like Clang and, and a bunch of others that people are starting to use today. But GCC is by and far the most common one that's out there. Well, if you're deploying a minimal footprint server, you don't want GCC on it. You, you, know, you want a minimal footprint. So now you've got to go to a separate machine somewhere that's built the same way as that server so that you can install GCC and the other utilities, you can compile the software there, and then move the compiled version of the software over to the server so the server maintains its minimal footprint, right? That's a lot of extra work. And again, if, if you're in a high security environment, you're probably listening to me saying this, saying, that's awesome, I'm doing that, right? <laughs> yeah. But the rest of you are probably saying, wow, what a pain, there's no <laughs> way I would do that, right? And, and that's, that's the negative, right? So for some people, it's a great thing. For some people, it isn't. That's kind of another reason why we might choose not to, uh, uh, not to build from source. Yeah, I always love when you're, you're trying to build something from source, and you're like, okay, we're cranking, we're firing away, and all of a sudden it starts telling you about uh, error, um, missing these dependencies, and then you've got to go get those dependencies. And those dependencies rely on some other dependencies, and you're down this rabbit trail, which is when... Package management came out, and I said, oh, man, because that does all that for me. I didn't have to do it. it it's, it's a little more work to use the old yeah. uh, source way, right, Don? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I, I left off one other reason why we might choose to build from source, a, a good reason, right? If you're a cheapskate, <laughs> <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't want to pay for things. See, a lot of things in the open source world are done under the, uh, the GPL, right? One of the, the um, what is it, the GNU public license yep. or whatever that stands for. Um, and th that license dictates that the software is free. You can use it. But there's certain requirements that if you use that and you customize software that's under the GPL, you have to release 
the source code. And so there's a lot of commercial entities out there that have commercial software that they sell, but they have to make the source code available for free because of the GPL, right? One of the best examples of that is the Red Hat Enterprise Linux distro. That Red Hat Enterprise Linux is commercial software. If I want to go and buy it, the server license is, I think, $350, right? Or a workstation license, they start at $50, but then they go up from there. Um, I think my license was $180, right? So it just mm. depends on, on what you're buying. But it costs money. Well, they have to release their source code because of the GPL, and so other people have taken that code and compiled it, and that's where CentOS, the community enter enterprise operating system, comes from, is they're just compiling Red Hat's code. So there's times where you might want to use commercial software and you're just a cheapskate and you don't want to pay for it, <laughs> or you don't need the support, so you might choose to go and compile their code that they released to get the same features, right? And that's one of the examples that I'm going to use right here in this episode is uh, there is a, a software package out there called John the Ripper, and it's a, a pen testing tool for testing password integrity, right? So it allows us to, uh, to basically run against password files and see if we can decrypt the password, right? So as a security researcher, it's a good tool for measuring how strong people's passwords are. Well, John the Ripper is commercial software. You can go and you can buy it from them. And if you buy it from them, then they have RPMs and DEBs. They have package files that you can download and install super easy, all right? But if you don't buy it from them, here's the source code right here. You can download the source code and run it. Now, ironically, they do have a Windows binary that's free for some reason. I, I don't know why, but, uh, but on the Linux side, they just distribute the source code. So if I want to run John the Ripper, I can buy it, right? It's actually not very expensive. I think it's $50 or something like that. Um, so I, I could buy it, or I could just download the source code. Now, in this case, even if I wanted to buy it, uh, John the Ripper Pro is built off of their, their standard you know, official version, but there's these extra builds that other people have done. They call them jumbo builds to add a ton of features. Those are not in the commercial one. And so these are, are actually better in a way, and they're, they're free if you download the source and compile it yourself. So this is an example right here where if I want to run this software, I need to download the source code, and then I'm going to have to compile it by hand uh, in order to get the software up and running. All right. Well, Don, let's get this uh, party started. How do I have, I've downloaded the John the Ripper. I want to get it installed. What is it that I've got to do? Like, how does it differ from using something like AppGet or, or Yum? Okay. Well, there's a couple of pieces of software that I'm going to need, right? First off, I'm going to be compiling code. And almost everything in the Linux world is written in C. But you'll need to identify what language the software is written in. If it's written in Java, if it's written in, in some other language, you need to make sure that you're using the appropriate compiler. Most everything's written in C, so I'm going to need the GNU-C compiler, right? And then I'm going to need another utility that's called make. The make utility is what has turned compiling from source from a nightmare to actually a really pleasant experience. Make allows the developer to predefine flags and options so that you can customize software and do it really easily without having to go and edit a bunch of code files, right? So, for example, here, let me, let me show you that process. I, I want to make sure that I have GCC and that I have Make installed. And I'm on a, a Fedora system, so I'm going to do uh, DNF install GCC Make. All right. uh, those are the two utilities. And, and there will likely be many other utilities that come along with them, unless I've already got it installed, which I can't remember. I might already have it installed. Uh, I do. Actually, I've already got both of them installed. But if I didn't, it would install them here, and now I've got the utilities I need to, to run this process. All right. Then I need the source code. Well, I downloaded the source code from their site, and most software will be distributed in this format right here, .tar, .gz, or sometimes it'll be .tgz. And that means they took all the source code files, and they wrapped it up in a tar, a tar ball is what it's called, but it's hmm. a, a tape archive, really. Uh, so I, I'm going to have thousands of files that now show up as one file. And then they compress it with gzip. So they're actually using two different utilities, one to combine it, one to compress it. So I need to open up this source code. So I'll use tar dash xvzf, and I'll point to that file. Now, xvzf, most of you are probably familiar with tar, but just to run through that real quick, uh, x I'm extracting, uh, v I want verbose output, z it's gzipped, I need to ungzip it, and then f I'm pointing to a file, this is the file, right? So that, that's what I'm, I'm doing right there. Um, those extent, those uh, command line arguments are just ones that I've memorized and, yeah. and use all the time. So I'm going to open that up. And uh, that's different. All right, well, this is a little bit different. Uh, so it's telling me that it's not in a gzip format. So 
I'm gonna just gonna rerun the command and I'll leave off the Z since it's telling me it's not gzip. Um, you know, sometimes developers might do a wrong yeah. file extension <laughs> here. So let's see if that does it. There we go. All right. So, uh, so in this case, it just wasn't compressed for whatever reason. Uh, all right. So now I've extracted the source code, right? And you'll see all the little files here that came along with it, right? These .c files, that's the actual source code for each of the various commands and features that are a part of this software. And the .h files, those are include files that have all sorts of uh, variables and other information and settings that are a part of them that come in along with it. But the point here is it's a lot of files. There is a <laughs> lot of stuff in here, uh, including things like a readme file that gives me some information. There's a whole document folder here that can really help me out. But most of what I want is going to be inside of this SRC folder, this source folder. That's where all the source code is, and I need to compile that to create a binary to run. Now, looking at this folder here, so if I get into that folder, and I take a look at it, I've got three folders. I've got doc, run, and source. Okay, When you compile software from source, it will sometimes create a binary and stick it right here alongside the source code in a run folder like this one. All right? Other times, it will actually install the binary and put it in slash user slash bin or slash user slash sbin or, or wherever. Uh, in that case, you might not have a run folder like this. So there are some little variations you need to be aware of, and I'll, I'll show you how we can kind of identify that. With this one, I've got the source code, and I can move into the source folder, and here it is. Right? So now I'm ready to compile. And this is where it used to be so difficult because you'd have to use the GCC command, and it was it, it would wrap around your screen like four times <laughs> to, to you know import all the files and do all that. It was really really challenging. But now, thanks to the make command, life is a heck of a lot easier. That we can get into this folder, and we can run uh, make, and it will configure the software for us and get it ready to be built to then be compiled. Now. Quick word of, of uh, advice here. I need to build the configuration file first. Older software might actually use the config command. And so you might need to type configure and run that command by itself. And that's going to get the software configured. It might ask you a few questions or, or whatever. Newer software puts that in the make command. And so you'll type make config. All right, so that's what I'm going to run here is make config. And that's going to take a look at this and set any configuration options that I need. Now, when it runs, I might get an error like this. And the error can indicate a few different things. It can indicate that you're missing some dependencies for this to work. I might have to install something. Or you might be missing some parameters or other information. And here I can see I've got a fatal error on architecture. Right? It's trying to include an architecture file. So it doesn't know what architecture I'm building this from. And you might ask yourself, wait a minute, but can it just look at the CPU and know, oh, this is a x86 or this is a x64 or, or whatever. Well, unfortunately, it, it doesn't know if we're building this for us or if we're building it for another computer so that we could specify that architecture. So we may need to give it a, a little bit more to go on, right? If I just run make by itself, it'll tell me the various architectures that are available. And you'll see there's quite a few that are right here in the list. And many of them are Linux. But Linux is compatible with a lot of OSs. I can actually create a binary for FreeBSD or OpenBSD, Solaris, Mac OS, right? I could create binaries for other systems. But I'm creating this for Linux. And then inside of Linux, I need to pick am I x86-64? Do I have a 64-bit CPU? Or do I have a 32-bit CPU? Or do I have a Spark processor, PowerPC? You know, you pick the type of processor you've got. I've got a 64-bit processor, so my list is getting smaller. Right? And then here is where we really get the benefit that I mentioned at the beginning of the show. There are hardware features that may or may not be a part of your processor. My processor might have AVX support in it. It might have AVX and XOP support in it. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> right? But not everybody has that. So we can't just Everybody's got your kind of money, Don. <laughs> yeah. well, in this case, it's actually pretty old, right? 2011 yeah. plus I'll have it. So odds are you're going to have it. But not everybody's got your kind of money done. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got a 10-year-old computer, now, now you've got a problem, right? That's so right. <laughs> the default, though, would be for me to just choose Linux x86-64. And that's going to build this to the most compatible settings possible for any 64-bit uh, you know, AMD 64 system. So right? it kind of just filters, goes from general to more specific. Exactly. And, you, and the more specific you can be, the better performance you're going to get. Yeah, usually, yes. yes. Now, it is possible the software doesn't use XOP at all. Yeah. 
And, and so it doesn't matter if you have support for it or not. If the software can't take advantage of it, then mm -hmm. you know, if the software is a text editor, it doesn't matter if you've built in some kind of 3D video acceleration. <laughs> it's a text editor. Um, so you have to be aware of that. But this is the architecture that I've got, uh, Linux x86-64. So when I go to do a, a make command, I need to give it a little more information so it knows the architecture that I want. Okay. And so when I go to build this, I'm going to provide it that information. Now, when I build it, uh, I've got a choice here. If this is the first time I built this application, then it's going to make the configuration all from scratch, and that's good. But the second time that I build it, it'll reuse that configuration file. So if I made some kind of mistake, maybe I built it with extra hardware options and they're just not working, so I want to come back and rebuild it, then you want to get in the habit of saying make clean. In other words, ignore any previous build that I've done. I want a clean build with all new options. And then I need to provide it with that architecture. So I'm going to say Linux dash x86 dash 64. Okay. And that right there is going to tell it to compile this application clean, right, with all the default configuration and build it for a 64-bit Linux install. Now, I have intentionally picked software that's a little bit harder to do. To be honest with you, a lot of times when you get new software, you just run make by itself. And if it's not dependent on architecture, it'll build it, and, and that's it. You just type make, and you're done. Or maybe make clean, and you're yeah. done. So this one, I have to go a little bit further and provide that option. And when I do that, it's now going to launch, and it's going to start compiling. All right, now, just because it started compiling doesn't mean I've done everything correct. correct. I could still get an error in here if I have some missing dependency. It might depend on a library, like a SSL library or something, and now it fails to build. So we need to double check as it's building, look for any errors. Okay? Mine's pretty clean here, so I didn't get any errors, so it looks like I'm in good shape. But if you did, you need to fix that and then recompile again, right? And keep reiterating through that until you've got everything set. It will output a lot of lines on your screen. And even with a 10,000 line scroll buffer, it's not uncommon to exceed that when you're compiling large applications. Like if you compile LibreOffice, it, it will you know, way go beyond what your scrollback buffer is. So you might even choose to export this to a text file, like it'll redirect the output to a text file so that you can then go in and look at it afterwards. But at this point, it's built. And it's telling me that it doesn't have an installer, that instead it's just dropped itself into the run folder and it's right there. But on most software, it'll have an installer. And you can run one more command. You can say make install. And that will actually install it into slash user slash bin or slash user slash sbin. Now, in order to write to those folders, you have to have administrator privileges. So I would need to sudo that. And then it would be able to install into those locations. But if I don't want the application to be available for everybody, if it's just for me, then I can run it right from that run folder. Or I could move it into my home directory slash bin, and it would be there for just me. In my case, I don't want this utility available for everybody, so I'm perfectly fine with it being here in the run folder. And if I take a look in that run folder, I can find that it now contains a binary called John. And it's got some other stuff like config files and all that came along with it, but it's right here. It's ready to rock, and that executable has been compiled from my system. And hopefully it works. I mean, I, I guess it could be broken. Uh, <laughs> I'll try and, and run it here. I'll, I'll call John dash dash test. And... There it goes. It's firing up. We're probably going to hear the fans on my laptop ramp up in a second. Because yeah. uh, it's testing how many uh, cryptographic cycles it can run through per second. And so it's going to turn along uh, and move through each one. But it is working. And I have now compiled this software from source code. It wasn't the easiest thing in the world, right? Because we had to know the commands to run. And a lot of vendors will put out documentation that tells you exactly what to run. And that's helpful, right? But when it's done, I end up with the same product as if I had gone and bought the commercial one. I just didn't have a package to install it. Here I had to do it by hand, but it wasn't it wasn't too bad. Yeah, that, and that that's the thing about it is it, it's not too bad. It's definitely a whole lot easier than it used to be. As we've tried to allude to, you guys out there, if you're new to Linux, you really don't know the pain and suffering that went along <laughs> with compiling from source. But it did make you really good at finding dependencies and doing the things necessary to get software installed onto your system. But now we've tried to streamline that process quite a bit, and Don has walked you through each one of the steps that you're pro probably going to encounter when it comes to installing from source. A lot of times, it just comes down to running your, con your make configure and make install, and you're, you're off to the races. It's, it's, it's usually that easy. Sometimes not, though. <laughs> you got to get those dependencies out there. Don, that brings us to, well, 
we, we've installed some software. It is running. We are successful. Anything else you want to throw on the heat before we call it a show? Uh, you know, at this point, we are successful. It's easy to celebrate and say, yeah, I got the software. <laughs> but remember, it's still a lot of work on the maintenance side, right? Mm. So if, if the John the Ripper team releases an update, or OpenWall is the company, if OpenWall releases an update next month, I've got to go and download that source code, and I've got to rebuild it, and I've got to move it into place. So, so you have to do this. It's an ongoing thing. It's not a heck of a lot of fun. Package managers solve that for us. So don't, don't feel like you're being hardcore or that you're you know, an extra super Linux expert because you build from source. It's actually kind of nice to have a package manager on from the update side. But on the security side, if you want to guarantee that you're only running code that you've reviewed, that you've looked at and you trust, then this is the way to do it. This is the way that you can certify. I know that code is okay. It is, this binary is built from the source code that I reviewed. It, it does give you a bit of a, like a sense of accomplishment that you feel like you did something. I didn't write the software. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't write one line of code. But, uh, but I feel like I built something. Yeah, <laughs> it, it definitely does do that. It gives you that, uh, that power user feel, right? Like, <laughs> oh, you use app or yum? No, oh, that's nice. <laughs> you super coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool stuff, Don. Thanks for showing us how to uh, maybe bump our game up a little bit when it comes to installing software in our Linux systems because you never know when those package management systems just don't give you what you need. you got to go right to the source and install from there. Don, thanks for joining us today, today yet again, and we do thank our audience out there for watching. But guess what? It is that time for us to sign off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta, coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back with more in our Linux command line series. Joining us in the studio yet again, the man, the myth, the legend, you know him as Don Pizzette. Don, welcome back. How's it going today? Hey, it is going great, Daniel, and we're, we're ready to move into a, an area that I have a little trepidation for. Right? This, is, this is where we start getting into the... You need a, you need a little the, scotch, maybe, yeah, the, to calm the nerves. We get into the Linux religious wars here. We're going to talk about text editors, and while that sounds like a really benign, simple thing, <laughs> hey, you're editing some text files, people love their text editors, especially their command line based text editors, and... There is you know, so much about them. We use them so frequently that when you have one that you really get used to and, and you get attached to, you don't want to acknowledge any other text <laughs> editors. So, so we're going to kick this off by talking about the Vi editor. And, and this is really kind of the, where, where it all starts, is the, the pronunciation of Vi. We'll just cover this real Let's quickly. Let's see what little flavor um, of heresy you're into. Huh? Some people say V. <laughs> some people say Vi. Some people say it's, it's uh, V-I. Yeah. Uh, what, what makes it even worse is that most of us don't actually use Vi. We use Vim, which is, uh, some people say V-I-M, but it, it's kind of all over the place. But uh, the Vi text editor is what we're going to be taking a look at here and how we can use it to edit text files and work with them right from the command line. So I want you to, to make sure you, you, you take your Linux Zealot hat off just for the episode <laughs> and, and don't fixate on, on pronunciation of things because there is no like official right way. Uh, but we're going to take a look at how to use the text editor, and I will tell you that it is a, a great editor. It's really powerful. It can do a lot of neat things, and it's extremely valuable to learn because it's, it's almost ubiquitous, that, that just about every Linux distro comes with Vi installed on it already, which means you can always count on it being there. It's not a guarantee. Some systems don't have it as a default, but most of them do, so it's a good one to learn. Well, Don, let's, can, can we just a little bit there? Uh, I don't want to get into zealotry, but I do want to make a... <laughs> Uh, you, you mentioned Vi and Vim. Which one is it that I'm probably going to be using? All right, so it, it kind of depends on your distro, but most of us are actually going to use Vim. The, Vi is very old, right? It was developed a long, long time ago, and it, it was developed in the Unix world, right, and, and then brought uh, into the Linux world from there. And with Vi, it, it, it stands for the visual editor. So Vi is just short for visual, which we, we were joking before yeah. the show. It should actually be pronounced Vi. <laughs> but... But, but anyhow, so it, it's, it's a text editor that gives you a visual interface. And you got to remember that back in the, the 1980s, visual meant something a lot different than it does today. It doesn't mean I've got a graphical user interface, uh, but you actually see on the screen what you're, you're editing, right? You know, it's like a what you see is what you get type uh, interface. Um, and that, that's part of what makes it very powerful. But 
it wasn't that powerful in the beginning. So it got upgraded. Other, other versions of it started coming out. And the one that gained the most acceptance was one that was called Vi Improved, which is abbreviated to VIM or V-I-M. Now, in order to follow POSIX standards, when you or when somebody builds a Linux distribution, if they want to be POSIX compliant, they have to have slash bin slash VI as their default editor, right? That, that has to exist. It has to be there. But the distros can choose to map that to whatever they want. And so you'll often find where your distro has slash bin slash VI linked to something else. So like in Ubuntu, it's actually linked to GNU Nano. It's not linked to VI. It has by installed, you can use or you can install Vim if you want, but it's actually linked to Nano. So you might be dropping to a command line. Here, I'll, I'll do it on mine. Um, I'm running Fedora, right? And so I might drop to a command line and just type VI and press enter, all right? But see what it did? It didn't take me to Vi, the old one. It took me to Vim, which is Vi approved, right? So that's where it's landed me because that's how my distro has mapped it. And if you ever want to see uh, you know, which one it is that you're using, if you do a, a long listing of slash bin, you can go in there and, and look and, oops, sorry, mine is, is linked, I forgot. So uh, let me link here. Uh, you can go in and you can look and you can find VI, which instead of hunting for it, let's just do that. And you can see if it's linked somewhere. And actually in my case, it's not linked anywhere, is it? I've got um, slash user slash bin slash VI that uh, Fedora has apparently just chosen to swap out that binary. Mm -hmm. and, and so the, the VI binary is taking me to them. But that's not a guarantee, right? Fortunately, as far as the commands we're going to see in this episode, it doesn't really matter if you're in Vi or Vim. Vim does have some advanced functionality, like um, if you're writing HTML, it can do colorized tagging. The original Vi couldn't do that. The original Vi didn't have colors at all, but Vim does. But that doesn't impact all the commands that we issue. So what we're going to see in this episode applies to both Vi and Vim, so it doesn't matter which. But if you're on Ubuntu and you type Vi, you actually end up in Nano, and nothing we show you in this episode is going to work. <laughs> and and, and that, is, uh, that is something that happens. You can have more than one editor installed. And in fact, here, I've got this Vi binary, but I'm certain I've got a Vim one as well. Sure enough, there it is. And they're even different file sizes. Notice how the Vi one, uh, if we let's do, uh, let's do this a little bit different here. I'm going to add H so it's human readable. Um, the Vi one was 1.1 megs in size, the Vim one is 2.9 megs in size, right? So in the Fedora world, they actually have two different versions of Vim. There's Vim Lite, which is trying to be more compatible with Vi and not a lot of the extra bells and whistles in it. And then there's Vim Enhanced. And Vim Enhanced, it, I mean, it's already Vi Improved. Now yeah. it's Vi Improved Enhanced. So Vim Enhanced adds even more bells and whistles to it, things like the, the code coloring and stuff uh, that you may or may not need. So it, again, creates a little bit of uncertainty. Am I running Vi? Am I running Vim? Am I running Vim Enhanced? You, you may need to double check in your distro. But at the end of the day, if you just run Vi, it'll usually tell you what you're running, and you'll get that kind of note right there on the screen and the version that you've got, and it gives you kind of an idea of how that should be. Now, remember the I mentioned the zealotry over things. We were yeah. talking about capitalization before the show, and so you've got Vim here, all capital, but then right beneath it, Capital V, lowercase i, lowercase m. So th there is no, you know, no real hard set way for how this stuff works. It's kind of all over the place. All right, Dom, well, let's take some baby steps here and let's jump into opening a file. I've already got a file or I want to I want to open a file. How do I do that? Okay, so if you want to open up a file inside of Vim, there's two ways to do it. There's, there's one way to, is if you're from your command line. The other way is to do it right from in here if you're already in Vim. But most of us don't do it this way. Is, uh, what you'll do is if you've got a file that you want to edit. So for example, here in my home directory, I've got the text of Moby Dick right there, right? So if I want to open that file up in uh, Vi, I would just say Vi and then the name of the file, right? So Moby Dick.txt. And when I run that, there it goes, it opens it up, and now I'm editing my first file inside of Vi, okay? Now, if I didn't do that, if I just type Vi, that takes me into the editor and I'm technically looking at a new file. It's displaying a, what they call a splash page, right? That's not actually text in the file, though. If I start typing in here, see how it all just disappeared, right? So this is technically a blank file. And that little bit that appears at the very beginning is just a splash page. It's letting you know some basic information. Because if you're lost, if you get in here by accident, you might only care about one thing. How do I get out of it? Which, <laughs> 
unfortunately, is right here. They actually tell you how to get out of it in yeah. case you launch it by accident because it's not intuitive. So, so there's that. And they've got other things in here. A lot of times they'll actually tell you um, that if you want to learn more, there's a tutorial you can run. Uh, this particular version doesn't say it, but you can type colon Vim tutorial and it'll actually walk you through a whole lesson on, on how to learn it. Uh, and you've got help and, and so on. But if I just want to create a file from scratch, I can do it right from here and just start to put in my data. But if I want to work with a file, I just do it right here from the command line. I specify it, and there we go. Now we're into it, and we can start working with that file and, and uh, you know, modifying it as we need. Now, Don, I, I remember the first time I fired up uh, VI or Vim or, or whichever you like to call it, uh, the first thing I noticed was I wasn't able to just start typing into and make changes on the file. It had, it had me kind of locked into a system where things were kind of crazy. Uh, what, what is that? Why is that happening? All right, so th this is the hardest part. The, the, if you can get past this one little learning curve, the rest <laughs> yeah. of, of Vi is actually pretty easy. Um, there's two modes, two interface modes in Vi. And when you first go into it, you're in what's called the command mode. You're issuing commands to the editor. You're not typing. The other mode is the insert mode. In insert mode, that's when you're typing, right? So the problem is if I don't know that, right? Most text editors, when you fire them up, you're ready to just start typing, right? You put your cursor where you want it to be and you start typing. But in Vi, it's not like that. You start in command mode. So if we go back here, I'm, I'm, I'm in the, the text for Moby Dick, and I can move my cursor around. I'm just using the arrows on my keyboard to, to move around. And let's say right here, I, I want to change this where it says English, and I want to change it to French, right? So I put my cursor right on that H, and I hit backspace, and... A whole lot of nothing. It's moving back, yeah. but, but it's not actually removing <laughs> anything. And I'm like, well, all right, uh, I could try and type something, right? Um, maybe I'll move down to this blank line. I'm going to type the word this. Okay, so I'm going to type T H I S. You got the S in there. The S appeared, and that's it. All right. The reason is each letter that I pressed was a command. I sent the T command that did nothing. I sent the H command that did nothing. I sent the I command that did something. And then I typed S, and now I'm typing. What happened is when I typed I, that switched me into insert mode. I was in command mode, and now I'm in insert mode. And insert mode is the typing mode that most of us are used to. So, so now I can type this. I can move up to where it says English, and I can backspace, and there it goes. Insert mode is what most of us are used to. All right? But when you fire up Vi, you will be in command mode by default. Okay. Now, I know that by looking down here at the bottom left. See how it's telling me that I'm in insert mode? Okay. Let me, let me get back out of this. And I'm going to go back in. And now when I look at the bottom left, what do I see? Well, I saw the file and its file size for a moment, and now it's gone. Right? As soon as I move my cursor, that disappears, and now there's nothing down there. Okay? If you see nothing in the bottom left, you're in command mode. Right? And here's where it gets even weirder. There's actually two different types of commands. <laughs> there's commands that you can just type right here, like uh, I, that would move me into insert mode. Right? And there's other commands that you actually have to type a colon to get to first, right? So I, I typed the word this a moment ago, right? Uh, and the second letter of this is H. And when I typed that H, nothing happened, okay? But H is actually a valid command. It's just not a valid command in this particular mode. If I type a colon, see down at the bottom left that colon appeared? Now I can type other commands, commands that might be different. So remember that H that didn't do anything? Now I can type an H and press enter, and it does something. Now I'm in the help for Vim or Vi or whatever it is I'm using. So I can go in and I can start to read the help file and start to, to learn about that. It's very, very exciting. Okay. So that information is available, and it's just kind of tricky to, to recognize what it is that you're in if you're in one mode or the other. And so like, if I want to exit out, I can hit colon Q, and I can exit. I just quit out of that file. I had to type a colon first before I did it. If I just typed a Q, nothing happens, right? Well, not entirely nothing. You'll, you'll notice down here at the bottom right that Q did actually appear because it's, it's expecting me to, to do something with it, right? And if I hit it again, see how it started a recording, right? Some commands do all sorts of different things. I can create macros or, or other recordings here. That's what Q does. But if I didn't recognize that, I could accidentally issue that command, like I, I've done now, and it's starting that mode, and 
I need to exit out, I'll hit Q again. So we're not going to get into recording memories. <laughs> yeah. but, um, <clears throat> it's really easy to accidentally issue a command. And that's what makes buy so intimidating for people, to, to kind of get used to that, to understand that there's times where the H key can do one thing, there's times where it does another thing, and how do I remember which is which? You've got to learn the modes, okay? So uh, if we really wanted to get down to the brass tacks of it, I guess there's technically three modes, right? There's the insert mode where we type like normal, there's the command mode with no colon, and then there's the command mode with a colon. And so we've got to recognize the behavior of Vim depending on which mode we happen to be in. Well, Don, I would assume that for the most part, especially if we're beginning in uh, Vim or Vi, that we just want to start creating a text file. I just want to add text to my file, put my grocery list, put things I need to do, maybe server list, whatever it is I'm doing. I want to get that in. So I would think maybe insert mode might be a good place for us to start learning about. Yes, absolutely. So if I want to insert more text, right, or, or even delete text or, or whatever, I need to get into insert mode. And there's really, there is just one command you can remember, right? <laughs> there's actually like eight commands that you can use, but, but there's one that is the easiest, and it's just I, I for insert. So if I want to come in here and start typing in this file, I can move my cursor to where I want it to be, and I can type I, and now I'm in the insert mode, and I can start going, okay? Now, technically, that I, when I press it, is telling it that I want to insert text after the cursor, all right? So let me, let me show you what I mean so I get this in a little more detail. See how the cursor right now is blinking on the N in English, okay? That's where my cursor is. When I press I, now I can start typing. And when I start typing, it's typing right on that cursor, okay? I can change that behavior. If I, instead of typing a lowercase i, if I typed a capital I, so if I put that cursor right back on the N, and I'll do a capital I, look what it did. It jumped to the beginning of the line, okay? So a lowercase I is looking for where the cursor is. A capital I is going to the beginning of the line, all right? And we can go even more advanced with things like, oh, uh, if I, let me, I'm going to make sure that I'm showing my bottom left part of the screen here too. If I type O, it goes after the line, right? Maybe I want to add a line after the one that I'm on, and I can do that and see. So it, it did flip me to insert mode. I see that note right there, and I'm now inserting and typing right here after it, okay? That was a lowercase o. If I do a capital O, well, it behaves pretty much the same, right? Now I'm in insert mode, and I can come in, and I can type, and I can start to work. Sometimes the capital letter just behaves the same as the lowercase. Other times it doesn't. Um, for example, A. With I, I inserted right where my cursor was, okay? So if my cursor is here on the U, if I type an I, I would start inserting right here. If I type a lowercase a, whoops, sorry, I was uh, still in command mode. So, <laughs> or uh, in uh, insert mode. mode. Yeah. So um, if, I, if I put my cursor on the, the G and I hit the lowercase a, it's going right after the cursor. So I was right on the cursor, a is right after the cursor. If I had done a capital A though, it goes to the end of the line, right? So capital A goes to the end, capital I goes to the beginning, lowercase i goes on the cursor, lowercase a goes after the cursor. It's confusing, right? Mm -hmm. And you, you might ask yourself, how do you remember all of these, right? Well, there's, there's kind of a few different avenues on this. You, you could choose not to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not going to remember it. I'm just going to always use lowercase i. Because the reality is I, I could do that, right? And whoops. <laughs> do a lowercase i, and now I can just move my cursor to wherever it is that I want it to be, right? So you can certainly do that. Or you could memorize it, right? You just mm -hmm. print out a, a, a list like mine here and try and memorize it and have it committed to memory. Or you can cheat. <laughs> and, uh, I like cheating. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes there's a real benefit for cheating, and, and I absolutely cheat uh, when, when it's necessary. Uh, and, and with Vi shortcuts, it's kind of handy. I'm, can we show my keyboard on my laptop? So you guys don't normally see my laptop, but if you look at my laptop uh, for $7 online, <laughs> yeah. you can buy these little stickers. And these are all the Vi commands right here on my keys. Because some of them we don't use very often. I, right. I use insert commands all the time. So that, that's not something that I really have to remember. But I don't record macros all the time. So I might not remember that Q is a, a way to record macros. But I can see right here on my little note, lowercase Q, record macro. Mac macro. Macro. Let's say it. Uh, capital Q is, is X mode, so completely different. Uh, but I can see each of those. And so you've got like A is append at end of line, lowercase A is append 
right here. That helps to memorize, it helps to learn. So when you're getting started with Vi, tools like these, mm -hmm. keyboard overlays or, or little printed cheat sheets, those can really help you with learning all these commands because it is kind of like a fire hose. There's so many different commands that are available. But just to get started, if you just remember the letter I, you can get into insert mode and then you can start typing. You just move your cursor where you need it to go and start typing. That's the one that's at least enough to get you in there. But if you remember the capital I, A, capital A, O, those all help as well to be able to get right to where you want without having to move the cursor around. Well, Don, how were you bouncing in and out of uh, insert mode to command mode? Because you, you would type stuff and, and you would, oh, I'm still in insert mode. I'm, I need to go to command mode. How, how did you get back to that? Well, I didn't do it very well because I screwed it up <laughs> yeah. several times. But, uh, you know, I, I type I to get into insert mode. So here, let's, let's go back and, and I'll, I'll get into insert mode, right? So I just type the lowercase i. And down at the bottom left, I see I'm now in insert mode, and I start typing, right? If I want to get back to command mode, you just hit escape. When you hit the escape button on your keyboard, see how insert just went away? And now that it's gone, I can, you know, start working like normal. So, Don, what do people with new MacBook Pros do? <laughs> All right. You know, there's a little consternation going on because of that, there that is. LCD bar. So uh, on the newer Macs, they've got that touch bar, and yeah. the escape key is in there. And I know but you Justin have to hit like nine times to get the escape key to show up. <laughs> Justin, one of our developers, has been having some some fun with that. But uh, but for most of us, we have a real computer that still has an escape key, <laughs> uh, and you can press that, and, and and you'll get right out of it. But yeah, that escape key is really handy. I think uh, Stanley in the chat room said, uh, "Escape is your friend." Your, darn right. It absolutely is because that's how we get out of insert mode. And now we're back in command mode and ready to start issuing commands. All right. Well, now that I'm back in command mode, I've, I've typed up my file. I've, I've edited Moby Dick. That Melville, he didn't know what he was talking about. I had to make some <laughs> editing and changing it. I've made it just right. And now I want to save that file. What, what do I got to do? All right. So there's a few different ways to go about this. If we're ready to save a file, right, um, we can just save it, right? The, the save command is a W. So you would type a colon. So now I'm in my, my colon command mode. Command the colon. And uh, just type a W. You up yourself, I you? know, it's just terrible. We're your um, children. Well, I'll do colon W, press enter, and there we go. I, I see that I just saved it, and that was it. Okay, and, and if I'm done editing the file, I can follow it up by doing a colon Q, and I quit out of it, and now I'm out, right? And you can even combine the commands. You can string them together. So if I get back into it, right, and um, you know, I'll get into insert mode, and I'll type something, I'll hit escape to get back into command mode, I can do a colon WQ. And it'll do both. It will write the file, and then it will quit the program. So you just so put the commands w. together. Yeah. The, the order is important. Ah. I don't want it to try quitting first and then writing. Makes that doesn't sense. work out so well. <laughs> but, uh, but here I want to write and then quit, and it'll do that. And it takes me right out. And, you know, it's actually protecting you a bit. If I were to have come in here, and let's say that I remove that line, okay, and then I decide that I'm going to quit, right? Well, error 37, no write since last change. It's telling me... You've made changes you probably want to save. Okay, so it, it helps me there, it protects. Now, sometimes it's a change by accident. Maybe I forgot that I was in command mode and I typed something and it did all sorts of screwy stuff to the file. That's a true story. It happens to me <laughs> yeah. all too often. So, uh, so you've messed it up and maybe you want to quit and not save. Well, it's telling you you can add an exclamation point to override. You can type a colon, Q, and an exclamation point. That's going to quit out of the editor and throw away my changes, right? So I deleted the word test under uh, language English. And so if I quit and I go back in, there's test right back again. It didn't save my changes. That's kind of nice. But colon Q, that'll get you out of there and, and save it. Now, I mentioned how there's two different command modes, all right? The main command mode, the one that we use the most is the one with the colon. So I type a colon and I start typing commands. But there are other commands available that don't use the, the colon mode. So for example, if I want to get out of Vi, right, I just got out of it, but I never did type a colon, right? Let me show you how I did that. If you type a capital Z, watch down here at the bottom of my screen. You're going to see it appear right in here somewhere. I'm going to type a capital Z, right? So it received that command. And then I'm going to type another capital Z, right? Two capital Zs, that's another command for exit. I want to get out of Vi. And it's done not from the colon command mode, but from the, the regular just lettered command mode. Now, that's the less common one because there's, there's far fewer commands that work in that mode. So as a general rule of thumb, if you're just learning Vi, I encourage you to learn the colon commands first because there's, there's more of them, right? That you can get everything done with that one versus the, the other letters, which are technically shorter. It's a few less keystrokes. 
Well, I guess it really isn't. Not, not yeah. a lot. And you got to capitalize. All right, well, maybe it's not so uh, good. But uh, but it is there, and it's mostly there for backwards compatibility from the original Vi, uh, is that it used those commands. The colon commands were added as part of the Vim, right? You know, it has a part of what we get there. So um, part of the enhancements and, and upgrades. But that gets me in, and it gets me uh, in and out of the file, so I'm, I'm able to start uh, working. If I just wanted to read the file, I might want to get into it, read it, look around, and then do a colon Q to get out. Uh, I never changed it, so I don't need to save. So the colon Q is enough to get there, and now we're we're in business. Right. Well, Don, I know that uh, Vi and Vim, they also have uh, some really cool shortcuts when it comes to working inside of it and doing things with it. I think that's a lot of the reason uh, for its popularity, because deleting text, that's, that's, that's what's one of my favorite things. I can go <laughs> in, right? We, we saw Don, he wrote some stuff. He goes in, you can backspace and delete, or you can hit the delete key and you know, bring it from the other side, but you can also do a little, a little more quicker, right? And a little, yeah. a little better. You know, the the colon commands uh, they can be executed on a range of lines. Mm. So, like, if I just press the delete key, I'm deleting something on one line. But if I want to delete five lines, I don't want to sit there and hold the delete key while it slowly deletes five lines. And that's where those colon commands come in really powerful. So, I want to I want to walk you through several of those. You know, mm. things like multi-line deletes, arrange commands, copy and paste. Uh, uh, you know, search and replace, and those things are all powered by those colon commands. But what we've seen so far in this episode are kind of the basics of what you need just to get started with Vi and get in there and edit a config file or, you know, change something just real quick. Uh, and it's really the important stuff that you need to know. So getting in, using uh, I to get into insert mode, doing colon W and colon Q to save and quit, uh, those are key, and you're going to use those every single day. The rest of them are all nice to know. They make your life easier, and the more proficient you get with it, the faster you'll be able to edit files with Vi. So I want to walk you through those, but I don't really have enough time here in this episode. So Daniel, let, let's do a part two. Sounds good. And we'll treat it like this. So part one, this, these were the, the core fundamental commands we need to know to work with Vi. And then in part two, we're going to show you the ones that can really start to ratchet up your productivity and, and take advantage of uh, you know, some of the quick uh, large-scale bulk editing that we can do inside of Vi. All right. Well, Don, sounds great. I can't, look, uh, can't wait to see what's going to go on inside of that part, too, because I know my Vi skills could definitely use a little bit of polishing. I'm sure most of us are in the same boat. So thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your time and effort. Appreciate our audience out there for watching. But as the man has said, we're out of time for this episode. Come on back for that part, two. Learn a little more about Vi, though. Signing off for IT Pro TV, I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. We're coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another great episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back with more in our command line series for the Linux operating system, and joining us back in the studio yet again, we're continuing our conversation on the Vi or Vim editor, our good friend, Mr. Don Bazette. Don, welcome back, sir. How's it going today? It is going just well. Daniel, we're ready to dive right back in and go a little further into Vi than we did in the last episode. Uh, the last episode kind of served as a primer, uh, mm -hmm. teaching us the, the basics that we need to know just to get in, edit a file, save, and get out. But now I want to kick it up a notch and go into some of the more advanced functions that are, I mean, it's not super advanced, but, yeah. you know, I, I delete stuff, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. But they are important, ones that will make our job a little bit easier and help you to see how Vi can be used to quickly and efficiently edit Vi. Well, Don, it'll be a lot of fun because I know that once I've written up that letter, that email to you or, or just my first draft of it that tells you how much I can't stand you, I realized, yeah, it felt good to write, but I probably shouldn't send that. I need to get it <laughs> out of the file that we're sharing. And deletion is a great place to start. Let's start there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, so let, let's go, go and we'll jump back into that Moby Dick file that I've been uh, kind of using this show. Uh, and we'll edit that one. And let's say that I want to delete some data out of here. Well, if you're in insert mode, so I'll press I to get into insert mode. You can just move wherever you want, and you can use your backspace and delete keys just like normal, right? So that's not too too big of a deal there. We can go through and we can delete things just like normal. But if I want to delete an entire line, like let's say this line here, this start of this project, Gutenberg, ebook, Moby, Dick, or the Whale. Uh, so I want to delete that whole line. Well, I could move to it and then hold down the delete key while it slowly went away. That's fun. <laughs> or we could take advantage of uh, 
well, Vi's plethora of, of shortcuts and commands that can do the same thing. So for example, if I hit escape, I'm in command mode now. And in command mode, it is important to pay attention where the cursor is, because I'm going to tell it to delete the line that I'm on. All right? And the old way of doing it without the colon would be to use the D command. And if I press D twice, it will delete this line. And so if you watch down here at the bottom of my screen, I'm going to press D, right? There's the first D, and nothing has happened. And then I can hit D again, and there went that line, all right? So if I want to delete one, I can, I can certainly do that. And I can just come up here, and I can keep doing it. Do D, 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 D. All right, so uh, you know, just going through and, and deleting it. The newer way to do it, the colon-based command, would be to come in and pick a line like this produced by Daniel Lazarus and Jonesy, apparently. Um, and I will do a colon and then just D, right? A single D, but same amount of keystrokes, right? But, yeah. uh, but colon D, and that will tell it to delete that line. So same basic command just being issued again to, to go in and delete that line. So pretty straightforward there. You can choose to ignore one and just use the other. Uh, maybe I like DD better than colon D, but I tend to use the colon command. So... Uh, you know, colon D knocks out that line. All right. Well, Don, another fundamental thing that we use when we're editing text is the copy and paste, right? That we couldn't live without. This is a, a must-have. Am I just highlighting text and right-clicking? Oh, wait. I might be in the head of the system, right? <laughs> yeah. Vi was developed before the mouse. So we don't have a mouse cursor where you can just go and highlight text and, and copy and paste. I mean, you actually do if you're on your desktop, right? I can come in and I can highlight and copy and paste. But if I'm SSH'd into a server or, or something like that, I might not have that functionality. So you can actually do copy and paste right from inside of Vi. They don't call it copy and paste, though. They call it yank and put. Remember, this stuff was developed back before these were standard industry terms, right. so they could call it whatever they wanted. Uh, and so we can yank text from the screen, and we can put it somewhere else, right? So if I want to yank text, I can come up to a line, and I can use the Y command to yank. And again, I could do YY, or I could do colon Y, either, either one. And uh, so I'll do uh, YY, for example. Now, when I do that, nothing really changes on the screen, right? And that's because I've copied that line into my buffer. And I can move to another place, and I can say P to put, and now it puts that line right there. So now I've got it, and I can do it over and over again. And you know, keep putting it, because it's stored in the memory buffer, right? So you can keep laying that memory buffer out there, and we're now putting it in. So we've copied and pasted. Now, Feel free to use your mouse. Use your, your GUI if you've got it. You can, you can cut and paste all you want, right? But be careful. Here, I'm copying and pasting using the command mode. If I use my mouse and I come in and I highlight this line, right, and I copy it, right, or uh, I think in GNOME Terminal it's Control-Shift-C, uh, and then I go and paste it, well, I'm still in command mode. I don't want to paste anything in command <laughs> mode. There's a lot of commands that I'd be sending. So you got to make sure you get into insert mode before you start pasting with your, your GUI or whatever, if you do that. But if you want to be a purist and just use Vi, you've got Y for yank and P for put. Easy to copy and paste. Now, Don, I've, I've noticed that sometimes when I'm using Vi, uh, I'm in command mode, and my cursor will start jumping around because I forgot to go into insert mode or something, and I'm, I'm typing something away, maybe like this. And I notice that my cursor moves. Mm -hmm. What is going on there? All right, so... Uh, Again, this was all developed before mice, and in the, in the olden days, there were several different keyboards that were used, and not every keyboard had arrow keys on them. Most of us, you know, you look at your laptop or your desktop, and, and you've got arrow keys on there, and you can use them to navigate. I'm, I'm doing it here in this show all the time, right? But if you didn't have arrow keys, or if your arrow keys didn't work, if you were remoted into a terminal session that didn't support arrow keys, you needed a different way to navigate. So inside of Vi, they've actually mapped a series of keys. It's the HJKL keys. On a US keyboard, they're all right in a row, H, J, K, and L. And, uh, and I'm like, can, can we show my keyboard for a second? Uh, so here you can see on my keyboard where the H, J, K, and L, they're all in a row. And because of my little cheating stickers, yeah, I see the little see arrow that. keys that are on here. But H is left and L is right. J is down, K is up. All right. They don't actually stand for something like H isn't higher or whatever. Yeah. It's just they're, they're all in a row. They're convenient to use. You can place one hand on them and navigate around. So when I'm in the, the command mode, if I press H, J, K, or L, I'm going to move around based on which of those that I hit. And that's what normally happens when somebody forgets that they're in command mode or doesn't, doesn't even know what command mode is. And they just start to try and start typing. They'll use their arrow keys to move where they want. And then they'll start to type. And if I type the word this, T, 
T H, you know, it, it eventually. Oh shoot, the yeah, T you did I. You registered, <laughs> but um, but uh, but you know, it'll start moving that cursor around, and they, they won't know why, right? right? And it's because of those keys that are there. Now those keys are valuable because I I find even today there'll be times where I've remoted into a server and my arrow keys aren't working. And so you fall back to using those, H, J, K, and L, and you can navigate around using them. Yeah, God forbid you type the word history, because then it would be H, which would move your cursor to the left, and then I, which would put you in insert mode, then S, which would actually start typing yeah, into the yeah. wrong spot. And hey. It freaks you out. It, like, it kind of takes you out of your element. You're like, what is going on? It can really disturb your calm yeah. <laughs> if you don't understand what the heck is going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you can fix it, but yeah. it gets kind of annoying having to go back and fix things. So you want to try and avoid that. All right. Now, I have made quite a bit of a mess of my little file here with all these lines that I pasted. Down a little berserk. And, and if I want to delete them, I can sit here and do individual deletes over and over again. But one of the more powerful commands that we have inside of Vim is that we can do ranges. We can have a command apply not just to one line, but more than one line. All right. We don't see it here. Uh, well, I guess we sort of see it. My head's on it. Um, but at the bottom right, you see those numbers that are changing, right? Those numbers are tracking what line I'm on. So right now I'm on line 27, and then I'm on line 30, and now I'm on line 35, right? And as I navigate around looking at this stuff, as I move to the right, see the second number is changing. I'm on line 30, and I'm 16 characters in, or I'm 25 characters in, right? So it's tracking that for me. If I wanted to delete a range of lines, I could say, look, it starts here on line 25, all the way down here to line 33. These are bad lines. I want to get rid of 25 to 33. Right? Now, I know that colon D will delete a line. But I can actually put a range of lines right here. I could say 25, comma, 33, D. That's going to go in and delete all of those lines. Or hopefully, it will delete all of those lines if we do it right. So I'm going to run that and they all go away. I just deleted a range of lines. And that's really handy with the copy and paste, like yank. I could yank mm -hmm. 10 lines and then go and paste them somewhere as needed. So, uh, so we've got that kind of available for us, and it's really a handy thing to be able to do ranges. Now let me add one more thing to it. The numbers at the bottom right of the screen are kind of nice, but in, in, in my day when yeah. I learned, <laughs> we always had the line numbers displayed on Which the screen. super handy. It really is, and in Vi, it's not like that by default. So if you want to see line numbers, there's a simple command you can run. If you do a colon, we can use the set command. Now, we haven't used this yet. Set modifies the configuration of Vi. And I can say set number. And when I do that, now I get line numbers, right? Oh, yeah. That's really handy. In fact, it's so handy that I like to have this on by default. Well, this command is temporary. When I get in here and I, I use it, uh, if I save and exit, and then I go back into Moby Dick, see how it's gone, right? So I have to do set number every time. Well, I do set number every time. <laughs> I like to have that running. So let me show you a neat little trick. In your home directory, if you create a file called .vimrc, you can pack it full of commands, and they'll all be run every time you run vi or, or vim. So that .vimrc, that's the name of the file, and I'll actually use vi to, to create yeah. its own configuration file. Uh, it'll be empty if this is the, the first time you made it. And in the first line, I'm just going to type set number. Right? So now, whenever I run Vim, it will run this command and get it configured for me. So I'm going to save. I'll do a colon WQ and save that. Right? And now, when I go and edit the Moby Dick file, there's those line numbers. I didn't have to turn it on. And now, when I'm doing range commands, it can be really handy. So for example, now, um, you know, we've got the Project Gutenberg header. Uh, I want to... I want to delete all this header stuff and get to where the book actually starts. Well, they've added a bunch of junk here at the beginning. So you know, maybe I want to get rid of some of that. I can look here and easily see the lines. I want to get rid of lines 1 through 22, right? So I can do colon 1, comma 22, delete, and there they go. And now they're gone. And having the numbers on the screen really helps with that. Now, Don, it probably would have been really easier uh, or more easier to find what you were looking for if you could actually find what you're looking yeah. for, use some sort of searching function to say, where is the beginning of Moby Dick? It's call me Ishmael, the, the, you yeah. know, the tagline, I guess. Uh, if I could just look for that, it would have been a whole lot easier. Yeah, and, and we can search, right? We can search this and find something. And again, I, I kind of expected to find it just a page or two down. But the book doesn't, it looks like they've got some kind of glossary. Teacher's note, or, it said. Yeah, it was what, what was that? Yeah, uh, oh, there it is. So line 513, 
Now, Don, I know she had a little trouble finding the beginning of that book. Is there a search functionality built into Vi? Yeah, yeah. There's actually a few different ways to do search, and the way I normally do it is the same way we would do it in the more command or the less command, where you just type a forward slash, and now you search, right? So I, I can do that right here. If I just type a, a, I'm on line one, and I'll type a forward slash, and I, I don't have to be on line one, I just happen to be there, and I can type that forward slash, and I can type in a search string like Ishmael, right? I, we know the first line of the story is call me Ishmael, so I can just search for that, and there it is, right? It took me right to line 535, and now I'm able to find it. And now I'm in what's kind of a, a search mode, right? So see how the command, or the, the term that I search for is highlighted? From here, I might want to search for the next instance and the next instance. And there's a few different ways to do it. Um, you can just hit the forward slash again and press enter. And I can do that over and over again and see it's just kind of moving from instance to instance. Or you can hit uh, N, the a lowercase N moves to the next one. A capital N goes to the previous. So you can use lowercase n and capital N to move back and, and forth uh, amongst these, uh, these, these different uh, ones that you've searched for. Um, you can use the question mark as well, but the question mark requires you to, to actually press enter. So it's a, a little bit different than um, just using n to, to move back and forth. So a few different ways to kind of navigate through and get to it. And in fact, let's say I knew ahead of time that I'm going to open up this file and I want to go straight to the first instance of the word Ishmael, right? I could actually modify the way I open it just a little bit, and I could say plus slash Ishmael like that, okay? I'm telling you, I want you to open this file, and I want you to go straight to the first instance of Ishmael. And I'm doing this right from the command line, and when I run that, there we go, and it jumps in. Actually, shoot, it didn't go to the first instance because I left it that in search. the search string, yeah. yeah, the previous one. So it... It actually remembers the search that you did. That's a part of Vim Enhanced. If I was running the native Vi, that wouldn't have happened. But um, but it remembers it takes you there. So it helps you to get right back to or right where you want to be from the very beginning. But that search functionality is built right in, and it's it's pretty powerful. Yeah, Don. And you also said you could do uh, not only just search, but search and replace. So if you said, oh, you know, I'm going to rewrite Melville again because he, he was a horrible writer. <laughs> Apparently not. He was. He was actually quite brilliant. But you want to say, call me Don instead of call me Ishmael. I want to change Ishmael to Don. We can do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not, not so much with the forward slash, hmm. uh, but if we use the colon command version of this, we can do a search and replace pretty easy. It, it actually integrates the said uh, editor kind of right into Vim. That uh, if we do a colon, you can type S slash and search for a term and then replace it with another one. So I could search for Ishmael, and I could replace it with Don. Right? So I'm going to search for that line. Now, it's doing that on the line that I'm on. So I need to pay attention to where my cursor was. My cursor was on line 535, so it's going to search and replace Ishmael right there on that line. And when I run it, now it's called me Don. Okay? But it didn't do that throughout the whole file. right? If I go and, and do a search for Ishmael, I'll find that it's still in other places, right? It was just on that one line. So the way we call this command actually impacts what it, it's going to be affecting. So um, in my case, that was just on line 535. If I wanted it to affect more of the file, I could either do a range or tell it to do the entire file, right? So um, the next Ishmael was here. So this paragraph has two instances of Ishmael, right? Uh, here on line 771 and on line 774. So I could do a colon, and maybe I'll do the whole paragraph, right? So 765 comma 775, right? So that's the, the, the lines that cover that paragraph. And then I tell it I want to search. I want to search for Ishmael, and I want to replace it with Don, and it's going to run. And those two instances just changed. There's Don there, and there's Don there. But it still didn't do the whole file, right? If I search for Ishmael, he still turns up. Uh, you know, through the rest of the, the novel, right? So if we want to do the whole thing, we need to use another little wild card that I haven't shown yet. When we do a range like this, normally we're specifying a beginning number and an ending number. But if you do a colon, and instead of numbers, you just put percent. Percent means every line. I want this to run on every line. I want to do a search. So I'll say S slash. I want to search for Ishmael. I want to replace it with Don. And now it's going to do it across the entire file, right? And I got 15 substitutions, right? So this 17,000 line file, <laughs> apparently his name only popped up 15 times. But, uh, uh, but now I can come in and I can do a search and I can look for Ishmael. I'll do a backward search here for Ishmael. 
And, oh, apparently we missed one. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? It is interesting. Or is it spelled different? No, no it's there. Um, but, uh, yeah, I missed at least one. <laughs> yeah, well, just one. That's odd. Uh, but, yeah, I'm searching. He's not finding any others. It's just yeah. that one instance. It's kind of a, a weird one. That has been um, my uh, um, experience that search and replace functionality can be a little weird. you gotta you got to hit just on with the correct parameters. If there's any kind of weird characteristics going on with the word you're searching for, it can... Yeah, the, it. the comma after it yeah. might have thrown it or whatever. But uh, but basically, we can search and, re and replace, and you can specify you're doing that percentage, hitting the whole file. That's kind of a really handy one. And, you know, I didn't think about mentioning it, but I just did something that... Oh. I do out of hand that I probably should have mentioned is when you have line numbers like this, right? So if I'm searching for Ishmael and I find him on line 3385 and then I want to get back to the top of the file, right? I could sit here and page up and eventually get to the top. But if you type colon, you can type a line number and it'll jump you right to that line. So I just did a colon one to take me to line number one. Nice. Uh, you know, that, that's something that is, is pretty handy to be able to just jump right back to the top or jump to the end or, or whatever. If I do colon 10,000, it'll jump me all the way to line 10,000, and we can work there too. So another kind of quick way to navigate around and be able to, to see what's going on. All right. Well, Don, we definitely had a, a really good look into the Vi and the Vim text editors. They have a lot of power inside of them, but they can be a, a bit of a learning curve involved when it comes to learning how to actually use the stinking thing. There's a lot of commands, and like, do like what Don did. Go get yourself some st some stickies, that, <laughs> st get on your keys, because it is a bear to memorize everything. You will end up with a subset of commands that you just know off the top of your head because you use them all the time, and the ones that Don has shown you are probably going to be those very things. But uh, it's going to be good for you to get your hand on because not every stinking Linux system comes with a graphical editor. You may be in a headless system, and knowing how to work with Vi or Vim, can definitely save your bacon. Don, thanks for joining us today. Anything else you want to add before we close the show down? Boy, we, we've only scraped the tip of the iceberg oh, yeah. with, with Vim. I mean, there's so much more that it can do. But these are the key things, the, the main stuff that you need just to get by in a regular operation. If you learn these commands, you'll, you'll be pretty good with it, and you'll be right at home whenever you run into Vi. All right. Well, thanks again, Don, for jo uh, joining us today. And we do thank our audience for watching. But it looks like it's that time for us to call it a day. Signing off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizzette. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Pizzetta. Coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. All right, greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another exciting episode of IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Daniel Lowry, and in today's episode, we're back with more in our Linux command line series. It's been a lot of fun so far. Joining us back in the studio to lend to that fun, our good friend, Mr. Don Pizzette. Don, we're glad to have you yet again, sir. How's it going today? Hey, I am pumped up for another exciting episode of Linux command line, and in this episode, we're going to be looking at, uh, well, Mork from Ork's favorite text editor, <laughs> Nano, Nano. That's my witty <laughs> joke of the day. Uh, uh, so anyhow, we're going to look at the Nano text editor. Uh, I, yeah, I can it, it takes... It <laughs> takes uh, <laughs> Child of the 80s or 70s to get that joke. <laughs> uh, well, the, the Nano Text Editor, though, which is a, one that's been gaining in popular quite uh, gaining in popularity quite a bit, we're seeing it in a lot of distros by default now. Not in every distro, like I'm running Fedora, it's not in mine by default, but uh, uh, but it is gaining in popularity. So we're going to take a look at how it works, how to use it, and then how we can use it to manipulate text files and find out whether or not it's the right editor for you because it, it might be the default in the distro that you are running. Now, Don, this kind of begs the question of oh, what is so great about this text editor that we are abandoning older text editors that work just fine? All right. Well, you know, the most ubiquitous text editor in a Linux system or even a Unix system is the Vi or Vim, right? Mm -hmm. And they're very powerful, very flexible. They've been around a long time, but they're also very complicated. They're hard to use, mm -hmm. right? So years ago, developers had a chance to see some other ways of editing text files, and they said, man, these are so much easier. Let's use that instead. And that's really where Nano came from. You know, Nano wasn't originally developed as its own standalone product. There used to be a text-based email client called uh, Pine. And the, the Pine email client, a lot of us used it back in the, the late 80s and, and early 90s. Um, it was for email. And if you're writing an email, you don't want the complexities of Vim, right? <laughs> your, your regular end user can't handle Vim, <laughs> so, so it's too much. So in Pine, they created their own text editor for writing emails, and it was called Pico. And the Pico text editor was simple. You just typed. 
And then there were a couple of keyboard shortcuts that were printed right on the bottom of the screen. It was simple. And a lot of administrators liked that. They said, man, why can't we have that in our text editor? Why do we have to have these crazy colon commands and stuff like that? Can't I just use simple keyboard shortcuts? And so that's where Nano came from, is they took the Pico editor that was part of Pine, and they turned it into a standalone text editor that's designed to be a lot more user-friendly. It's still command line driven, so it's still very low on the resource usage, very easy to get it installed, uh, but it is uh, a lot more simple, a lot easier to manipulate and work with. And that's kind of the, the shining uh, pro for, for using Nano. On a negative side, it's not quite as powerful as some of the other text editors, especially if you're opening large files, but, uh, but it does a good job. And for most of us, it meets our needs as a standard text editor, and you can certainly use it uh, with a, a much smaller learning curve. All right. Well, that being said, let's dive into how the heck we use this thing. Like we like to start off with when it comes to text editors, we're going to probably want to open a file, and that's a great place to jump off. All right. Well, first off, we need to see if we even have Nano installed, because oh. you, you, you may or may not, right? Uh, and you can find it really easy on your system. You can just type which Nano, and, uh, and if you've got it, great, right? Now, on my system, I didn't have it, right? Fedora doesn't package Nano by default. Ubuntu, not only do they package it by default, but they've mapped it to the Vi command. So when you type Vi, you're actually running Nano on an Ubuntu system. Um, so some, some systems have really adopted it, some haven't. Uh, in Red Hat Enterprise Linux, I think they have Nano installed by default, but it, it's not the one that's used by default, but it is installed. So you might need to install it. In, in a Fedora system, I would just say sudo dnf install Nano. Uh, on a Debian system, it would be apt-get or apt-install uh, nano, uh, and it'll install. It's very small, so it installs pretty quick. It does have a handful of dependencies. If you're installing this on a server, you might not have some of those, so it may need to install some additional packages as well. But once you've got it, you're, you're ready to use it. And you can just type nano, and that'll take you right into the editor with a blank file. So if you want to create a brand new file from scratch, you type nano, and here we go. We're in a new file. Now, if you watched our Vi episode, you'll know that it launches in a fairly unintuitive manner, and there's a learning curve just to even be able to start typing. But here, I type nano, and now I can just start typing, right? I can type whatever it is I want. That's what people expect. They expect to go into an editor and be editing. <laughs> and, and that's what we get here. And if I don't know my keyboard shortcuts, it's okay. Because look at the bottom of my screen, right? If I want to get help, Control G, right? I do have to know that the little carrot Here, symbol is, control. is yeah. and that's pretty standard, right? We see that in most systems. Um, control X is exit. Control R is to read a file. Control O is write out. Right? That's a little bit weird. It means save the file, yeah. right? So, but it, it, it's there. <laughs> <laughs> control W for where is, or control slash for replace. It's giving me the most commonly used elements right here that I, I need. And in other editors like Vim, I have to memorize this stuff. But here in Nano, I can just see it right on my screen. It makes life so much easier. And we can navigate around, make our edits, make our changes. I've got a nice big flag up here at the top that's telling me that this file has been modified, so I need to save it. And if I try and exit and I don't save, it's okay, right? It, it warns me. Remember in, in, uh, in Vi, if I try and exit an unsaved file, I get like an error, and then it just sits there, and that's it. But here, if I hit Control X to exit, it says, hey, you haven't saved. W would you like to? W we can help you, right? You can hit Y for yes, and it'll save for you. Or you can say no, and it'll throw away the changes. So I'll, I'll say no. I'm going to throw away the changes. And that's it. So you, hopefully you kind of see here how much more user-friendly this experience is. Nano is designed to be easy. And if I want to edit an existing file, I can just say Nano and then the, the name of the file. So mine is uh, mobydick.txt. And I can open that up, and here I am. It's read it up. I've got it fired up here, 22,104 lines, and I can scroll around, and this is Moby Dick. Very exciting. Uh, <laughs> that's but that's basically getting into something with Nano and, and kind of getting started. Well, Don, you're, I, I, A, I do love the fact that when I fire up Nano, I can just immediately start typing because I invariably forget to type I for the insert mode in Vi, even though mm -hmm. I, I like to use Vi as well. Uh, so it is nice. When I want to quickly do something, I usually fire up Nano. I also love menu-driven systems, so the fact that it shows you each one of the options that are down on the bottom is, is very, very nice. It's going to be very nice for you because we're going to kind of go through these options, and yeah. they're right here on your screen, right? <laughs> and, you know, it's funny, Daniel, because um, in all honesty, 
I don't normally use Nano. Yeah. I'll tell you how great it is. You know, it's really easy. And if you're just getting started, it's perfect. But I don't normally use it. And the reason is it's, it's not normally installed by default on the systems I work on. Hmm. Right. So when you're doing a, a minimal install on a server, it's not going to have Nano. It is going to have them. And so, or at least Vi. And so that's what I use. I, I always go to Vi as kind of my default editor because I know it's going to be there. Right. Nano, I don't know if it's going to be there. And so while it is easier and, and it, it certainly works, I typically don't use it. But even for somebody like me who doesn't use it on a regular basis, it's still easy because everything is right there on the screen. <laughs> so if I want to take this file, for example, so I'm, I'm in here, and I want to do something like uh, copy and paste, yeah. right? I don't have to do anything too crazy. Just tell me right down here, Control-K and Control, uh, let's see. You? you can be, well, uh, so you've got to cut the text and then to uncut it, right? Which is, is a little confusing because it's not yeah, paste, paste, right? It's, it's uncut. But, uh, <laughs> but we can come in and we can, we can find our, our text that we want. And when you get to where you want it to be, we can highlight text by holding down our shift key and kind of going like that, right? And so I'm just holding shift and using my arrows to highlight what I want. And I can hit control K and I just grabbed it, right? And then I can go and I can paste it wherever I want it to go by doing control U and uncutting it, right? Uh, and it's in a buffer, so I can control U as many times as I want. I can actually go back to that original line and control U right there. So control K to cut, control U to uncut, or what we would call paste, and put it back. Pretty easy, again, right there on the screen for us. Simple transition. Right? And Don, you showed us how to, if we were done editing the file, and we did the uh, control X to, to exit out, and it would ask us, oh, you've made some changes. Do you want to save kind of that, that uh, safety net for us if we hadn't saved the changes? But a lot of times, that's exactly what we want to do. We don't want to exit the file, but we do want to save the file so we can continue editing. I know I like to do random saves after X amount of time in a file so that I don't lose anything just mm -hmm. in case, right? How can I do that? All right, so um, first off, you, know, you just need to pay attention to whether your file is modified, right? Mine is now modified. So I hmm. see that up at the top. I know it's been changed. And if I'm worried about losing a connection or, or something, then I, I might lose my changes. At any time, you can hit Control-O. Control-O is that write out, and it's going to save it. And it gives me the chance to change the file name if I want. See, it's offering to save it as mobydick.txt, the original name. And if that's what I want, I just press Enter. So Control-O and then Enter, and you save, right? Or I might choose to rename the file, which I can do right here, save it as a second copy. I'll leave it alone, and it saves it, and now I keep working. So really doesn't get in your way. Just Control-O, Enter, you've saved, and now you're in business. Or you can not save and just you know keep making your changes, and then when you exit, it'll prompt you, and you can save then, too, if you want. So it's kind of up to you how you want to handle that one. And Don, also, in, in when we did the, the Vi episode, you talked about how sometimes you run across a keyboard or uh, maybe even an operating system that's not supportive of the arrow keys. We don't have arrow key functionality. If that is the case, how can we bounce around inside of here? Yeah, it, it doesn't happen as much here, because normally if you're remoted into a server that has nano, then it, it's usually got a more feature-rich terminal and your arrow keys will work. But if your arrow keys don't work, you can get by on the keyboard. Um, they aren't all in a row, like on, on the Vi editor. It's, it's a little bit weird how it works. But basically, um, you can do Control F, and Control F moves you forwards, right? So that, that makes sense, F mm -hmm. for forwards. Uh, Control B is backwards, right? So I've got forward and backwards, so moving left and right, right there. And then you've got Control P for previous line, and Control N for next line, right? Which is basically up and down, right? Yeah. So B and F, backwards and forwards, P and N, previous and next. So you're holding control while you do those and you can navigate around. So while they're not all next to each other on the keyboard, to me it's actually easier than things like Vi, because with Vi I have to remember, all right, is, is H up or left or down? Is J up or left or down? I can't remember, but here you know, we've got those, those mnemonics of backwards, forwards, previous, and next. Well, Don, and any, of course, any text editor worth its salt is going to have to give me some sort of search functionality, especially when we're dealing with files the size of Moby Dick here with the <laughs> 17,000 some odd lines that we've seen. Uh, is there search functionality? If so, how do we use it? Absolutely. So in the in the Vi episode, we searched for Ishmael, yep. and we replaced that name with, with my name, right? So we can do the same thing here. I want to search and find Ishmael. Well, right here we've got the where is command, and that's a control W. And now it's asking me what I want to search for. I want to search for Ishmael. And when I search for that, it jumps forward, and there it is right there. We just found it, and now we know where he is. So Control-W, where is, that searches forward and finds that text for us.
And once we've found it, if we want to go that step further, we can actually go in and do the replace as well, which is just control backslash. So I'll do a control backslash, and it's asking me what I want to replace. Now, it remembers that I just searched for Ishmael. If I hadn't searched, it would put whatever word was there that my cursor was on right now. Okay, And so it's saying you might want to search for Ishmael, but I can search for anything. You just type the word. If I do want to search for Ishmael, I just press enter. Right. But if I want to search for anything else, I can just type it in here, and it'll search for that string. And then when I press enter, it asks me what I want to replace it with. Okay, I want to replace it with Don. And now I get to make a, a bit of a decision, right? Because if you'll see, it's got some other shortcuts down here in the bottom to jump to the first line, go to the last line, previous history, next history. So if I'm doing instant, um, instance by instance, I can do that, right? When I press enter here, it's going to find the first one, and it's asking me if I want to change it. Now, I said it found the first one. That's not the one I was on a minute ago, mm -hmm. right? Notice that Ishmael here is all capital. The search I did a moment ago was capital I and lowercase. So it's actually finding each of them, and it's asking me what I want to do about that. Do I want to replace this one or not? And I can sit here and just say yes and no and pick for each instance, or I can hit A for all and just knock them all out in the entire file. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to hit A, and now it replaces it. And that call me Ishmael just became call me Don, and it's like that throughout the whole file, or at least it should. I got 20 occurrences. So it replaced all of those, and now we've got it updated. And that's far more simple than the syntax that we have to type in in some of the other editors that are out there. Yes, this is definitely a much more simple uh, text editor that we have. I, I, I know. I, I, I go back and forth on when it comes to Vi because that's, that's my roots. It's where yeah. it came from. Right? I don't want to lose where my culture, but Nano sure is a whole lot easier to mess with. Is there any good reason to to use one over the other, other than it's just not supported? It usually comes down to personal preference, but it, the support is a big deal. Like mm. I, I just don't know if Nano is going to be there for me. If I gotcha. knew Nano was always going to be there, then I, I might start using it more, mm. right? You know, the, the Vi and Vim they actually do have some advanced functionality in them that that can be useful uh, that that Nano doesn't. Like uh, if you have multiple tabs, uh, you can actually do these tabs from the command line in, in Vim. Um, that kind of stuff might be handy. Most people don't use that functionality though, so it doesn't matter. Now I will say that we keep positioning Nano as being this like super easy thing. It actually does have a good bit of power that's hidden away. When I look at my screen, what I'm seeing right here are just the, the main kind of default commands, right? Like get help and write out. But notice on the right side, the undo and redo, they don't have a control, do they? They have an M, right? M is actually short for meta. So this is saying hit your meta plus U, meta key plus E or, or whatever. The meta key in most Linux distros is the alt key. So it's saying alt U will undo, alt E will redo. And so if I hit alt U, see how Don just became Ishmael again? Yeah. It just undid all those text and replace. Well, because we have control and we have the meta key, we actually have a large set of commands that we could send. What you're seeing here on screen is, I mean, what is this, uh, 14 commands, right? Very, very simple. These are the most common 14 commands. But if you do control G and go into the help, you'll find where there are tons of commands. And a lot of them have control shortcuts, and some even have F key shortcuts. So control G takes me to help, F1 takes me to help as well. So some of them have F keys, not a lot of them do though. Um, notice when I did my search, I did control backslash. I could have done meta key R. That would have done search and replace as well. And so as you read through, you'll find all sorts of functionality that is locked behind the meta key. And so you can really replicate the majority of what you do in the more complex editors right here. So if you ever browse through here, you can find some, some really neat stuff uh, and, and find that Nano can actually do more things than, than you would normally think. Uh, this documentation is, is full of, of interesting uh, stuff. Uh, you know, if we look in here, you can kind of search, here we go, line numbering enabled disable. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. Uh, I don't have line numbers on my screen, but it's not because Nano doesn't support it. They're just not on by default. And I'll see that's locked behind meta key pound symbol. So if I get out of help by doing control X, I could say alt shift pound. I, I have to do shift because the pound symbol is on the number three. So I have to do alt shift three, and now I've got line numbers, right? So don't assume that Nano is some lightweight editor that, that isn't as great as, as Vim. It can do a lot. The, the reason that I don't use it is just because I, I know it's not always there for me. And if I'm working on someone else's server, 
I don't necessarily have permission to install software on that server. If that server is air gapped, I might not even have access to a to a repository to be able to download Nano. I, I might have to work with what's there, and I always know that the VIA is going to be there. And I shouldn't say always because the POSIX compliance requirement says that there has to be a default editor at slash bin slash VI. It doesn't say it has to be VI. <laughs> yeah, it just, just says it has to be there. <laughs> and, and that's where the Ubuntu guys, they, they have linked slash bin slash VI to Nano. And so in, in Ubuntu, if you type VI, you actually end up in Nano. Uh, so it is gaining that kind of traction. We, we might see a few years from now where everybody's using Nano, and mm -hmm. we laugh at the VI shows. Like, remember when we used to use that dinosaur? <laughs> Stupid VI. Yeah. <laughs> so, but for now, it's, uh, it, it's still pretty impressive. And, yep. Definitely an editor you can take advantage of. There also is a .nano RC file or .nano file that you can configure, kind of like what we did with the uh, the, the Vim file as well, mm -hmm. uh, to make those changes persistent every time you fire them up. I know I like to uh, put the syntax highlight again because I do a lot of bash scripting and it helps me be able to visualize that a whole lot better. Very, very nice thing. Don, it looks like we've come to the end of Nano. It's a, it, it's, it's a short episode because it's a short little guy, but it does a lot of stuff, and it's a very easy uh, text editor to get your feet with. And, and a lot of distributions that are based off of Debian are coming right. with Nano, so you're pro probably going to run into it from time to time. I say learn both. I say learn Vi, learn Vim, learn Nano, so that no matter what system you're on, you can definitely work with your text. Now, anything else you want to add to the show before we call it a day? Well, you know, you, you mentioned how this was kind of a shorter show. Well, technically, if you watch our Vi show, it was it was two parts. It was. And I showed you in this episode everything that we did <laughs> in Vi in those two shows here in, in one. And it just kind of is a... Uh, a testament. Yeah to, yeah, to how much easier it is to do things. We don't have different command modes. We don't have different things like that. Right. Um, you know, it's a testament to how easy Nano is, and that's why it's so popular. All right. Well, Don, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for walking us through working with Nano. It's a lot of fun and very easy uh, text editor, obviously, to work with. Hopefully, you guys get out there and have some fun with it, make some files, start doing some stuff, learn all about it. But it does look like we are out of show for this show, so we're going to call it a day. Thanks for watching. Signing off for IT Pro TV. I've been your host, Daniel Lowry. And I'm Don Pizet. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.